Deception. Book 3 of the Night Roamers. Written by Kristen Middleton. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved. Prologue. Come on, Doug, one lap dance isn't going to kill you. John Hadley shouted over the loud music. He put an arm around Doug's shoulders and punched him playfully in the stomach. Hell, you're not even married yet, and she's already got you dragging the old ball and chain. Doug smiled. I know. I know. It's just that I promised Tanya I'd look but not touch. His other friend, Pete, handed him a Long Island tea and snorted. For one, you're in Vegas and you know the drill, what happens here stays here. Two, you're not married. Not yet. Three, you're not even allowed to touch the strippers, so technically, you'd be keeping that promise. Exactly, John said as the music died and the current dancer, a long-legged blonde, picked up her piles of bills from the stage and skipped off. Besides, this is your stag party, man. It's a rite of passage to have naked women crawling all over you before you cash in all of your chips. Come on, Duggar. Grow some balls and quit being such a candy ass. Doug pushed his wiry glasses back up onto the bridge of his nose. Listen guys, I'm perfectly fine just watching them dance around naked. I don't need a lap dance. Seriously. If you knew what you were missing, you'd know that you need one, John replied, ogling a voluptuous brunette who was leading another guy towards the back of the club. He decided to flag her down for himself before the night was over. Personally, he didn't give a rat's ass if his wife found out. Not like Lori would even care, since she'd been holding out on him for the last two months, claiming that she was too pregnant. He knew for a fact that other women had sex in their third trimester. It was more than obvious to him that she was just being overly paranoid and difficult. Women, he thought, slamming back the rest of his whiskey sour. All Lori had to do was clean the house, spread her legs a couple times a week, and pick up his dry cleaning on Fridays. Was that really too much to ask? If you can't touch them anyway, what's the point? Anyway, I doubt I'm missing anything I can't get at home, Doug replied, twirling the ice around in his glass. Not with a woman like Tanya. She's the best thing that's ever happened to me. Doug waved his thumb toward a waitress who was cleaning up one of the tables. She's just as hot as any of these girls I've seen tonight, and that's why I'm not even tempted. I'm still pretty much in awe that a girl like her is even interested in a man like me. Hell, I'm pretty sure that I hit the jackpot with her. Pete's eyes met John's. Both guys knew very well that Doug's $50 million inheritance made him very interesting to a gold digger like Tanya. She was the one who'd actually hit the jackpot. Our next long-legged siren will have you squirming in your seats when you see the way she moves, announced the DJ. Let's give it up for Montana, a sinfully hot redhead who I guarantee none of you horny bastards would mind spending eternity with. Here you go, Duggar, John said as the stripper stepped onto the stage wearing a red sequin dream girl from hell costume. We know how much you like redheads. Oh, this girl's drapes might even match the carpeting. Doug chuckled as Eminem's song Shake That began pounding through the club, and the girl on stage began to move her body. He had to admit this chick was the hottest stripper he'd seen all night. Pete chuckled. Oh. Douglas. Tell me you're not going home tonight without getting a private dance from her? Look at the way she grinds to the music. Doug nodded. Oh yeah, she's nice. His pants began to tighten as she gyrated her hips on the stage and tossed her thick mane of curls from side to side. Nice. I bet she's as naughty as hell. John opened up his wallet. Let's get her over here. Doug watched as the stripper's eyes scanned the crowd until they rested on him. Him. She smiled seductively and his throat went bone dry. Oh yeah. Here we go. John hollered as she stepped through the strobe lights toward the metal pole in the center of the stage, wrapping a black stiletto boot around it. Oh yeah, ride that pole girl. Doug watched in fascination as Montana slid her body around the metal suggestively. Not only was she beautiful, but she had the kind of curves a guy could lose his mind over. Their eyes met again and she grinned as if reading his thoughts. She flipped herself upside down and straddled the pole with her long supple legs, making him wish that he was made of metal. Baby, lose the costume. Pete shouted. Montana uncurled her legs and hopped away from the pole. Then she slid down to her hands and knees and crawled over toward the three drooling men, her eyes gleaming in the dark club. A surge of hot intense desire slammed into Doug as she stared at him directly. 
Beads of sweat broke out on his forehead as he fought to contain himself. He felt like a teenager watching his first porno. John chuckled. Now this is why we're in Vegas. They don't make them like this back home. Doug had to agree. In fact, Montana was even more beautiful up close. Her green eyes held his as she reached out and touched Doug's cheek, making his legs feel like jelly. You ready for me, Duggar? she purred. Unable to speak, he nodded. Montana stood back up while he stared at her long legs, imagining what that creamy skin would feel like under his fingertips. It was a struggle to keep from leaping onto the stage and finding out. With a wink, she turned her back to them and gave her bustier a firm tug. The men across the stage howled in approval when she raised the lacy piece of cloth above her head and tossed it away. You're killing us, Montana, Pete yelled, licking his lips. She looked over her shoulder at Doug and gave a seductive smile. You want some too, sugar? Yes, he croaked. Montana's grin widened. She turned around and Doug stared in wonder at her perfectly sculpted globes. They were the color of porcelain, reminding him of the Gaia melons he'd purchased recently in the grocery store. His mouth began to water as he pictured his tongue on the fruit. Beautiful, he whispered. So you like, she purred. Hell yes, Pete answered, reaching toward her with his left hand. Her eyes grew cold. Stop, she hissed. Not unless I give you permission. Pete's hands dropped and his face went slack. Her eyes drifted back to Doug's and she smiled as if nothing had transpired. She stood back up and pulled the rest of the costume away from her body until she wore nothing but a red G-string and her black thigh-high stiletto boots. The crowd around the stage roared louder. Wallets came out and bills were thrust into the air while she teased them with her curves, rocked her hips to the music, and took possession of everyone in the club. As her song began to end, Montana swung her hips back over to Doug. She leaned down and touched his cheek tenderly. Meet me in the parking lot in ten minutes. It was a demand, not a question. Yes, he replied, staring at her lush lips. He'd never seen anyone so beautiful. With a dark smile, she pressed her glossy lips against his and stood back up. Don't keep me waiting. Never, he replied, forgetting all about Tanya. His upcoming wedding. The future. Satisfied, Montana moved her gaze to Pete and John, who were staring up at her in adoration. She smirked. Oh, and bring your friends. The more the merrier. Although slightly irritated, Doug agreed. Whatever this exquisite woman wanted, he'd give it to her. Anything and everything. And he did. Carmela felt slightly dizzy as she pushed the cleaning cart out of the motel room and into the dry afternoon heat. She closed the door and rubbed her pregnant belly, trying to somehow calm the baby inside, who wasn't due to arrive for another month. Settle, am I bebe, she whispered. If only she could afford to stop working and relax the last few weeks before her maternity leave. Unfortunately, her husband had lost another job, and now she was the only one paying the bills. She clucked her tongue and sighed. Luis. His drinking was getting out of hand, and sometimes she wished she had the courage to stand up to him, to tell him to stop being so selfish. But love was a funny thing and very unpredictable. Even though his drinking bothered her, she would do anything to keep Luis, so the thought of him leaving her kept her quiet. Besides, she knew that she couldn't complain too much because even at his worst, Luis was still a better man than her own father, who'd physically abused her mother stone-cold sober. Sure, Luis drank until he passed out most nights, but he never threatened or raised a hand to her. Never. For that reason, she still held a small ray of hope that possibly someday he would quit drinking and be the man she needed him to be. For now, however, she had the bills as well as the baby to worry about, and was determined to work until her water broke. Ignoring another kick from the feisty baby, she pushed the cart to the next motel room and knocked on the door. Housekeeping, she called. No answer. Sighing, she repeated it again, and when nobody answered, Carmela shoved the key into the lock and opened the door. When she stepped inside of the dark room, her stomach rolled in protest as a pungent, coppery smell filled her nostrils. Grimacing, she flipped on the light switch and screamed in horror at the gruesome carnage someone had left behind. Chapter 1 Nikki This is ridiculous, Nikki. You have to learn to hunt properly now that you're one of us. What happens if I'm not around to keep feeding you? Ethan and I were alone on the roof of a rundown casino on the outskirts of Vegas. 
I glared at him in the darkness. You make it sound like we're hunting rabbits. These are actual people. Isn't there another way to do get blood? His dark hair fell forward into his eyes, and he pushed it aside. Not at the moment. I looked off into the distance and sighed. I don't know if I can do this. I'm afraid I'm going to freeze up or something. This whole idea freaks me out. Even after you've experienced the energy and power it brings? I turned back to him. It's not like we're cracking open a couple cans of Red Bull to get charged up. We're talking about drinking someone's blood, which, as you're well aware of, I've always been against. Always. You should have thought all of this through a little better before you went ahead and turned me into one of you. He folded his arms across his chest and met my scowl with a much darker one. Oh, and what should I have done? Left you to die after getting shot? I rolled my eyes. No, but you could have taken me to the ER instead of forcing this kind of thing on me. You definitely have the strength and speed to have gotten us there in time. He sighed and looked away. What can I say? What's done is done. I'm sorry if you don't care for the way I saved your life, he replied coolly. But at the time, I didn't really think I had any other choice. But you did have one and now I don't, I mumbled. Ever since we'd left Shore Lake three nights ago, we'd been bickering. First over Duncan and then over everything else. It had gotten so bad that Duncan had finally taken off on his own in search of Celeste and Caleb. I could tell he was also frustrated with the turn of events, but wasn't sure exactly what to do himself. I'm sure he was still trying to cope with the fact that he was now a vampire, his father had been murdered in cold blood, and Ethan had staked his claim on me. It hadn't helped that Ethan and I had bonded, and I was still trying to sort my own things out. My emotions for Ethan were strong, but so were my feelings for Duncan. I wasn't sure how it happened, but I'd went from being a girl who'd never even had a boyfriend, to one who'd found herself agonizing over two very complicated beings. I wasn't even certain if what I felt was love or simply lust. The only thing that I was completely sure of was my attraction to both of them, and it was an intense and frightening position to be in. Especially since they despised each other, and I needed both of them to help me find my family. Why don't you just try it again? he asked, lowering his voice as another couple stepped out of the casino and into the parking lot. And this time, remember what the purpose is. The last time I'd tried hunting, I'd chickened out and ended up helping the young woman read her roadmap while Ethan watched from a distance pissed as all hell. I stared at the couple nervously and shook my head. No. I just can't. He sighed. What's the big deal? You're not killing them. In fact, you can make it enjoyable, even orgasmic. I grimaced. Okay, that's creepy and not helping. Nikki, he said, kneeling down next to me as the middle-aged couple staggered toward their vehicle, laughing hysterically, both obviously tipsy. You've got to try and get a handle on this. You're getting weak and honestly so am I I can't keep this up. He was right. I was getting so weak that even protesting was becoming difficult. And what if something did happen to Ethan? I guess if he could show me how to control the amount of blood I took from my victims, then it was probably time to figure this out. Fine. I'll try it, but you have to monitor me. I don't want to do something wrong and put one of them into cardiac arrest or something. Ethan smiled. That's my girl. Now you take the guy while I subdue the woman. Just remember what I told you about charming him. Ah, uh, yeah, try that hypnotizing thingy with my eyes. Okay. I touched my teeth and began to panic. What about the fangs? Why aren't they popping up? Calm down. He bared his long pointy ones. They'll appear once the scent of blood draws them. Why are yours drawn when there isn't any then? Anticipation alone draws mine out. Plus, I have better control. You have to remember, I'm older than you, my senses are far more advanced. I'd heard the same line from him over and over the last couple of days. True or not, it was getting annoying. Right. You're ornery. Another sign you need to feed. Yeah, well you're not all sunshine and roses either. He chuckled. Sorry. I'm just frustrated. He nodded. Yeah, I get it. Isn't there another way to get nutrition? I mean, has anyone tried anything else? Of course they have. Look, blood is nourishment, strength and life. 
The more you consume, the clearer things will become. I know you're new at this, but I promise, everything will get easier over time. I hope so. His eyes lowered to my lips, and I wondered if he was going to kiss me. He hadn't touched me intimately since we'd left Shore Lake. Now that his lips were near mine, I found myself wanting more than just blood. He cocked his head to the side as if listening for something. After a few seconds, he snorted and stood up. It's time. I think they're messing around in the car. Who knows, maybe they're celebrating a big jackpot win. Oh perfect, I said dryly. Now we get to turn their night into something even more special. He smiled. It is perfect, actually. They won't be expecting us. I stood up. Fine. I nodded toward the parking lot. You lead the way. His face became serious. Remember, get his attention quickly. Once he's focused on you, he'll forget about everything else and be putty in your hands. I'll handle the woman. He could definitely do that. And you're certain that I won't hurt him? His eyes glittered in the darkness. He might feel a little unpleasantness at first, but you know what they say about pain and pleasure. No. What? One leads to the other. I snorted. What? I've never heard that before. I guess if you're into S&M, that would probably make sense. Although I don't get why anyone would want to be whipped, or why that would turn someone one. Focus, he said and then in a flurry of movement flew off of the roof. I stepped hesitantly over to the edge and looked down. He'd been teaching me to fly, but taking off from high places was very nerve-wracking. I swallowed back my apprehension, took a deep breath, and launched myself forward. Unfortunately, my landing wasn't quite as smooth. I ended up on my stomach behind the couple's car, with gravel in my stuck in cheek. You'll need to work on that, whispered Ethan, crouched down next to the trunk. You think? I snapped, irritated that I wasn't getting any of this vampire stuff. I crawled over to him. Don't worry about it. You'll get the hang of it sooner or later. You know, sooner would be really nice. See, just like I said, he whispered as the car began to rock. He grinned. Someone's taking care of business. I raised my head. The windows were indeed fogged up, and from the motion inside of the vehicle, they'd started more than just the engine. This is seriously disturbing, I replied, ducking back down. We need someone else to feed on. I feel like a pervert or something. I'm out of here. Hold up. Nikki, you need the strength to locate your family. The guy in the car is large and full of nutrients. Hell, he could probably feed both of us and still not feel anything. Yeah, but... He ignored my protests. This lot is as deserted as they come, and nobody else appears to be leaving the casino. We don't have any other choices at the moment. Now let's just get this over with. At least let them finish and clean up, I muttered. The woman was moaning and the car was rocking so hard it was almost comical. I was shocked that they were doing it in a parking lot, although there really weren't a lot of customers. Fine, he replied closing his eyes. Since he's a human, this shouldn't take long. What do you mean? I asked, not fully understanding. Ethan was the only person I'd ever been with, and I wondered what was different about vampire sex. The car stopped moving. He opened his eyes and smiled. You ever seen any of the Fast and the Furious flicks? Yes, Nathan loves those movies. That's pretty much my interpretation of a mortal's sex life. I smirked. You were mortal once, weren't you? Yeah, and guilty as charged, he grinned. Now I'm just furious. From what I'd remembered, our lovemaking hadn't seemed to last very long either. I didn't tease him, however, as I was learning that a male's ego was fragile, mortal or not. The couple in the car started arguing. Ethan and I looked at each other. I guess she wasn't finished, he joked. Just then the driver's side door opened and the woman fell out on her rear, sobbing. Go back to your husband then, bitch, hollered the man inside. He threw a beer can onto the pavement. The woman, too drunk to notice us behind the vehicle, stood up, buttoning her shirt. Her red lipstick and eyeliner were smeared garishly on her face. At least he knows how to treat a lady Jerry, she hollered. Whatever. The man threw her purse down at her feet, and she bent down to pick it up. Don't call me anymore, Vera. I'm sick of all of your BS and baggage. 
Believe me, it'll be a cold day in hell when I do that, she huffed, smoothing her short blonde hair down. Psycho. I must be for putting up with your crap. She raised her middle finger, and then stomped away to an old station wagon parked a few feet away. She got in and seconds later tore out of the parking lot. Ethan touched my forearm. You're on. My knees suddenly felt like jelly. Me? Why don't you go first? The blonde is gone. Your schedule is open. He chuckled. It'll be easier for you to get his attention. You're hot. You could probably drain him without using any powers other than your own natural ones. I hesitated. Ethan nudged me forward. He's leaving any minute. Do it before we need to find someone else. I almost wanted to. Even though I now had the upper hand, he was menacing. Maybe we should. You're just stalling. You've got this. I believe in you. I wish I did. Taking a deep breath, I stood up and walked around to the driver's side door just as the man started the engine. I knocked on the window, startling the hell out of him. He was indeed a large fellow, not just tall, but even from this angle I could tell he was powerfully built, like a lumberjack. He even wore a flannel shirt and sported a dark beard, reminding me of Paul Bunyan. Hopefully he left his axe at home. The man blinked, as if trying to figure out if he was dreaming or not, and I smiled innocently. He rolled down his window, a cigarette hanging from his mouth, and eyed me curiously. Yeah? I smiled innocently. Um, I'm sorry to bother you, but I was wondering if you had a phone I could borrow? My boyfriend and I got into this huge argument. He left me here all alone and I need to find a ride home. His bloodshot brown eyes swept over my white miniskirt, orange scoop neck t-shirt and sandals. The approval on his face made my skin crawl. From the creepy look in his eyes, I knew I wouldn't have to charm this one. I wondered what kind of man screwed a married woman in his car and drooled over a teenage girl less than five minutes later. The disgust I now felt for this guy was already ruining my appetite. The thought of touching his skin with my lips sickened me. Tell you what, he nodded toward the passenger seat. I'll give you a ride home. A pretty little girl like you shouldn't be out here alone, waiting for a ride. Lots of freaks on the streets after midnight. Thank you. I really appreciate it. No problem. Glad I can help. I went around the car, passing Ethan who was still crouched down. He gave me the thumbs up and I smiled grimly. When I reached the passenger side door, I took a deep breath and opened it. Ah, thanks again, I said, sliding in next to the stranger. He stared at my legs as I shut the door and then cleared his throat. You have to really slam that thing or it might unlatch on the road. Here, he leaned over and reached for the door handle. I'll get it for you. Even though he was a complete ogre, the heat of his body and the salty scent of his skin woke up something inside of me. I sucked in my breath and grabbed the edge of the seat. You okay? he asked, straightening back up. You're very pale. I forced a smile. I'm fine. His eyes lowered below my neck. You don't have to be frightened, he said, leering at my chest. I'm not. As disgusting as he was, all I could think about was the blood running through his veins and how to get to it. Good. As my eyes lingered on his jugular, the beat of my heart seemed to intensify and grow louder. I decided to charm the man and get it over with. The hunger inside was driving me insane. My boyfriend cheated, I blurted out. He wasn't attracted to me anymore. The man's eyes moved to mine and I concentrated on bending his mind like Ethan had instructed. He must be an idiot, replied the guy right before his eyes dilated. It worked, I thought, staring at his pupils. The man went on. You're very pretty. Thanks. I knew that I could now get him to agree with anything that I wanted. Theoretically, at least. I was just a little nervous about testing it out. He inhaled, his nostrils flaring like a bull. You smell lovely. I'd learned that vampires, especially the females, gave off a pleasant calming scent. It was supposed to work like an aphrodisiac to our prey. Thanks. It's driving me crazy. You're driving me crazy, he said, looking down at the tent between his legs. My skin began to crawl. Seeing a forty-something-year-old man leering at me with wood was kind of disturbing. Especially this guy. Just then the driver's door opened and Ethan reached for Jerry. 
Sorry to break up the party, he muttered, pulling the big guy out of the car effortlessly. But some of us are fading away out here. What the hell, the older man hollered, shocked. He tried shoving him away. Get your hands off of me. Ethan gave him a reassuring smile. Just relax. This will all be over in a few minutes. Then you can go home and pass out next to your dog and stack of pornos. Jerry's face turned red. How do you know I have a dog? You smell like a lab. Ethan looked him up and down. You're certainly not a lichen. This would be a lot harder. I got out of the car and joined them. What's a lichen? Kind of like a werewolf, only they can shift at will, he explained as Jerry tried taking a swing at him. Ethan caught his fist. No need to get violent. Jerry gasped as Ethan held firmly onto his hand, not letting him go. You're crazy. Honestly, sometimes I wish that was all I was. Let's get this over with, shall we? Ethan pinned Jerry with one of his heavy stares, and his face went slack. I glanced around the parking lot anxiously. Glad you took over. Things were really starting to get weird. Ethan pulled Jerry behind the car and shoved him to the ground. That's because you started chit-chatting when you should have just jumped into things. Like this. He sank his teeth into the side of the man's neck. The scent of blood filled the air, and whatever qualms I had about drinking from Jerry disappeared. After a few minutes, Ethan raised his head. Your turn. I crawled to him, mesmerized by his red-stained lips. I had to admit, with my stomach empty and the coppery scent in the air, nothing had ever seemed so appealing. Ethan smiled. How about we start you off with a little teaser first? His lips pressed against mine, and I was immediately enthralled by the coppery taste of his mouth. Just as I was really getting into it, he pulled away. We need to hurry. Go ahead and feed. Just don't go overboard. I wasn't exactly sure how I'd know if I was going overboard. I decided that Ethan would probably let me know. I pulled my hair to the side and nodded. Right. The scent of fulfillment beckoned to me. I closed my eyes and sank my teeth into his neck, trying not to think about what I was doing too hard. That's it, urged Ethan rubbing my back. More. I moaned in satisfaction as blood and heat surged through my body, fulfilling me in a way that was beyond any kind of reasonable comprehension. Soon my heartbeat grew stronger and faster until it surpassed Jerry's, whose was receding. But the hunger inside of me made me gluttonous. The only thing that mattered was the blood coursing through me and the energy it created. Okay, said Ethan firmly pulling me away, that's enough. Although I was disappointed and wanted to continue, I felt euphoric. I sighed in pleasure. This must be what getting drunk feels like. Oh no. This definitely a better high. I'd never gotten drunk before, although I'd tried beer and had hated it. It was good to know that I wasn't missing much. Ethan touched my cheek tenderly. You look beautiful. The color is back in your cheeks. I raised my fingers to my face. I was definitely warmer. Voices coming from the parking lot startled us. I peeked around the back of the car and noticed a group of young men in business suits getting out of a limo. Let's go, Ethan said. What about him? He grabbed my hand and pulled me up. Jerry will be fine. Hell, we might have done him a favor. What do you mean? He's going to think he passed out from drinking too much. He might rethink his drinking habits. I smiled. Ethan circled his arms around my waist and soon we were flying over the glimmering lights of Vegas. Chapter 2 Maximus so, nobody knows anything? Detective Rena Burroughs asked, staring at her partner in exasperation. This is the third case with the same M.O. and nobody remembers a goddamn thing? Sorry, but I'm not buying it. Maximus Johnson, Max to his friends, thought about the three men naked and slaughtered in room number 40 of Motel Paraguay. The scene was straight out of a horror flick, and not the first one they'd encountered in the last two weeks. Unless all of the motel employees we've interviewed, from three separate locations, are conspiring against us, I don't know how else to explain it. Rena rubbed the bridge of her nose and sighed. It's just... I don't know. How can the perp check into these rooms without someone remembering something? And no ID or credit card for the room? They should have at least had something on file. Hell, even a fake name for God's sake. 
Isn't it still standard procedure to get a name and license plate number when someone checks in? The motel owner says yes, but no paperwork was ever filled out. The attendant who checked out the room is stunned and confused. Says she doesn't even remember handing anyone the keys to that room. She clucked her tongue. Same story as the last two incidents. I think we'd better check for drugs. Maybe she was using or someone slipped her something last night? Already on it, Max replied, clicking his pen closed. He stuffed it into his suit pocket with the notepad. She's a college kid. Could have been strung out on something last night. Never know. We will know. It's just too bad that I didn't think of testing the first clerk for drugs, Mickey Deegan. We certainly dropped the ball with that guy. Mickey Deegan hadn't seen anything either. In fact, he'd insisted that nobody had checked into the motel, which was at the other end of town. Two scenes later and things were getting more confusing. Oh, I don't know. Something tells me that it wasn't drugs. Look at the second clerk, old Mrs. Billmore. She's as straight as they come. Maybe, but she'd admitted to taking Ambien the night before the murder. That's something. Ambien, huh? You see those commercials and the side effects of some of these prescription drugs. Scary shit. There's a risk with everything, Max, she said. Look at me, I quit smoking three weeks ago and didn't need some drug to make me want to kill someone or feel suicidal. It happened the moment I threw that last pack in the garbage and had to deal with you in the morning. He smirked. I have to admit, I was sort of surprised you let me live. Must have been the patch. I stopped using that patch after the second day. Like I said, no drugs, just a teenager giving me a major guilt trip. Molly's a good kid. She was just worried about you. Rena thought about her daughter, who'd just graduated high school and was now away at TCU, studying to be a doctor. She smiled proudly. She is a good kid and I'm damn proud of her. I am too, he replied. You did well with that girl. Even with all of the insane hours and the trash we have to deal with every day. I'm amazed you're able to hold everything together. Well, I have to thank my mom for helping out. She's always been there for me and Molly. Always. He smiled. Your mom move in with that boyfriend of hers, Carl? No, she's still staying with me. If he doesn't give her a ring, she's not going to either. She really wants to get married, again? What is she, 60? 65. Nah, she just wants a huge rock on her finger and a commitment. Not necessarily marriage. Ha. Huh. I guess I just don't understand women. Rena smiled. We're all different. That's all you've got to understand. You're definitely different, he thought, and that's a good thing. Rena was the first woman he'd met who had not only challenged his own objectives in life, but got his blood flowing like nobody else. Tall, leggy blonde with a sailor's mouth and curves that dreams were made of. She was also his partner, a black belt in karate, and definitely off limits to every guy in the department. She wasn't interested in dating anyone with a badge. She'd been married to a cop once and had vowed to never go down that road again. Not after the suffering she'd went through when he'd been killed. That had been nine years ago, and although she'd went out on a few blind dates, had given them up for her mechanical friend Louis who Max idolized. One night they'd went out for a few drinks, and Rena had joked about needing nothing but a few double A's and her Louis. When he'd asked what the hell a Louis was, she'd told him straight up, making his lap painfully uncomfortable for the rest of the night. It was at that point he knew he had it bad for Rena. Max pushed the memory aside. Why agonize over something that's never going to happen? So tell me, what do you think is really going on here? She pushed her blonde hair back behind her ears. I'm not sure. Nobody's talking or claims to know shit. What about the men that were found? Did they ID them? The three Vicks definitely had identification on them, but nobody noticed them checking in. Just like the other two cases. I don't know, maybe we'll get lucky this time and they'll find someone else's fingerprints. Let's hope. We better try and locate everyone who stayed at the motel last night for questioning. And the maid, Carmela, we have her statement but I'd like to talk to her again, see if she remembers anything else. I agree. We need to find the sicko before he strikes again. She rubbed the bridge of her nose. This is turning into a serial thing. Definitely. At this rate, he'll claim another victim within the next two days. 
Victims, corrected Rena. This guy has stepped it up by taking three at once. Maybe we have more than one perp? Sounds like a good assumption. She sighed. Since we drove separately, I'm going to take another look around the motel and head back to the office. I'll catch up with you later. Sounds good, he replied. Reaching into her pocket, she took out her phone and walked away while he stared at her long legs in appreciation. He imagined what they'd feel like wrapped around his waist and was forced to calm the beast lurking deep within. Chapter 3 Nikki Ethan was still sleeping when I rose in the late afternoon and took a shower. We were at the Luxor Hotel, in one of the nicer suites. He'd charmed the receptionist when we'd checked in, and she'd upgraded us for no additional cost. Although the room was luxurious, and I felt rejuvenated from feeding, I wasn't enjoying any of it. My family was in danger, and I still had no idea where they were or if they were even alive. I closed my eyes as the warm water streamed down my hair and body, which was still so oddly pale even after feeding. Standing next to my mother who had extremely fair skin, I'd probably glow. I had to admit however, there were some cool benefits of being a vampire, like no more acne. My eyes also seemed brighter and my vision was off the charts. My body, well it was toned now. Almost like an athlete's. As great as that was however, I'd still do anything to be human again. Having to drink blood to stay alive, and a new sensitivity to sunlight wasn't worth it. No longer would I be able to enjoy the things I'd taken for granted, like cruising across the lake in the middle of the day with the sun beating down on my skin, asking a hot guy to put sunscreen on my back. Hell, I'd even miss having tan lines. Fortunately, I could still wander around in the daylight, but my eyes were so sensitive that it was usually a bad experience. Then there was my new diet. Thankfully, besides blood I'd learned could still eat some foods, but only a small amount of meat, berries, fruits, and nuts. My stomach could no longer handle any processed foods, and I'd learned the hard way. In fact, Ethan had tried to warn me, but I'd been starving, and had made a trip to one of the buffets when we first arrived in Vegas. Soon after, I found myself in the bathroom, throwing it all up. I grabbed the razor and began shaving my armpits, followed by my legs. Apparently, vampires still needed to groom themselves, which was oddly comforting. Truthfully, if I would have lost all of my hair, I think I would have looked like some kind of freakish alien. I sighed. Who was I kidding? With this pale body, I already looked like something from another planet. A loud banging noise from the bedroom startled me. I turned off the shower, grabbed my towel, and flew out of the bathroom to check on Ethan. He wasn't alone. I smiled. Duncan? Hey gorgeous, he replied, checking me out. He winked. Need any help drying off? Ethan, who was still lying in bed but awake, rolled his eyes. I chuckled. No, I'm good. How did you find us? Actually, I followed you last night and reserved the room next door, he said, closing the sliding glass door. Great idea using vampire manipulation to upgrade. Never stayed in a suite before. Ethan sat up. Great, so glad you're enjoying it. I sat down on the edge of the bed. Hey sleepyhead. Ethan's eyes softened. Looks like you still have shampoo in your hair, Nikki. I pulled my towel in tighter. Oh. I um, I heard some loud thumps and thought I'd better figure out what was happening. I stood back up. I'd better go wash it out. Again, I'd be happy to offer any assistance, Duncan said with a smile. I have a better idea, why don't you quit drooling over her and tell us what you've learned?" Ethan mumbled, sliding out of bed wearing a pair of light blue boxers. Duncan plopped into a chair and sighed. I've learned absolutely nothing. The hotel that Faye supposedly owns, the Marlamore? Nobody in that place has even heard of her, Caleb, or even Celeste. In fact, it's owned by some tycoon who lives on the top floor. Says he's owned it for years. I groaned. Seriously? I looked at Ethan. What the heck are we going to do now? They're here somewhere, he answered. I just know it. Don't worry Nikki, we'll find them. Duncan grunted and rubbed the back of his neck. You sure about that? The city is nuts, so many people, so much going on. Do we know for certain that this was even their destination? That's what I was wondering. What if we're on this wild goose chase and they're on the other side of the world? I said. Ethan nodded. Obviously, that's always a possibility. 
But Caleb loves Vegas and was planning on marrying your mom, right? I still think they're here. Do you know of any other vampires living in Vegas? I asked. You know, that might have seen them? Duncan smirked. I'm sure there are hundreds. This place is basically a buffet. Let's just say that this city has its share of immortals and I'm not just talking vampires, Ethan replied. The sooner we find your mom and brother, the better. What do you mean like more shapeshifters? I asked. That and other things you don't want to run into, Ethan said, walking towards the bathroom. He stepped inside and turned on the faucet. Duncan and I looked at each other and he shrugged. He obviously didn't know either. Well, what else are we talking about? I asked, moving to the bathroom. I stood in the entrance as Ethan cupped his hands under the faucet and washed his face. He shut off the water, grabbed a small white towel and dried his cheeks. Something that you want to avoid at all costs, since they aren't fond of vampires. Lichen. Duncan snorted. You mean those things that howl at the moon, eat people and walk on their hind legs? Seriously? Ethan brushed past me and went back into the bedroom. That's exactly what I mean. I've never actually met any of them in person, but Caleb says they're out there. He picked up his jeans and scowled. Damn it, I must have a hole in my lip. I looked at the blood stain on his pants and smirked. Oh man, I just can't take you anywhere. He reached over and slapped my butt hard. Maybe, but I wouldn't mind taking you on the bed. He wiggled his eyebrows, how about we get rid of your friend for a while? Ethan. I gasped, moving away from his reach. I glanced at Duncan out of the corner of my eye and noticed his teeth were clenched. What do you say, Duncan? You want to give us a little privacy? I gave him a dirty look and mouthed the word, stop. Yeah. That's fine. He stood up. Don't listen to him, Duncan. We need to get moving so we can find Nathan and Mom, I said. Well, seeing as I'm starting to feel outnumbered here, I'd better take a shower, said Ethan, grabbing his overnight bag. Then we'll head out. Did Caleb ever run into one of those lichen creatures? Duncan asked. He nodded. He claims that he's met a couple. What did he say about them? I asked. Ethan walked over to his duffel bag and started rifling through it. That they were mean sons of bitches. And incredibly strong. I know they've tried killing him before. Sounds familiar, I replied dryly. Ethan looked over at me. They're different. They get a thrill out of hunting, especially us. It's a big game to them, and they'll rip your throat out without thinking twice. And they were in Vegas. Great. How do we spot them? Duncan asked. He sighed. It's hard. They look like everyone else, and can walk around in the daylight without any problems. They do have a certain smell, however. Earthy and musky, I guess. I frowned. Faye had no smell. Shapeshifters don't unless they haven't showered for a while. Which reminds me, said Ethan. Go wash out your hair so I can take one. Oh sure. I walked toward the bathroom and looked over my shoulder. Just don't kill each other while I'm gone. Duncan put his head in his hands. As far as I'm concerned, I died in Shore Lake. Chapter 4 Celeste Celeste was aware of being followed long before she first caught a glimpse of her stalker. She bit back a smile and continued through the casino, stopping occasionally at a slot machine to test her luck while she waited for her pursuer to make his move. Vegas She wasn't sure what it was about gambling, but ever since they'd arrived, Celeste couldn't pass through the hotel casino without emptying all of the change in her handbag. Would you care for a drink? One of the waiters at the Mandarin Beachside Casino asked as she slipped another four quarters into a machine. His eyes swept lustfully over her sheer lime green bikini cover up and back to her face. She smiled up at him. I was just about to leave, but thank you. Too bad. Stop back for a nightcap later? Maybe. He grazed his lower lip and smiled. I'm through at 11. If you're looking for company. With his blue eyes, spiky blonde hair and muscular frame, she figured this attempt at scoring typically worked. Hell, he probably had women slipping him their numbers frequently in this seedy town. But dogs like him were a dime a dozen, and she was in the mood for something more challenging to sink her teeth into at the moment. 
Believe me, you're better off enjoying that nightcap with someone else. I don't know about that. I haven't seen a girl as gorgeous as you for a long time. Are you an actress or model? She decided to play with him while trying to get another glimpse of the person shadowing her. She grinned wickedly. Baby, it's better if you don't know what I am. He raised his eyebrows and smirked. Oh yeah? Sounds intriguing. Why is that? She reached out and touched his cheek. Sometimes knowledge can be more dangerous than ignorance. His eyes widened. Your hand, it's freezing. So is her heart, a gravelly voice responded in amusement behind her. Sighing, she turned around to face the familiar lichen who'd been pursuing her. He stood just over six feet, had a craggly face, white hair, and eyes the color of rich gold. Dressed to the nines in a tailored Armani suit and designer shoes, nobody would ever guess the kind of monster lurking just below the surface. It was a trait she couldn't help but admire. She smirked. Victor. I thought I caught a whiff of mongrel when I stepped into this hotel. His turn cool. Are you sure that wasn't the smell of death still lingering on your lips from the night before? Cute. I wouldn't go pointing fingers if I were you. He shrugged. I'm not. Just acknowledging my budding appreciation for your kind. He turned towards the waiter. I'll have a scotch straight up. The waiter nodded. Of course. With one final glance at her, he walked away, looking confused and dejected. So Celeste, what brings you back to Vegas? She sighed in irritation. My father is getting married. He looked surprised. Really? Yes, he's fallen for a woman from Montana. Ever since he met her, she's brought nothing but trouble. Trouble? In your lives? That's unusual, he replied dryly. Yeah, unfortunately it's worse than usual and he's being a stubborn fool. Still the same old Caleb I see. She smiled. Exactly. By the way, if you're in the mood for some hunting, I have targets that I think you'll be very interested in. He raised his eyebrow. Is this related to your trouble in Montana? Yes. Apparently, trouble has followed us to Vegas, and they're really starting to piss me off, Victor. Who are they? Lycan. No roamers. Vampires? He lowered his voice. You're telling me that you want us to hunt your own brethren? That's exactly what I'm telling you. His eyes began to sparkle. Hum sounds appealing, I have to admit. I thought it might. The sooner you take them out, the better. He scratched his chin. How many? Three. They shouldn't be a problem. Celeste's eyes narrowed. The female I need her disposed of first and foremost. He studied her face. This sounds a little murky. Can't you handle your own kind? Normally. Look, it's just complicated. Specifically because Caleb wouldn't approve. Even though they're hunting you. She reached over and trailed her finger over his sleeve. Yes. I wish I could tell you more, but like I said, it's complicated. Hmm. Tell me, Celeste, if I do this for you, what do I get in return? The thrill of the hunt, she smiled seductively, a night with me. He grabbed her arm, twisting it roughly behind her back until she whimpered in pain. I'm taking my payment now then, he growled, his eyes glowing with anticipation. Her eyes hardened. Fine but no teeth. It took me forever to heal after the last time. Like you didn't love every minute of it, he murmured as the waiter returned with his drink. She smiled. More than she'd expected. Which was why she didn't mind paying a debt to a longtime enemy. Nathan Nathan knew he was still pretty messed up when he woke to find his mother sitting next to him, her expression grim. Where is she? he asked hoarsely. He knew he'd been in and out of consciousness for the last few days, dreaming of some kind of freakish caged creature. In it his sister was crying and reaching for the shriveled monstrosity, while he stood back, unable to do anything but watch the nightmare unfold. Just before she touched the creature, he'd wake up, never knowing the outcome. It freaked the hell out of him, mostly because it seemed more like a memory than a dream. I don't know, honey. Caleb said she's here in Vegas and that we just have to be patient. He promised that he'd find her, especially with all of the contacts he has in the city. It shouldn't be long now. Caleb, he mumbled, trying to keep his heavy lids open. 
He was so groggy and weak that it was hard to move let alone process anything. Yes? She stared at him in amusement. The sheriff? My fiancé, you silly goose, remember? He grimaced and she laughed. See, you're obviously coming around. Tell me what happened again, he said, clearing his throat as he tried to sit up. His head felt like someone had used it to kick a field goal. Let's wait until you're more awake. No, I would really like to know now, Mom. The last thing he remembered was hearing about Susan's death and then waking up in Vegas. The worst part was that he was still too injured to go out and explore the sites or help locate Nikki, all because of some accident at Sonny's boat shop. Supposedly, he'd been working on a yacht with Duncan when a piece of machinery had fallen from the rafters, hitting him in the head so hard he'd passed out. Apparently, he'd had a short stay at the hospital and then was whisked away by Caleb and his mother, so they could drive to Vegas to search for his sister. Nikki ran off with this Ethan character to get married. He frowned. That just doesn't sound like Nikki at all. Something isn't right. She stood up and then bent down to pick up a blanket that had fallen. I know it sounds crazy but it's what she wrote in the note she'd left. It said that if Caleb and I were going to get married, then she could do the same. I tell you, I don't know what has gotten into that girl. She sighed. Ever since she met that boy she's acted crazy. Mom this doesn't make sense at all. What about Duncan? Does he know anything about this? No at least I'm not sure. I haven't spoken to him since last summer. Wait that's not right. You did, you had to have. He disappeared just recently and then came back, don't you remember? And then, he grimaced and closed his eyes. Hell my mind is all foggy. I don't even remember exactly what happened. I wouldn't worry about Nikki. If Caleb says he has everything under control, I believe him. Did you try calling her cell phone? She waved her hand. Yes, obviously it was the first thing I tried. He scooted to the edge of the bed. Where's my phone? I'm calling Duncan, see if he knows anything. This whole thing is messed up. Nikki would never do something this stupid. I saw the note. She even put some little hearts around Ethan's name and said not to worry, that she was in love and wanted to be with him. It was definitely her writing. This definitely didn't sound like his sister. Things weren't adding up. Nikki drew little hearts. Okay, where's this letter? I have to see this for myself. She stared past him looking slightly baffled. Well um, I don't know. He stood up and his legs felt like jelly. What do you mean you don't know? She folded her arms across her chest. I've been trying to find it but I think it may have been misplaced in the last couple of days. Before he could respond there was a light tapping on the door and then Caleb stepped inside. Hey how's he doing? He asked softly before his eyes rested on Nathan. Oh, you're awake. Good. Yeah, feeling pretty crappy but awake, he replied. Caleb nodded toward Nathan's head. Considering that bump on your noggin, you're lucky to be alive. Anne grinned. He always did have a hard one. Nathan touched the top of his head. He didn't feel anything. Huh. If there was one it's gone now. My head is still pretty fuzzy though. Caleb nodded. That's to be expected. You just need to keep resting and soon you'll feel as good as new. That's all I've been doing is resting, Nathan mumbled. Have you found Nikki yet? Anne asked. Ah, oh, not yet but it shouldn't take long now. I've got my contacts here in Vegas checking the chapels. I'm pretty confident that they'll find something soon. Good. Nathan looked down at his black sweatpants and t-shirt. Hey mom, do you have any other clothes for me? I want to take a shower and get something to eat. Anne walked over to the closet and opened it. Here, she pulled out his old backpack. I packed some things for you. Shampoo, toothpaste, so close. He took it from her. Great, thanks. We'll order something for you from room service while you're in the shower. What would you like? She asked. A couple of cheeseburgers, some french fries, and something to drink. I'm parched. Caleb frowned. Ah, uh, you might want to go easy on food. It's been a few days since you've eaten. I'm freaking starving. If I don't eat something soon, I'm going to pass out again. I'll deal with the consequences after, but I seriously need food. Now. He's always been borderline diabetic, explained Anne. 
Caleb nodded his head. Well, okay, but don't say I didn't try to warn you. Nathan grinned. I'll be fine. I know my own body. It's all good. An hour later, Nathan was back in bed after throwing up the burgers and half pound of french fries he tried eating. His mother leaned over him. You poor kid. Why don't you try resting again? He put his hand on his forehead, brushing away the beads of sweat. Just until I feel better, and then I'll do what I can to help you guys search for Nikki. She touched his hair lovingly. Good idea, honey. Close your eyes and let us worry about your sister for now. We'll find her, don't you worry. He nodded and closed his eyes. Chapter 5 Nikki So it's you and him now, huh? Duncan, as we waited on a bench outside of the Marlamore Hotel for Ethan. It had been his decision to go in alone to try and find some answers while we kept our eyes peeled outside. I smiled weakly. Duncan, he saved my life. He saved yours as well. I know you don't care for him, but he isn't a bad guy. He grunted and looked away. Oh, come on, Nikki, if it wasn't for him, our lives wouldn't have needed saving. I turned my head and stared at the hotel entrance, wishing Ethan would come back so I could avoid this particular conversation. I knew it was overdue but I still felt ashamed, especially for hurting Duncan. I know but the truth is, I think I'm really in love with him. You think? As in, you're not sure but you think it might be possible. Yes. I'm sorry. I touched his knee, look, you have to know that it was never my intent to hurt you. He looked at me incredulously. Did it ever occur to you that the only reason you believe you love this guy is because he charmed you and is still doing it? It's crossed my mind. But he claims that he isn't manipulating me in any way, and I have to believe him. Why? Why do you have to believe him? Because if I'm wrong and he has charmed me, I'll never forgive myself for hurting you, I thought. I just have to believe him. He saved you, Duncan, and he didn't have to. He's also helping us try to find Nathan and Mom. If he had any other agenda, we wouldn't be here right now. I don't know about that, in fact, I think that whatever benefits Ethan is part of his agenda. That would include helping you, to keep you under his thumb. I'm sorry Nikki, but I trust that asshole about as much as I did Faye. Your judgment is a little clouded too, don't you think? I asked tightly. What do you mean, he asked, following me off of the bench. I turned to him. Ah. Celeste. His eyes flashed angrily. Celeste. Listen to me, he grabbed both of my arms. She charmed me the same way that Ethan charmed you. They're both toxic. Poisonous. And it doesn't even matter that they saved our lives. You know as well as I do that they are responsible for the danger we both needed saving from. Maybe, but Ethan is just as much of a victim as we are. He was human once too, I protested. He closed his eyes and opened them, his expression softer. Nikki, I don't care if Ethan and Celeste helped us. They can't be trusted, neither of them. As far as I'm concerned, you're the only person I completely trust besides your brother, and I'm willing to do anything to help you. Anything. I doubt Ethan would offer you the same, if it really came down to it. I felt in my heart that Ethan would, but the longing and raw emotion in Duncan's eyes made my own fill with tears. I blinked them back. Thank you, Duncan. He touched my cheek. I want you to know that there isn't a moment that goes by that I don't think about you. Duncan? Shush. His eyes bore into mine as he touched my lips with his finger. I know you're confused and that you believe your feelings for Ethan are real. I get it. But what I want you to understand is that I'm here for you. Always. And I will never let any of them hurt you. Ethan Celeste, Caleb. I'd rather die myself before that happened. I smiled. Thank you, Duncan. I'm here for you, too. I promise. He pulled me into his arms. I love you, Nikki, he whispered into my hair. And I will never let you down. I'll give you five seconds to release her, or I'll take back the life I gave you in Shore Lake. Hearing Ethan's voice, I stiffened up. Duncan sighed in irritation and released me. I turned to Ethan, who looked ready to throttle Duncan. Relax. He was just trying to offer me support. Good, as long as that's all he's offering, 
Ethan muttered, putting his arm around my shoulders possessively. He gave Duncan a dirty look. I recommend you do it from a safer distance next time, though. One that's not going to get you killed. Duncan glared back at him. You don't frighten me. It's too bad your change didn't make you brighter. Nikki's mine. We've bonded, and there's no way you can come between that. Bonded, huh? Duncan smirked. That's funny, Celeste and I had also bonded, and I couldn't give a shit if we're together or not. Obviously, bonding doesn't mean mates for life. Maybe not, but what Nikki and I have isn't anything you could ever understand. Besides, Celeste is a cold-hearted bitch who is only out for number one. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that, he replied. Duncan snorted. And that doesn't sound familiar? Do us all a favor and quit trying to analyze me. So you didn't get the girl, quit dwelling on it. Are you sure that you really have the girl? I wouldn't count mind control as getting her. At least not fairly. Enough, snapped Ethan, releasing me abruptly. In a flash, he was nose to nose with Duncan. I've had it with your snide remarks. You're lucky I saved your ass when I could have just left you to die. Maybe death is where you really belong. Would you two just stop? I hollered, stepping between them. We don't have time for this when my mom's and brother's lives are in danger. Neither of them answered me and still looked ready to pounce. Hello? I waved my hand in front of his face. Earth to Ethan. I think we all need to focus on what's important right now, I said angrily. Did you find out anything about my mom and Nathan? Still glaring at Duncan, he took a step back. I did, actually. I've set up a meeting with the hotel owner. My heart skipped a beat. Seriously? Does he know where they are? He actually wouldn't say. He wants to speak with you, however. My eyes widened. I put a hand to my chest. Me? Ethan's lips thinned. Yes, you, and that's why I think he knows something. He's dangerous, however, so I have mixed feelings about taking you to him. What, is he in the mafia or something? Duncan asked. Much worse. He's a lichen, Ethan replied. Chapter 6 Nikki Are you sure we should be meeting with this guy? Duncan muttered as we stepped into the hotel lobby. Isn't there any easier way to get information? And seriously, what exactly is a lichen? Some kind of werewolf? Not quite. Don't confuse them or you'll be in trouble. Ethan removed his sunglasses and I watched as a woman walked by, eyeing him appreciatively. Dressed in black slacks and a dark blue silk shirt which really made his eyes pop I couldn't blame her. To tell you the truth, he wouldn't say why he wanted to see her. Great, mumbled Duncan. So, we don't really know what we're walking into. What if it's some kind of trap that Caleb set up? Ethan flashed a dazzling smile at two younger girls staring at him dreamily while their parents checked in at the counter. They immediately giggled and began whispering. He turned to Duncan. I don't think it is. When I mentioned Faye, there was definitely some animosity on his end. Caleb was Faye's main boy, so I think this guy might be on our side. I grunted. I thought you were Faye's main boy? No. I wanted her to think I was, to keep you safe. But I was never with her. Not in that concept. Now don't look at me like that, he said, smiling in amusement. We went over this, Nikki. I know. I just couldn't stand that woman. She was an evil, ruthless bitch. Ethan chuckled. She'd take that as a compliment if she were still alive. So, back to this guy we're meeting. Faye and this dude owned the hotel, but didn't like each other? Duncan asked. Ethan brushed a piece of white lint from his sleeve and nodded. Yeah, it sounds that way. I thought you mentioned earlier that lichen and vampires were mortal enemies, I said, getting more apprehensive by the minute about this so-called meeting. The animosity is more on their side. Lichen don't particularly like anyone. From what I've been told, they feel they are the superior race and everyone else is beneath them, Ethan replied. Aren't most roamers the same way? Duncan muttered. Many are, yeah. It's easy to think when you hold the kind of power that we do, Ethan replied. I totally got it. Even now, I was beginning to look at everyone around me differently. Normal people were so vulnerable. 
Clueless, really. It wasn't even their fault. But I had to admit that I felt a little superior, because of the knowledge alone. You're a roamer now too, Duncan. Bullshit. I'm nothing but a victim of the roamers. I am certainly not going to put myself in their category. Ethan smiled humorlessly. We are all victims. I didn't ask for this, either. Duncan didn't say anything. Well, it's a stupid reference anyway, I stated. A vampire is a vampire. The other name sounds almost romantic. Nothing romantic about ripping a guy's throat out for survival, Duncan murmured. Ethan agreed. It's a hard way to live. But you learn to adapt. Right, I muttered. I still think this is a bad idea, Duncan remarked as we stopped at the elevator. I mean, what's the benefit for this guy helping us? Ethan pushed the button. I don't know. I guess we'll find out soon enough. A shiver went down my spine. Ethan, what if he's planning on attacking us and it really is nothing more than a setup? Are they stronger? Tell you the truth, I'm not sure. What I do know is that I won't let him hurt you. Ethan grabbed my hand and squeezed it. Besides, we've got speed on our side. No way are lichens faster than us. But why even risk it? Duncan asked, maybe you and I should go talk to this guy alone. Leave Nikki somewhere safe. He specifically asked to meet her and I don't want to piss him off. I mean, it's all we have right now, he replied. Unless you have any better ideas? Duncan shrugged. We could keep searching the city. Check with other hotels? I sighed. No, that would take too long. Time is running out. It may have already run out for them, Ethan said with a grim expression. You'd better be prepared for that, Nikki. Nodding, I watched as the elevator doors closed and tried to ignore the feeling of doom in the pit of my stomach. Ethan pushed the button and we rode to the top floor in silence. When the elevator opened back up, we stepped into a long hallway which led to a large gold-plated door. Ethan turned around suddenly and gave me a serious look. A word of warning, one thing I've heard about male lichens is that it's unwise to stare directly into their eyes. Especially if you're female. Chances are, with this kind of money and power, he's an alpha. An alpha? That means he is considered dominant and demands respect, he replied. In other words, they're very dangerous and aggressive. Wonderful, I replied dryly. A dog who really does think women are bitches and prefers them obedient. Why doesn't this surprise me? Ethan smiled. Let's get this over with, Duncan muttered, glancing toward the doorway. I'm starving and won't be much use if I'm too weak to help you guys. I linked my arm through his. Don't worry, Duncan, we'll find you something soon. Vegas is a smorgasbord of blood candidates, said Ethan, glowering at our closeness. We'll stop at this club I've heard about after we meet with this guy. If my contact is correct, they've got blood type O on tap. I raised my eyebrows. Excuse me? Why didn't you just take me there last night? Because you need to practice hunting. Blood isn't usually handed to you in a beer stein. Right? I mumbled, still very much annoyed that he'd made me do something I hated. He went on. You're a vampire now. You have to get over your anxieties and take what you need when you need it. Yes, I understand, Ethan, I replied a little too snidely. Looking irritated, he shook his head and began walking down the hall. Duncan smiled. You okay? I grunted. Yeah, Peachy. Never been better. Hey, I'm right there with you. I thought about his dad and immediately felt like a jerk. At least there was a chance my family was safe. Sonny was gone. Forever. I needed to quit feeling so sorry for myself. I'm actually fine. Just moody, I guess. Don't worry about me. Easier said than done, he replied. Chill out, guys. Nothing's going to happen, replied Ethan over his shoulder. Duncan snorted. Is that what your bat senses are telling you? Before Ethan could respond, the hotel room door swung open and a woman stormed out dressed in jeans, cowboy boots, and a white cable knit sweater. She stepped past Ethan, ignoring him and looking angry. Wait, Megan, called a man in a dark gray suit now standing in the doorway. At least consider it. The woman muttered something under her breath, but didn't answer. 
I stepped out of her way but she stopped next to me and stared at me curiously. I smiled at her, not knowing what else to do. She was pretty with auburn hair and deep green eyes. Although she was obviously upset about something, I didn't feel any real animosity towards us. She studied my face. You must be Nikki. Poor kid, what a nightmare for you. I hope they find your family. My eyes widened in surprise. Ah, thank you. Do you know where they've taken them? Duncan asked. She shook her head. No, and unfortunately, I have my own problems to worry about, otherwise I'd try and help. She looked back at the man in the doorway. You can trust Maximus, though. He's a good man, and I know he'll do what he can to help. Thank you, I repeated. She nodded. Good luck. The woman began walking away with her head down. It was then that I noticed that she'd smelled different. Not human or vampire. It wasn't an unpleasant smell, either. It was earthy. Like Ethan had mentioned earlier. Megan, hollered Maximus. She stopped at the elevator and pushed the button. What? She turned back to look at him and her eyes were watery. He smiled grimly and raised his hand. Godspeed. The elevator dinged loudly. With trembling lips she nodded and then stepped inside. Maximus sighed as the door closed and then waved to us. Come on then. Time is ticking. Chapter 7 Nikki Maximus Ledus threw his luxurious hotel suite into a back office and then motioned for us to sit down. I studied him as he went behind his desk and planted himself into the high-backed office chair. With his broad shoulders, longish blonde hair and goatee, he reminded me of a younger Brad Pitt. So, Ethan said, breaking the uncomfortable silence. You have information for us? He leaned back in his chair and rubbed his chin with his index finger. Actually, I think we may both have information to share. You go first, Ethan replied. Maximus's lip twitched. Toss a coin. Do you know where my mother is? I blurted out in frustration, wanting to get to the point. The testosterone in the air was starting to suffocate me, and I had no time for alpha males of any species. Maximus's eyes shifted to mine. Not exactly. I've heard that she's here with your brother, though. Well, we suspected that, Duncan said dryly. Tell us something we don't know. First, I need to know if any of you vampires are responsible for the motel murders happening around this city? He asked, staring directly at Ethan. I can't speak for Duncan, but Nikki and I haven't touched anyone at a motel, he replied. Neither have I, Duncan said. We haven't killed anyone, I replied evenly. There could be other roamers in the area. I mean, it's Vegas, right? Lots of opportunities. Roamers? Maximus repeated. Vampires, Duncan explained. Some of them like that term better. Maximus rolled his eyes. Hell, I don't give a shit if you call yourselves blood-sucking demons. What I need to know is, who in the hell is discarding bodies in my city like goddamn candy wrappers? The last few weeks we've had three bloody massacres that are obviously vampire-related. We really know nothing about it, I replied. We just arrived here. Maybe so, but you must have some idea of who could be behind these deaths. He looked at Ethan. You, especially. From what I hear, you've got connections. Now I need this shit to stop, so if you have information, spill it. Ethan shrugged. Sorry. I don't know what to tell you. He stared at him hard for a few seconds. If you're not going to cooperate with me, then our business is done here. I'm not going to allow your kind to leave bodies all over my city and act like you know nothing about it. First of all, I already told you I don't know who's doing it. It's not like we're all one big happy family and keep tabs on each other. Secondly, I didn't know this was your city. I'm sorry, are you the mayor? Did I miss something? Ethan replied dryly. I wanted to slug him. Oh, make no mistake, answered Maximus, his eyes beginning to glow a yellowish orange. It is. Not only do I own this hotel, but I've got investments all over Nevada and Texas. And I don't expect you to know this, but I'm also in law enforcement, so I have my hands in everything. Good for you, Ethan replied. Maximus looked like he was trying to control himself and starting to fail. Look, punk. 
I have the power to throw your ass in jail or worse, if I think you're messing with my town. A cop? I asked. Aren't you a... Lycan? He looked at me. First and foremost, yes. But being a detective is something I truly enjoy. Not only do I get to hunt for bad guys, but I can keep better tabs on what's going down. At least, usually. And you own this hotel? Duncan asked, looking impressed. That's pretty sweet. He seemed to relax a bit. Well, I inherited it from my father as well as the investments. He died. Duncan replied. He was killed, actually. Murdered. Ethan sighed. Let me guess, he was killed by a vampire? No. Another lichen. Victor Van Buren. His eyes rested on me. The same asshole who is now on the hunt for you. Specifically you, Nikki. I stared at him in surprise. Me? Apparently, someone's commissioned him to kill you. Ethan looked at me. Caleb and Celeste. Has to be. Maximus shrugged. Maybe. But obviously your life is in grave danger. Not only will he be hunting for you, but so will his clan. I swallowed. His clan? His pack. There are about ten or so of them. I couldn't even respond. The idea of ten lichen hunting for me was even more terrifying than my recent change into a vampire. Obviously this guy is an alpha. Duncan asked. Maximus nodded. Yes. My advice to you is to take her as far away as you can. There's no way the three of you are going to be able to take on a big group like this. Why don't you help us? I asked. You said he killed your father? Help me find my family and we'll leave. I have helped you by warning you about Victor. But we can't just leave without my mom and brother. And that gal who left here a few minutes ago, Megan? She said you'd help me. Make no mistake, I'm going to take my revenge out on Victor. Eventually. But right now his entire clan has been dispatched, so it's too dangerous to try and take him out. One lichen and three vampires against that group? No way. It's suicide. Don't you have your own pack? Duncan asked. He sighed. I did. But they've scattered, wanting to live normal lives. Or at least try. Today was the first time I'd seen Megan in almost 20 years. Do you have any other information for us about my family? I asked anxiously. We needed to quickly find them and get out of Vegas. Just when I thought things were going our way, bigger problems were erupting. He shook his head. No. The only reason I knew about Victor is because one of his pack, an old friend of mine, confided in me. Who? I asked. A woman who hates Victor as much as I do, but is too terrified to leave. Was that Megan? Duncan asked. Did she join his pack or something? He snorted. Heavens no, Megan despises the bastard. She'd love to murder him with her bare hands, and she's one of the sweetest people you'd ever meet. She seemed nice, Duncan replied. Ethan rolled his eyes. Quit kissing ass. Duncan gave him a dirty look. Screw off. You're not my type. Ask Nikki, he replied with a smug grin. Considering you charm everyone to do what you want, say what you want and believe what you want, I doubt she even knows the truth, he answered. Ethan's smile fell and his nostrils flared. Watch your step, asshole. Duncan looked amused. Oh, sorry. Did I strike a nerve? I cleared my throat. Can we get back to business? Are they always like this? Maximus asked, looking at his watch. I nodded. Pretty much. Maximus sighed. Look, knuckleheads. Nikki is going to need real men to protect her, not two immature boys constantly bickering. If Victor gets his hands on her, he'll do unimaginable things, and that's before he kills her. He sounds charming, I replied, tapping my foot nervously. You have no idea. He's a crazed lunatic, Nikki. Like I said before, get out of Vegas while you still can. I stood up. Thanks for the warning. I appreciate it. But I'm not leaving Vegas. Not until I find my family. Come on, guys. Duncan and Ethan stood up. Maximus sighed. Wait. He got out of his chair and took out his wallet. 
Here's my card. Call me when the shit starts to hit the fan, which it will. I guarantee it. I'll do my best to try and help you. Thanks, I replied, staring up at him. I appreciate any help you can give us. You'll need it with these guys protecting you, he answered dryly. Ethan smiled coldly. Wow, you're a funny guy, Max. I doubt you'll be hearing from us, Ethan said, putting his arm around me. Nothing is going to happen to Nikki. Not with me around. Or me, Duncan added. Famous last words, Maximus replied dryly. Chapter 8 Celeste Celeste crept out of Victor's suite while he slept, trying not to wake him. Her body was still sore from being ravaged by the mongrel, who'd not only nipped her savagely a few too many times, but had also maimed her chest with his claws. No accident there. Fortunately, she'd healed quickly but now needed to feed and regain her strength. She adjusted her bikini cover-up, making sure she showed enough skin, especially cleavage, and decided to search for dinner. As she stepped into the elevator, a distinguished gentleman in his sixties eyed her appreciatively. He was dressed as if ready for a round of golf, and she suddenly recalled him from the night before. He'd been with his wife in the casino, drunk and boasting about how he was some big golf pro from Florida. Annoying as he was, his body was husky and now hers for the taking. He grinned as she moved to stand next to him. Hello there. Hi. What floor? She batted her long lashes. Whatever floor you're getting off on, handsome. His eyes widened and then he chuckled. Now honey, don't go teasing an old man like me. You'll bring my blood pressure up. Oh, I'm not teasing, she replied, taking a step towards him. Not yet, anyway. Let's find a place where we can be alone and I'll show you how serious I am. He looked startled. Wait a second, are you one of those high-class call girls? Seething inside, she forced a smile. At least he'd said high class. No. He relaxed. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. It's fine. I hope I didn't offend you. It's just that I'm not used to having a pretty young thing such as yourself come on to me. Not at all. Listen, she said, touching his zipper. I'm just lonely and need a little companionship. Maybe a little more if you know what I'm saying. He grinned, his watery blue eyes staring at her in glee. You don't give a man much choice, do you? She slid her arms around his neck and pressed up against him. There's always a choice, she whispered, moving her lips to his ear. Feel free to back out now if you'd like. Otherwise you're all mine and... I can't promise that I'll go easy on you. He sucked in his breath. You do whatever you'd like to me. I don't bite. She licked the droopy skin under his earlobe and shuddered at the promise of taking his life. I do. An hour later, Celeste arrived back at her own hotel, the drake which was across the street from the Mandarin, still buzzing in the aftermath of her kill. Not only did she feel fresh and alive, but the look of terror on the old geezer's face when he'd figured out what he'd gotten himself into, was still making her tingly all over. The terror in his eyes and the way he'd tried to escape had been most amusing. Stupid fool deserved it, she thought. They all did. Still remembering the pain and regret in his face, she smiled. For her, the terror she invoked was better than anything, even the blood itself. Although she had the power to make the experience enjoyable, she never usually did. Not like she had for Duncan and Nathan. Of course, that had been different. She'd wanted to change them into roamers, especially after that sniveling Nikki kept bashing her and Caleb's kind. To turn the two most important people in Nikki's life into roamers would be the ultimate revenge. She'd already succeeded with Duncan, and now needed to finish her work on Nathan. Just one more bonding and he'd be all hers. She couldn't wait to see the look on Nikki's face, if she lived long enough to find out. Thinking of the girl made her nose wrinkle in disgust. She hated her, and wasn't about to share her father, let alone Duncan, with the little twit. Duncan was hers now. She'd claimed and bonded with him. Yet, he was still pining for Nikki. Still at her side. The fool. Well, she decided, as she turned on the shower, if he had to die with Ethan and Nikki, then so be it. Duncan's feelings for the little bitch hadn't changed in the least after she'd given him the dark gift. It was one of the reasons she'd run to Faye, to enlist her help. To kill Nikki. Obviously, Faye had failed to kill her, since the three had obviously arrived in Vegas. 
Celeste had stumbled upon Duncan after leaving Motel Paraguay the other night and then had followed him until he'd started shadowing Nikki and Ethan. The jealousy oozing from Duncan was so strong that it had both enraged and strengthened her own resolve to destroy Nikki. The girl was a pariah and had to be eliminated for good. Where was Faye anyway? She hadn't checked in, nor were there any signs that she'd arrived in Vegas. Caleb thought Ethan may have had a hand in that. He was obviously more powerful than ever. But no match for Victor and his clan. There was little doubt that the three of them would soon be lichen fodder. She closed her eyes as the warm water washed away any remaining traces of dried blood from her skin. Now that she'd set up the hit on Nikki, Ethan, and Duncan, it was time to finalize Nathan's change and make him hers. Nathan The next time Nathan woke up, he was alone in the hotel room, the bed next to his, empty. Obviously, Nikki was still missing. Sighing, he got up and grabbed a bottle of water from the small refrigerator. After chugging it down, he wiped his mouth and decided to leave the hotel room. It was time to find his own answers, because something about his mother's was bugging the hell out of him. Nothing she'd said made sense. Nikki would never run off with someone like that. As far as he was concerned, she was always the level-headed one out of the two of them. Something wasn't right. Perhaps Ethan was forcing her to come out here? Now that seemed more accurate. Nathan scowled. He was going to pummel the hell out of Ethan if he got his hands on him. Nobody made his sister do anything against her will. That was bullshit. He only wished that Duncan was around to help him sort this shit out. He and Duncan had become really good friends the last few months. Although it was obvious that Nikki had dissed him, Duncan hadn't let it come between their own friendship. They'd started hanging out, even going to that new club together with Celeste. Club Nightshade. That was another thing. What the hell had happened between Celeste and Duncan? It wasn't cool toying with two friends like that. He definitely didn't like sharing girls, especially with a friend. As far as he was concerned, Celeste was now off-limits, and he hoped Duncan felt the same way. A girl like that obviously had issues. Or maybe she was just some kind of nymphomaniac. As all of these thoughts rambled through his head, he took another shower and tried to ignore the rumbling demands of his stomach. He was still afraid to eat after throwing up earlier, but also knew if he didn't get something else in his belly soon, he'd be worse off. As he was stepping out of the shower, he heard someone entering the room and quickly threw on his boxers, a fresh pair of jeans, and t-shirt. When he stepped out of the bathroom, he froze. Celeste. She was lying on her side in bed, holding her head up with the palm of her hand. Hi Nathan, she said, looking as hot as ever in a tight tank top and short skirt. He walked over to his duffel bag, grabbed a bottle of mousse and a comb. I was just getting ready to leave. Search for Nikki. They haven't found her yet, have they? Not that I'm aware of. He moved to the dresser and sprayed some mousse into his hand. You want to help me look for her then? She got up from the bed and stood behind him. Maybe. I thought we could have a little fun first. She slid her hands around his waist and then under his untucked t-shirt. She began rubbing his ribcage. What do you say? He thought of Duncan and wondered how many times he'd been with her. Celeste, he groaned, surprised he had the willpower to remove her hand. We can't. Why baby, she pouted as he turned around to face her. She smelled like candy and he fought an overwhelming urge to find out if she tasted like it. For one, I need to find my sister. Second, you and Duncan, he frowned. I do know about that, by the way. Third, I'm starving. She threw her arms around his neck and rubbed against him like a kitten. I'll feed you, she whispered, bringing her lips to his neck. She licked under his ear and moaned. Please, Nathan. I want to be with you. That's not what I meant, he said as her hand moved lower. I do, God. She smiled against his neck. Let it happen. How could he not? With a look of triumph, she pulled him toward the bed and then pushed him down. You're mine now, Nathan, she said, tossing away her blue tank top. And I'm going to do things to you that will make you forget all about food. He swallowed and stared up at her. Food? What food? I want you to say that you're mine. I'm yours, he said breathlessly, marveling at the way her eyes glowed. All yours. Celeste. She smiled down in approval at Nathan. 
it was time. Just as she was about to sink her teeth into his neck, the hotel room door opened up. Oh my god! gasped Anne, covering her eyes. Celeste and Nathan scrambled on the bed, trying to cover up. Anne turned around. I'm so sorry. I had no idea you two were. Don't you know how to knock? Celeste snapped, furious that she'd come so close with Nathan. Anne turned and looked at her in surprise. Excuse me? Just then, Caleb stepped into the room. His face darkened when he saw them on the bed. Celeste, get dressed and meet me in my room. Now, he ordered. Celeste sighed. Fine. He turned to Nathan. Are you okay? Nathan's face turned red. Ah, uh, yeah. Sorry, sir. Shaking her head in exasperation, Anne turned and walked out of the room. This shouldn't have happened, and it won't happen again. Isn't that right, Celeste? Caleb said angrily. She didn't answer. Celeste. She turned to him, her eyes flashing angrily. Fine. Still looking furious, Caleb turned and stormed out of the room. Celeste got out of the bed and reached for her clothes. Well, that was awkward, said Nathan, pulling on his jeans. Tell me about it, she mumbled. It's probably for the best. I mean, we are practically family now. It would be kind of weird, especially around the holidays. She turned to him and smiled. On the contrary, I think it would bring us closer together. As far as I'm concerned, you're still mine, Nathan. You even said so yourself. He blushed. Well, I was, that was. What? Her eyes burned into his. You didn't mean what you said? He gave her a lopsided grin. I don't know. I mean, it was in the heat of the moment. She grabbed him by the back of the neck and kissed him deeply. She could tell he was excited again, and it pleased her. See, you're still mine. After I deal with Caleb, I think we should continue where we left off. This time, somewhere more secluded. Look, I'm flattered that you're into me, really, Celeste, but I think it's time I started looking for Nikki. She let out a ragged sigh. Fine, I'll help you. I appreciate it. She walked toward the door. I'll meet you down in the lobby, say 15 minutes? I have to calm my dad down first. I'll be there. I'll need your help finding my way around, anyway. Of course, she grinned. For a price. If you help me find Nikki, you can have whatever I can give you. I'll remember that, she said, and left the room. Chapter 9 Nikki So where to now? Duncan asked, as we left Maximus's office and began walking back toward the elevator. We're going to hang out in the casino downstairs, Ethan replied. For what? I asked, stopping abruptly. Well, let's put it this way. We're basically on a wild goose chase, trying to locate your family. We could spend all night moving from hotel to hotel without any luck in Vegas. Yeah, but it's something, I said. Sitting around here isn't going to help. We've already established they're not even in this hotel. Unless that Maximus guy is lying to us, Duncan suggested. I don't think he is, Ethan replied. He has no reason to. Why stick around if they aren't here? I asked. I don't understand. Think about it, Celeste and Caleb know that I'm aware of this place because of Faye. I mean, I stayed here once with them about five years ago. Obviously, they would have to believe we'd check it out. Duncan nodded. Makes sense. Of course it does. Plus, we have an advantage, he replied. How so? I asked. We know we're being hunted, Ethan replied. And that's why. We let them come to us, finished Duncan. Either Celeste will or she'll send the lichen. I hope it's Celeste, I replied, clenching my fists as I thought about the way she was always goading me. Now she'd hired someone to actually kill me. I'd love to get my hands on her. Ethan sighed. Nikki, she's pretty powerful. She's been doing this vampire thing a lot longer than you, and I've seen how vicious she can be. I'd rather you let me handle Celeste. I didn't say anything. I knew he was right, although I'd never seen her in action. Still, I wanted nothing more than to wipe that you're so naive look from her face, the one she seemed to reserve only for me. I have to agree with Ethan, Duncan said. I've seen Celeste's strength back in Shore Lake. She's nobody to mess with. 
I'm sure I'd have problems trying to handle her. I grunted. I think you've handled her enough already. It was the other way around, he said tightly. Back to matters at hand, Ethan said, looking a little impatient. Since they're specifically after you, Nikki, Duncan and I should lay low while you hang out in the open. We'll keep an eye out, and if one of them approaches you, we'll intercept and do some major interrogating. Find out what they know. Duncan's jaw dropped. Wait a second, what? He scowled. How in the hell did you come up with that idea? Chill out, dude. They won't attack her. Not in a busy casino. They wouldn't risk the attention. Great, I mumbled, picturing a pack of shifted lichen surrounding me, slobbery drool dripping from their muzzles. Basically what you're saying is, I'm going to be bait. Don't worry, Ethan put his hands on my shoulders and stared into my eyes with a reassuring smile, you'll be safe. Trust me. I guess we don't have any other choice, I replied. It actually made sense, although I wasn't crazy about being the lure. Exactly. Ethan stepped back. Now let's get you some coins and set you up at a machine. You know, don't you think that will look a little odd? Me, playing the slots while my mom and brother are missing, and I'm supposed to be searching for them? Ethan shrugged. We need you out in the open, what better place than the machines? These mongrels won't care what you're doing. They'll be too caught up in their bloodlust to think that hard. Thanks, I replied dryly. Nice way to pump me up for this. He grinned. Sorry. Duncan hit the elevator button. I hope you know what you're doing. I still think this plan sucks. She'll be fine. Do you seriously think I'd put Nikki in real danger if I didn't think we could handle it? Considering how well you've been handling things up until now. He replied. In the last few days you've had the life sucked out of you by a shapeshifter and barely survived a gunshot wound. Frankly, I'm not sure if I really trust your judgment. Ethan rolled his eyes. Whatever. I really don't give a shit whether you do or not. He turned to me, his eyes softening. What about you? You trust me, don't you, Nick? Of course. How could I not? Ethan turned to Duncan. She obviously knows if anyone can protect her it's this guy, he said, waving both of his thumbs toward his chest. It's easy to see that in this group, I'm the Alpha. Duncan snorted and muttered something under his breath. I know it's not always fair, but that's life, Ethan continued, getting into the elevator. Fortunately, I was blessed with great genes. Don't take it personally. Enough, Ethan. You know he's incredibly handsome, too. You're just picking on him, I turned to Duncan. Don't listen to him. Duncan shrugged. Considering his charms are all fake, I take what he says with a grain of salt. You can believe what you want, Ethan glanced at me and smiled, but the end result appears to be in my favor though, doesn't it? I cringed. Ouch. That was definitely a low blow. We haven't reached the end, Duncan replied, glaring at him. And I have a lot more time on my hands. Speaking of which, how old are you old man? I rolled my eyes. These two were definitely getting on my nerves. Please quit taunting each other. You're both driving me crazy. Seriously. They didn't say anything, just continued sizing each other up as the elevator went down. When we reached the bottom, the doors opened, and they followed me out toward the busy lobby. So, what am I supposed to do? I asked. Here. Ethan pulled out his wallet. He took out a hundred dollar bill and handed it to me. Get yourself some change and then find a machine. We'll follow you around at a safe distance. Where do you get your money? I asked, staring at the bill. He always had oodles of it, but I had no idea where it actually came from. He smiled. Let's just say I've had many years to save. Just because I'm a vampire doesn't mean I've never held a job. Made sense to me. Duncan grunted. Right. I'll bet you've stolen as many bills as you have lives. I've never stolen money, he replied. I thought about our free upgraded suite he'd gotten for us, which many people would label as stealing. I kept it to myself, however. I was sick of the fighting and had other things to think about. Like staying alive and finding my family. I thought about the movies I'd watched and how vicious Lycan appeared on film. This was real life though, and these creatures were obviously much more dangerous. 
I needed to be extremely careful. Ethan studied me closely. You okay? I nodded. I am. Just nervous. He gave me a reassuring smile and fixed a strand of my hair that was in disarray. Don't worry. You'll be fine. I swear I'll kill them with my bare hands before they harm you. I smiled back. I'm counting on it. He stepped back. The important thing is to try and act normal. I'll try. How long do we need to stick around? He looked at his phone. We'll hang out here for an hour and then take a break. He turned to Duncan, who was frowning. Obviously Grumpy here needs to feed. I wouldn't dare stay any later. Duncan gave him a dirty look. Ethan looked at me again. Okay. You're on. I let out a small breath and then walked toward the entrance of the casino. When I stepped inside I noticed that it was modest compared to some of the others in Vegas, but still bustling with activity. After getting carded and charming the attendant into believing I was really 21, I traded the bill in for smaller ones and then located an open slot machine. It was next to an elderly woman wearing a blue floppy hat and cardigan. I sat down next to her and groaned inwardly. Her perfume, probably subtle to most people, was making me dizzy. I cursed my new sense of smell and hoped she'd be moving on quickly. She smiled at me. Hello. I smiled back. Hi. You're lucky. I was thinking about taking over that machine. Another gentleman lost quite a few coins in it earlier. It's due to spit something out soon. You might just get lucky. That would be nice, I said, staring at the machine. I'd never gambled before, and I wasn't exactly sure what to do. You can put coins in or bills, said the older woman, noticing my hesitation. It gives you credits to wager and then you can decide how much you want to risk. Oh thanks. First time in a casino. I smiled. It's that obvious. She laughed. It's okay. There are many people who have their cherry popped in Vegas. Both gambling and other things if you get my drift. I giggled. Yeah I do. I'm Hilda by the way, she said, holding out her hand. I shook it. I'm Nikki. Your hand is so cold. You should bring a sweater with you next time. They have the air conditioning cranked in these places. I will. Thank you. A red-headed cocktail waitress walked up to us and asked if we wanted something to drink. She reeked of cigarettes and vanilla. It was obvious to me that she wasn't just passing out the drinks either, as I could smell alcohol oozing out of her pores. No thank you, said Hilda. I'm on too many medications. Oh, okay. What about you? asked the waitress, her eyes slightly glossy. I'm good, I replied, trying not to gawk at her costume, which looked more like a piece of sequin lingerie. The waitress lowered her voice. A guy playing roulette wants to buy you a drink. He's the tall one with the shoulder-length brown hair and white polo shirt. Kind of cute if you ask me. I turned to look toward the roulette table and locked eyes with a stranger who looked like he was in his twenties and just like she said, kind of cute. He smiled and raised his glass in salute. Not wanting to give him any encouragement, I quickly looked away. I'll tell him thank you but I'm good. No problem, said the waitress. To tell you the truth, he's already purchased drinks for two gals earlier, so he's definitely a player. I normally don't give this information out, but guys like that just pull my chain. Hearing that, I relaxed. Definitely not a lichen searching for little old me. Thanks for the warning. No problem, she replied walking away. I overheard, Hilda said out of the corner of her mouth as she pulled the lever on her machine. But you know it is Vegas, and I'm sure he's just looking for some action. Hell if I was 40 years younger, I'd give it to him myself. He's a hunk. I chuckled. Maybe you should buy him a drink. He might be into older women. She snorted and waved her hand. My cougar days are over dear. I'm lucky if I can get my underwear on in the morning, let alone take them off only to scare the hell out of a good-looking guy like that. I laughed and glanced around the casino, wondering where Ethan and Duncan were hiding. As my eyes took a second pass around the room, I noticed the guy who wanted to buy me a drink was no longer at the roulette table. Damn machine. Hilda sighed. Well, I'm done for the day. Oh, that's too bad. 
I had to admit, her grandmotherly presence had actually been comforting. Hilda stood up and grabbed her cane. I've allowed myself a daily losing limit of $100. Today I went over by 50, so I'm leaving before I spend tomorrow's money. I don't blame you. She patted me on the shoulder. Good luck, Nikki, and watch yourself. There are a lot of crooks out here in Vegas. A young girl like you shouldn't be all by yourself, even in a busy casino like this. It's dangerous. Oh, I'm fine. I have friends looking out for me, I replied. And really, I'm not as delicate as I may look. She smiled in amusement. Of course, dear. I knew she didn't believe me. I was short, petite, and looked pretty vulnerable. But with this new and improved body, I was a force to be reckoned with. Whether or not I'd have the guts to test out my strength again, well that was another story. Thanks for the advice, I replied. You're welcome, Nikki. Good luck on that machine. Thanks. For the next half hour I played the slot machine, while watching out of the corner of my eye for anything odd or suspicious. As I slid a $5 bill into the machine, I caught another strong whiff of alcohol, and turned my head to find an older gentleman holding a drink standing right next to me. From the way he was swaying, he was obviously tipsy. He smiled widely. Winning anything? Ah, uh, nope, I answered, trying not to gag. The guy seriously reeked. Waste of money, these things are. But that's why we come here, right? To throw our money away and enjoy all that Sin City has to offer. Right, I replied, wishing he'd just go away. He took a sip of his drink. Vegas, with all of its debauchery and wicked secrets. It lurks in every nook and cranny of this town. I'm sure. He gave me the creeps, and I was considering trying to charm him into leaving me alone when he suddenly put his hand on my shoulder. I know what you are, he slurred. Make me one of you. Please? Shocked, I pulled away from his grasp and stood up quickly. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. Is this man bothering you? A deep voice asked. I turned to find one of the security guards, a tall man with a shaved head and tattoos on his arms. Yes, kind of, I answered, grateful that help had arrived. Obviously my own help was nowhere in sight. The security guard looked at the old man. Sir, you'll need to leave. The old man scowled. I pay money at this hotel to use the casino. You can't kick me out of here. The security guard's lips thinned. I'm only going to ask you one more time before I assist you myself. Leave the casino, sir. The old man waved his finger and raised his voice. I'm going to issue a complaint. I haven't done anything wrong, and you're threatening me. Crap, it seemed like everyone in the casino had stopped what they were doing to watch the show. I wanted attention, but not this kind. I kicked myself for not getting rid of the old man myself. The security guard grabbed the other man's arm. Let's go. Get your hands off me, he sputtered as the guy ushered him away. Sighing, I sat back down at the machine and glanced at the clock on the wall. Eight o'clock. Still early in the evening for Vegas. I wondered if there was a full moon tonight and if it made the lichen stronger. As I thought about this, I felt a presence behind me. I turned around and sighed. The guy who wanted to buy a drink for me earlier. He sat down at the empty machine next to mine. Pardon me, he said, his brown eyes sweeping over me with appraisal. You're not using this machine too, are you? He smelled of cologne and garlic, as if he'd just eaten. Oddly enough, it was the spicy cologne that nauseated me. No, I replied, looking around again for Ethan or Duncan. Good. I've pissed off a lot of old ladies by sitting at their machines. One woman was playing three at once, and I thought she was going to beat me over the head with her purse when I sat at one of them. Well, I'm new at this, so one is quite enough for me. He smiled. And you're definitely not an old lady. I nodded, and then returned my attention to the machine. It amazed me that he still hadn't taken the hint. I'm Jordan, by the way. Hi, I replied, staring at the fruit. No wins yet. I'm Nikki. Short for Nicole? Yep, I answered, pushing in my next wager. So, are you here by yourself? Trying not to roll my eyes, I turned to him. No, actually I'm here with my, fiancé. His eyes sparkled. 
Your fiancé? I'm surprised he hasn't put a ring on your finger. I'm even more surprised that he's left your side. I glanced down at my hand, which was obviously ringless. My ring is being repaired and my fiancé should be here soon. After that incident with the old man, I'll keep you company until he shows. You're too young and beautiful to be on your own. As annoying as he was, the compliment brought a smile to my face. Well thank you. I'll be fine however. I can take care of myself. I imagine you can. He reached into his pocket, pulled out his wallet and withdrew a photo. Take a look at this. I turned towards the picture and my heart stopped. It was a picture of my brother, sleeping in a bed I didn't recognize. He lowered his voice. If you want to see him alive, I suggest you get out of that chair and follow me. If you signal your friends or make any kind of rash movement, not only will your brother be killed but so will mom. Understand? Yes, I replied, my voice shaky. Good. He quickly glanced around. Now, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to get up and you're going to follow me outside. There are others of us watching you, so don't try and escape or call attention to yourself. I mean it when I say that your family's life is hanging on by a thread, and it's quite a thin one. I understand, I said, clenching my teeth. The arrogant smile was bad enough, but the threats on my family were really pissing me off. Good. He stood up. Now don't be long. I stared up at Jordan, wondering if I could take the jerk down and make him tell me where my family was. He was tall but lanky and didn't seem too threatening. Remember I'm not alone, he said quietly as if reading my mind. And looks can be very deceiving, can't they? I glared at him. He turned and began walking away. Looking around the casino, I wondered again where the guys were and decided that from now on, I'd be the one making the plans. Not seeing them, I did the only thing I could do and followed Jordan. Chapter 10 Maximus After the three vampires left, Maximus grabbed the bottle of whiskey out of his desk and took five quick shots. Closing his eyes, he reveled in the short-lived burning heat it brought to the back of his throat and down to the pit of his stomach. Less than two minutes later, however, his body had processed everything, and he was back to facing the shitstorm he knew was coming. Releasing a sigh, he stood up. No time to rest. Things were about to go down and that meant there'd be a mess for him to clean up when it was all said and done. Obviously, the girl and her friends would be sticking around in Vegas, even with everything he'd told her. He only hoped she'd have a fighting chance. But he knew better. No matter how strong these vampires were, they'd never survive an attack from Victor's clan. They were crazed maniacs who killed without remorse, planning their attacks with brutal precision. When things finally went down, it was going to be ugly. He thought again about the haunted look in Nikki's eyes and wished he could help her, but it was too risky and certainly not worth dying for. Not when he was planning his own vengeance against Victor. That would take patience and exact timing. Now was definitely not the right time. His cell phone rang. It was Rena. Yo, he said into the phone. Yo, she chuckled softly. What are we, 16? He pictured her sexy mouth pulled up into a smile and grinned. She made him feel 16. Sorry, what's up? Where are you? I'm at the hotel. She sighed. I'm surprised you haven't sold yet and bought some island in the Bahamas. I'd never do that. I mean, I could. I'd just never be able to live with myself, he replied. The truth was, most of the income he earned from the hotel was donated towards zoos, reserves, and animal shelters. What could he say? He had a soft spot for animals. Your love of animals is amazing, she replied. You're a better man than most, Maximus Johnson. In need of a better woman, he wanted to say, like her. Unfortunately, even if she was into him, it would never happen. Although he'd been with a human in the past, the pain of watching someone age and eventually die was heartbreaking and intolerable. He'd tried it once, and it had left him feeling hollow for many years after. Deep down, he knew it was better to be alone than to drag a woman like her into his world. Not only was it dangerous, but it wasn't fair for Rena or even her daughter, for that matter. Listen, meet me at the Mandarin. We've got another homicide. Shit. Well, I'm almost positive that it's our perp from the description of what was called in. 
I'm already on my way. I'll meet you there. Okay. He hung up, grabbed a 9mm Luger and a handful of nickel-plated silver bullets. Something told him that they'd soon be coming in useful. Rena. Rena hung up the phone and tossed it on the seat next to her. Something bothered her about the way Max had reacted to the news, as if it hadn't surprised him in the least. Hell, it shouldn't even surprise her now that they had a serial killer on their hands. But she knew Max had connections around the city and wondered if he was holding back information, and if so, why? Don't be a fool, she told herself. It's Max. He's as law-abiding and unscrupulous as they came. Not only was he her partner, but the guy gave almost everything he made to charity. He was a saint. She smiled at that. Animal charity. She'd even checked it out herself. So he was a little quirky. It didn't matter to her one way or another. It was Max and she knew she could trust him indubitably. She could see it in his eyes. Not only was he a decent man, but it was obvious he had feelings for her that he kept restrained. Why he hadn't acted on them was an even bigger indicator that the guy had a lot of integrity and didn't want to chance ruining what they already had. Not that she'd mind if he ever tried making a move. Not only was he kind and generous, but he was an amazing-looking man with his dimples, corded muscles, and honey-colored eyes. She'd be lying if she said she hadn't fantasized about him on one or two occasions. But they were partners, and she didn't want to wreck their relationship any more than he did. The real mystery was, why a gorgeous man like that was still single and alone. He'd never mentioned a girlfriend, lover, or even a one-night stand, and she'd told him everything about her pitiful love life. Of course he was a guy and they weren't as loose-lipped with their relationships. Still, it was a shame that a guy like him was single and alone. Maybe she should try setting him up. The thought of him with one of her friends didn't settle well either. She obviously couldn't date him, but she wouldn't help him get laid either. What did that say about her? That you're a selfish bitch, she said out loud. Regardless, she trusted him. He had her back and if he was holding out on something, he was more than likely waiting for the right moment to say something. Or maybe he was just trying to protect her. Either way, they were partners and good friends. She trusted him with her life. Maximus When Max arrived at the scene, Rena was waiting, a deeply disturbed look in her eyes. You holding up okay? he asked, resisting the urge to pull her into his arms. The grisly crime scenes had to be getting to her. She cleared her throat. Yeah, why? He reached over and pulled a strand of hair from her lips. You look pale. She exhaled heavily. This one is pretty fresh, and for some reason, personally more disturbing than the others. I guess the Vic kind of reminds me of Carl. Who is it? he asked, staring past her towards the two CSI technicians who were also working the scene. She glanced down at her notes. 64-year-old man from Florida. Retired golf pro, Hayden Larson. Vacationing with his wife, Marilyn. Apparently, she was downstairs in the casino when the crime occurred. Playing blackjack and sipping vodka sevens. She sober, he asked. She is now. Max walked to the bed where the older man was lying, naked and very much mutilated, just like all the others. It looked like someone had not only clawed the man to death, but had also removed his manhood, placing the mangled piece of flesh next to the body. Ah, he grunted, taking a step back. Whoever did this is one twisted freak, she muttered. Shows no mercy. I agree, he answered, moving over to the man's neck. Fortunately, whoever had killed him had failed to cover up the tiny holes near the man's collarbone, just like the last victims. Obviously, this vampire was proud of his calling card. Damn vampires. He glanced at the mutilated jewels again and felt his blood boil. Closing his eyes to calm himself, he vowed to destroy this bastard with his own bare hands. Not only for the killings, but for rubbing every one of these deaths in his face. What the hell are those? asked Rena, leaning over the holes. Someone messing around, he muttered. Who knows, maybe the sick bastard thinks he's a vampire. She snorted. Like I said, twisted freak, living in his own fantasy world. Agreed. Well, at least we know it's the same perp. Did anyone see anything? Doesn't look like it, but I haven't had a chance to interview anyone but the wife yet, she sighed, who's probably still hysterical. 
Where is she? Downstairs receiving counseling from one of the chapel ministers. What was her story? Says she went down to gamble while he was in the shower. I guess he was supposed to meet her downstairs and never made it. That's all we know up to this point. Hopefully CSI can tell us more, right Harry? The older technician, a balding man with glasses, gave her a solemn look. We'll try our best, Rena. She smiled grimly. I know you will. Anyway, Max, let's start interviewing the other guests on this floor and see if they'd heard or seen anything unusual in the last few hours. Even if they'd witnessed the attack, they wouldn't remember. Not with vampire persuasion. It would be a total waste of time, but he certainly couldn't admit to knowing that. Sounds good, he replied. Wait, said Rena, bending down. Looky at what we have here. Harry? Harry walked over and picked up a long red strand of hair with his tweezers. He smiled. Good eye, Rena. Thanks. Is that the wife's? asked Max, staring at the strand. No, she has short blonde curls, replied Rena. This just might be something. Finally a break? Max rubbed the side of his goatee and nodded. Very well could be. Could a woman really be this sadistic? asked Rena, glancing back towards the body. And have the strength to pull these murders off? Well, she might have someone helping her, replied Max. Could be two perps. Or the murderer could actually be a guy with long red hair, replied Harry. Don't always rely on the obvious. True, said Rena. Although, the Vic is in bed and naked, stated Harry. Some kind of kinky sex rendezvous gone bad? It's Vegas, very good possibility, said Rena. Hopefully we'll know more from the lab reports. Max nodded. Although it was unusual for a vampire to lose hair, it wasn't unheard of. Obviously, the old man had put up a struggle, and had gotten extremely lucky. An image of Caleb's daughter, Celeste, flashed through his brain. He always knew that bitch was insane. Chapter 11 Nathan Glancing at his watch, he wondered what in the hell was keeping Celeste. Unfortunately, his cell phone was dead, and nobody had thought to grab his charger from the cabin. Frustrated, he decided to give her five more minutes before starting his own search for Nikki at some of the nearby chapels. He knew it was a long shot, but better than sitting around, twiddling his thumbs. Besides, he really didn't want to face his mom after the embarrassing incident with Celeste. Thinking back at the horrified expression on his mom's face, he cringed. What in the hell was I thinking? Truth was, he hadn't been thinking, at least about anything other than seeing Celeste or any other hot girl naked, for that matter. Except for an occasional pondering of cars, boats, and his missing sister, his mind couldn't gravitate away from sex for too long. He didn't feel too guilty about it, however. It was the curse of being an 18-year-old guy with a constant boner. Hey sexy, purred Celeste, coming up behind him. She brushed his cheek with her lips and clutched his arm. Miss me? He ignored the question. I almost didn't think you were coming. She rolled her eyes. God, I had to listen to my dad yell at me for an hour. He really flipped out. But she smiled, it's all good now. He pulled her towards the hotel exit. Seriously, I'm surprised he wasn't angrier at me. Most dads would have gone totally apeshit walking in on something like that. She smirked. Well, he felt sorry for you. Blamed it all on me. Seriously? I know. Crazy, right? Jesus, why weren't more dads like Caleb? He chuckled. I guess there was one benefit of me being laid up in bed the past few days. It saved me from getting my ass kicked by your dad. We're 18 and legal. I seriously doubt that he would have gone that far. Besides, he adores your mom and wouldn't dream of making her mad. You're his daughter, though. Her eyes hardened. Sometimes I think he forgets. Come on, he adores you. You're all he talks about when he's not trying to impress my mom. Her eyebrows shot up. Really? Hell yeah. She bit her lower lip, a pensive look on her face. God. I wish I could shake off this dizziness, said Nathan, wiping fresh beads of sweat from his forehead. I just feel like crap. I still think you should be in bed, with me nursing you back to health. An image of her naked and tucking him into bed almost made him turn back around. 
As interesting as that sounds, I seriously need to try and find some answers about Nikki and get something to eat. I'm so hungry I could clear out all of buffets in Vegas. We'll find you something to eat. I have daddy's credit card. His eyebrows shot up. Did he give it to you? With a small smile she replied, he normally doesn't refuse me anything, so in a matter of speaking, yes. Good enough for me, replied Nathan, although he was certain Caleb was going to be pissed off when he found out. He'd already heard him complaining about hotel charges. This was not his problem, however. As they stepped outside, he stared in awe at the multitude of neon lights on the crowded strip. It looked like a giant amusement park for grown-ups. Wow, this place is sweet. Better than what they show on television, he said, staring at a transvestite dressed in a purple sequin gown and stilettos getting out of a cab. Oh, it's much better, murmured Celeste next to his ear. They can't show everything on television, and this is Sin City, Nathan. They don't call it that because of the cheap buffets and exotic white tigers. I hear that, he replied as a group of loud, scantily dressed women walked by. One of them leered at him, and it was obvious as to what kind of fun they were looking for in Vegas. Celeste tightened her grip on his arm. So, where are we going? Let's get a cab and check out the chapels around town. Guess what? I've already got us a car, she said. Forget the cab. He grinned. Why didn't you say so? Where is it? She reached into her purse and pulled out her cell phone. Hi, Tristan. Oh yeah? Perfect timing. You can pull around to the front of the hotel. Who was that? Nathan asked as she hung up. One of my minions, she replied, wiggling her eyebrows. Funny, he smirked. No, really, who was that? Tristan, an old friend of the family. Dad hired him to chauffeur me around town whenever needed. She shrugged. No big deal? Must be rough, he replied, wondering how a small-town sheriff was able to afford the things this one did. It's pretty cool, she admitted. I have to admit. Minutes later, a brand-new silver Mercedes SLS pulled up next to them. Nathan whistled. Nice, he replied as she pulled him towards the luxurious car. A guy not much older than him, dressed in dark chinos and a blue dress shirt, stepped around the car and held the door open for them. Hi, Celeste. Looking beautiful as ever. She fluttered her eyelashes and smiled. Thanks, Tristan. Tristan turned to Nathan and smiled. Nathan, right? You're in back, sorry. He slid into the back seat. Dude, I'm not complaining. I appreciate the ride. Tristan shut the car door, walked around to his side, and got back in. Where to? We're visiting the chapels today, replied Celeste. Since you know the city so well, head over to the closest one and we'll go from there. Tristan's eyebrow arched. Don't tell me you're getting married. She threw her head back and laughed. He smiled in amusement. I take that as a no, he asked, turning up the radio. Nathan stuck his head between the seats. My sister is missing. Supposedly, she's getting married out here to this asshole named Ethan. Ah yes, Ethan, replied Tristan. You know him? asked Nathan. He smirked. We've met. Nathan looked out the dark window. My sister is supposedly marrying the dickhead. And you don't approve? Not really, but more than anything, I want to find out what's going on. This isn't like her at all. Well guess what, I have some kick-ass news for you, said Tristan glancing back towards Nathan. Your sister isn't married and she's waiting to meet up with you. Nathan's eyes widened in surprise. Seriously, you know where she is? Yep. That was quick, said Celeste, tapping her nails on the door. I'm impressed. Hunting is our specialty. What are you, some kind of bounty hunter? asked Nathan. Hired on by Caleb. I hired them, actually, replied Celeste, her lips curling up. He reached over and squeezed her shoulder. Nice. Thanks, Celeste. You can thank me later, when we're alone. So where is she? asked Nathan, sitting back in the seat. Not far. Just outside of town, he replied. In a house near the desert. Is Ethan there too? That I'm not sure about. I've just heard that they have your sister, and she isn't going anywhere at the moment. She can't. The way he said it made the hair on the back of his neck stand up. 
Nikki sounded more like a prisoner, and bad decision or not, she was still 18 and shouldn't be held against her will. Still, as long as she was safe, he couldn't complain too much. Well, I'm grateful you found her. My mom's certainly going to be happy about that. Celeste, can I use your phone to call her? I have a better idea, let's surprise her, she said, turning around. Both your mom and Caleb. I'd rather tell her right away. She's been worried sick. She tilted her head. Come on, another hour isn't going to make a difference. It will with her. If she knows, she can relax and start enjoying herself. She turned away from him and stared out the window. Come on, Celeste. Can I use your phone or not, he repeated. Listen, why don't you wait until we get there? Make sure it really is your sister, said Tristan. The girl we have isn't saying much of anything. Nathan smirked. Actually, that might be a good idea because that doesn't sound like Nikki at all. Chapter 12 Nikki Seriously, iron bars? I muttered, staring through the metal into the darkness at the surrounding desert. Sighing, I removed the screen from the window and grasped the bars separating me from freedom, prepared to bend them like Superman. Unfortunately, all I managed to do was break the nail of my index finger after slamming my fist into the iron in frustration, when it wouldn't budge. Damn, I growled, staring at my broken fingertip, which I suspected would grow back quickly. Apparently, I'd overestimated my strength and was no superhero. Hell, at this point, I wasn't so sure if I was even worthy of being called a vampire. I turned around and stared in anger at the bedroom walls. I was trapped, a prisoner to the four guys in the next room. I also wasn't sure where Ethan or Duncan were, and had this sinking feeling that they didn't know where I was either. If they did, I'd have been freed by now. So much for having my back. After I'd been ushered out of the casino, a dark silver Escalade had pulled up, whisking me into the night with four scary-looking men. All twice my size. From the hungry anticipation in their eyes, it was obvious that I was in deep trouble. Why are you doing this? I'd asked Jordan when we'd pulled away from the curb. Sorry, I'm not at liberty to get into those details. Are you going to kill me? He'd stared at me for a second in the darkness and then smiled. Not cutting to the chase, are you? Look, I've done nothing to you people and now you've, you've kidnapped me, I'd sputtered. I don't have time for this. Can you try and keep her quiet? Demanded one of the men from up front. Before I could tell him what I thought about keeping quiet, Jordan had grabbed my hand, squeezing it painfully. Do you think we really give a crap? Seriously? Just keep quiet and things may go easier for you. I'd clenched my jaw angrily. Release my hand and I will. He dropped it. Geez, you're a cold bitch. After that, I'd stopped talking and started plotting my revenge. One thing I'd learned from his grip, these lichens were indeed very strong. There was little doubt in my mind that if I'd been human, he would have broken my fingers. When we'd arrived at the house, one of the men, a buff guy dressed in army pants and a tank top, had taken charge. He'd pulled out a gun and threatened to use it on me if I caused any problems. Needless to say, I wasn't interested in going down that road again, so I followed them into the house without a fight. That was almost two hours ago. Now, it was getting late, and a little voice in the back of my head told me that if I didn't escape soon, my ass would be kibble. Thinking of food, any food, my stomach growled. Apparently, the nervous tension inside of me was burning calories. Wondering if I could take one of my captors out all by myself, I decided to put it to the test. I knocked on the door. Hello. Nobody answered. Hello. I yelled, pounding again. Still no answer. This time I kicked it as hard as I could, and then squealed in pain when my foot connected with metal. Are you kidding me? I gasped hoarsely as hot pain shot up my leg. I was surprised that I could feel such agony, especially as a vampire. I blinked back tears, waiting for the pain to ease and listened for the sounds of movement. There was none. Standing up straight, I pressed my ear against the doorway and closed my eyes. I hadn't heard the SUV leave and these newly improved ears picked up everything, so I knew my captors had to be around, somewhere. Outside. I walked back over to the window and looked out. Jesus, I whispered as a pair of glowing eyes stared back at me from about 50 yards away. 
Thinking it was Ethan or Duncan, I raised my hand to wave when the creature raised its head and let out an unearthly howl that shook me to the core. Frightened, I backed away from the window and into Jordan. I whipped around. What's wrong? he asked with a smirk. Something out there? Please let me go, I begged, stepping away from him. I have to find my mom and brother. Oh, we plan on letting you go, he said, grabbing my arm. In fact, you can leave right now. I winced as his fingers dug into my skin. Hey, you don't have to be so rough. I thought you vampires liked it that way, he replied, pulling me out of the bedroom. Rough and vicious. Well, I certainly don't, I replied as he pushed me down the hallway. You sure about that? Obviously, I replied, giving him a dirty look. He flicked on the light as soon as we entered the kitchen. So, how long have you been a vampire? he asked, glancing out the window over the sink. I raised my eyebrows. So now he wanted to talk. Just a few days. He turned and looked at me. That explains why you're not as pale as some of the others. And why your scent is different. I smell different. He licked his lips and smiled. More human, but not quite. It's good. From the strange look in his eyes, I didn't think that meant it was good for me. So, I said, changing the subject. You're letting me go. He leaned back against the sink. Yeah. Go ahead. I stepped backwards towards the doorway, my eyes not leaving his. That's it? You brought me out here only to let me go? He chuckled and stood up straighter. Honey, if I were you, I'd quit asking questions and leave while you can. Before you no longer have a choice. I didn't need any further prodding. I turned around and reached for the doorknob just as someone opened it from the outside. What the hell, Jordan? Snarled the guy in the camouflage pants. I took a step back. The other man walked inside, closing the door behind him. The rest of the group isn't here yet. You can't just let her go. Jordan smiled darkly. I was just going to have a little fun with her first, Rory. What's going on? I asked, moving away from the both of them. And what do you mean by a little fun? Rory sighed loudly. She's a vampire, you dumbass. Don't even go there. Jordan's eyes moved over my chest. My father does, he said. Told me they aren't cold everywhere. Oh crap. We really are, I protested. And frigid. Very frigid. They ignored me. I'm sure Victor wouldn't want you touching her. This one is special. I know she is. I've heard all about it. But he already said we could do what we wanted with her. I say we try a sample before the others get here. What if she gets away? She won't get away. Not if you help me hold her down. We can take turns. I heard the muscles down there are intense. Excuse me, I snapped. I'm right here. They turned to me, and this time, the expressions on both of their faces were enough to send me into action. With a burst of speed, I flew towards the doorway and was out before they had a chance to blink. I was free. Or so I thought. As my foot hit ground and I was about to spring into the air, something heavy slammed into me, knocking me backwards. I quickly found myself on the cement and staring up in horror at a creature so hideous I couldn't move. Get off of me, I squeaked. All this time I thought a lichen would look like a wolf, but this thing looked like the result of a threesome between a bull, a hyena, and a bear. It was horrifying. Frankie, yelled Jordan, flying out of the doorway. Don't. I didn't wait to see if Frankie followed instructions. With a surge of adrenaline, I drew my legs up to my chest and kicked the creature hard enough to send him flying across the driveway. I quickly sprang to my feet, but before I could escape, Rory had a gun at my temple. Come on now. Don't be stupid, he said. One bullet and your brains will be smeared across the pavement. Even a vampire would find that a challenge to walk away from. I glared at him. You're fast, smirked Jordan moving in front of me. That's good though. We like a challenge. Don't we, Frankie? My eyes moved to Frankie who was on all fours, growling while thick mucus dripped from his muzzle. So, what do you think? asked Jordan, his own eyes beginning to glow an orangey red. Most don't live long enough to get a good look at a true lichen. To be honest, they're lucky, I said. He grabbed the back of my hair and twisted it around his fist, making me gasp. 
Don't be disrespectful, kitten, he snarled, yanking my hair cruelly. Take a good look at what is one of God's greatest creations. I wasn't sure how God fit into any of this, but I did what I was told, turning my gaze towards Frankie, giving him my full attention. With his brown fur, barrel chest, powerful hind legs, and long jagged teeth that would have no problem slicing into my skull, I had a new respect for vampires. We were much prettier. I glared at Jordan, wanting to hurt his ego as much as he was hurting my skull. So was he born that ugly or did someone do it to him on purpose? Jordan stared at me incredulously, his eyes burning with hate. That's it, he growled. I'm going to tear you apart. Cool it, ordered Rory, staring off into the distance. The others are coming. They'll want her in one piece. With a grunt, Jordan released my hair and shoved me to the ground. You're lucky, Leech. Leech. Good one. You know, you really should be medicated with that temper of yours, I said, getting back up. He got back into my face. Shut your pie hole before I remove it. Hey. I told you to mellow out. Hollered Rory, pushing between us. Both of you. The sound of the other lichens howling in the distance reminded me that things were about to get uglier. I turned my head towards the desert and noticed several large shadows moving swiftly towards us on all fours. Crap. As the dogs of hell continued through the darkness, I counted five pairs of glowing eyes and really began to panic. Knowing that they weren't going to be greeting me with sloppy doggy kisses, I shoved Rory out of my way, took a couple of running steps, and flung myself towards the sky. Just as my feet left the ground however, Frankie leaped into the air, his sharp jaws sinking into my leg causing excruciating pain. Ah! I gasped. Nice, laughed Jordan. Falling back to the ground, I screamed in agony and punched Frankie in the head several times until his teeth unclamped from my leg. One more move like that and I make a phone call, snapped Rory as I scooted away from Frankie. So if you want your mom and brother to stay alive, you'd better think twice about pulling any more of this shit. I was silent as I stared down at my bloody thigh through tears, hating all of them. Fortunately, the skin was already beginning to mend. Good thing you heal quickly, chuckled Jordan, bending down. Because that's gotta hurt. Get away from me, I snarled. Come on now, don't be a party pooper, kitten, he replied, grabbing my chin with his fingers, making me wince. The night is young and the real fun hasn't even begun yet. Chapter 13 Maximus Max walked out of the Mandarin and was about to light a cigarette, when he glanced across the street towards the Drake Hotel, where a gorgeous young woman with gleaming red hair caught his attention. Celeste she raised her head and their eyes met briefly before she ducked into a silver Mercedes. Shit, he grunted, tossing the cigarette aside. What's up? asked Rena, coming up behind him. Ah, nothing, he answered, watching as the Mercedes drove off. I've got some stuff to do. I'll check in with you later. Okay, she replied, watching curiously as he hurried off towards the hotel's parking garage. Something was obviously bothering him and he still wasn't sharing. She decided to follow him back to the station for a little heart-to-heart. -heart. Max got into his car right as his phone began to vibrate. A text. It was from Rhiannon, his source. They have the girl. She's at Rory Bledsoe's place. She needs help. What of her friends? He typed quickly. They were eluded and probably have no idea where she is. He swore. Now he'd have to get involved. Leaving a girl to die, vampire or not, was something he'd never be able to live with. Thanks. Nitrogen monophosphide. You'd better move quickly if you want to save her. K. He put the phone in his jacket and headed towards the outskirts of town. Rena. Rena was intrigued when Max ignored the exit leading back to the station and decided to see what he was up to. Careful to stay a few cars behind, she followed him for a few miles until he reached a strip joint on the edge of town. She snorted. Seriously, Max? He pulled in past the sign, drove slowly towards the back of the parking lot, and turned off the engine. Great, she sighed, pulling to the side of the road. She certainly wasn't going to confront him in the parking lot of jugs and mugs. How awkward would that be? As she prepared to turn her car around, Max's door opened and he got out. Instead of heading towards the entrance of the bar, however, she saw him moving on foot towards the desert. Talk about crazy. 
Deciding to follow him, she put her purse in the glove compartment, got out of the vehicle, and slipped her keys into her pocket. This is nuts, she whispered in the darkness as she moved towards the edge of parking lot. What was so important that Max would walk out into the desert in the middle of the night with the threat of snakes, scorpions, and God knows what else? And why in the hell am I contemplating following him? Because you can't help yourself. Two men stepped out of the bar, talking loudly as they lit cigarettes. Not wanting to bring attention to herself, she crouched down, pulled out her gun, and began following Max's silhouette at a safe distance. Eventually, he disappeared behind some large boulders about 200 yards out. With her pulse racing and the hair on the back of her neck standing sky high, she took a deep breath and crept around the large rocks. When Rena saw what was around the corner, she put a hand over her mouth to keep from screaming in terror. This can't be real, she thought, staring in horror at the giant furry creature standing on two hind legs, its back to her. Sensing her presence, the monster whipped its head around and their eyes met. Oh my god, she choked, raising her gun towards the creature, its golden eyes still locked onto hers. You stay the hell back. With a roar, the thing dropped down on four legs and took off running in the opposite direction. Max, she screamed into the darkness, worried that the creature was going to find and hurt him very, very badly. Max, where are you? He didn't answer. Trying to hold on to her sanity, she turned her head to see if he was hiding between the boulders, and was even more stunned when she found something that didn't make any sense at all, a gun sitting on a pile of clothing. The same clothing her partner had been wearing only moments before. Chapter 14 Nikki I sat at the picnic table in the backyard while the lichens frolicked and wrestled together, just past the edge of the property in the cover of darkness. They had yet to show themselves completely, and I was thankful for that. Seeing a beast like Frankie up close was disturbing enough. From the loud yelps and growls echoing in the darkness, it was evident that the lichen version of play was much different than most canines. Then, when one of them limped away from the others, obviously injured, I shuddered to think of what they had in store for me. If that's how they treated friends, my future held a world of pain. Closing my eyes, I thought of my mom and brother, wondering how I was going to get all of us out of this mess. Obviously, Ethan and Duncan weren't going to be of any help, so it was just me against nine lichens, plus the Alpha, who was still on the way. Victor, Jordan's father. The situation was bleak at best. How's your leg? asked Rory with a wide grin, his teeth gleaming in the darkness. I arched my left eyebrow. Why do you care? He chuckled. You got me. I don't really care. Just curious as to how quickly you vampires recover from a wound. My leg was doing fine, but my spirit and energy level were almost non-existent. Well, don't worry. I certainly won't be a challenge for you, I said, staring at down my hands, which were so pale they seemed to glow in the moonlight. I'm pretty weak now. You need to feed? Yeah, I smirked. You want to donate? He leaned forward and returned my smart-ass grin. There will be some bloodshed soon, little girl, but it certainly won't be a lichens. I couldn't believe how cold-hearted this jerk was. I thought that your group enjoyed a challenge? Seems kind of silly to have a group of badass lichens bringing down a little girl like me. We were hired to take you and your two friends out. Obviously they're missing, but something tells me they'll be making an appearance soon enough. If only I was as optimistic. Right? Before I could stop him, he reached forward and brushed a strand of hair from my face. I think they'll definitely come looking for you. I shrank back. If you were one of us, you'd have never been left alone in the first place. We protect our own. Before I could respond, a pair of headlights began moving towards us in the distance. Is that Victor? asked Jordan, walking to the picnic table. I thought he was the one who said no cars. It's Tristan, replied Rory. He sent me a message a few minutes ago. I believe this night is about to get even more interesting. Excellent, said Jordan. Frankie, you'd better take cover. The creature, who'd been watching me from a spot near the garage, jumped up and ran towards the desert with the others. Stay low, everyone, hollered Rory. Tristan isn't alone. Jordan grinned. Does that mean we also get Brother Rabbit? I don't know. From what it sounds like, Celeste seems to fancy the human. My head whipped back around to look at Rory. Celeste is in that car? He stood up. Yes. So is your brother. 
Nathan. Oh hell, I couldn't let them hurt my brother. Remembering the way Jordan had ogled me earlier, I decided to see if I could bargain with him. Please don't hurt my brother, I begged, desperately trying to charm him with my eyes. I. I'll do anything, anything you want. No arguments or resistance either. Please. His eyes regarded me shrewdly. What exactly are you getting at? I forced a smile. You mentioned something earlier about, you know, hooking up. Rory snorted and Jordan threw his head back and laughed. My eyebrows shot up. Why is that funny? You're in no position to barter, said Rory. And save your powers. Charm doesn't work on us. Now wait a second, replied Jordan, a wide grin still on his face. I want to hear you say it again. What are you willing to give up to save your brother? I swallowed hard. Um, I'll let you have sex with me. Let me? Now where's the fun in that? He asked with a dark smile. I blinked. I don't understand. You will, he replied. Kitten. I wanted to scream at him to stop calling me kitten, but the look in his eyes stopped me cold. He was insane. Certifiable. Jordan, you have to check with Victor first, said Rory. He licked his lips. Believe me, no worries there. What is he talking about? I asked Rory when Jordan walked away. He smiled. You just offered yourself to a guy whose idea of foreplay is finding new ways to make a woman scream, and not in pleasure. Even lichen females know enough to keep their distance from him. I turned to look at Jordan, who was now talking on his cell phone. With his handsome face and sparkling brown eyes, he certainly didn't fit the image of a rapist. Nor did he look like someone who could turn into a big, hairy beast and rip your throat out. It appeared that I was to be introduced to both of those personalities soon enough. As if Jordan could read my mind, he smiled slowly and winked. I looked away, focusing on the silver car that was now pulling into the driveway. The one with Nathan and Celeste. Celeste. My stomach knotted up as our eyes met through the windshield. I wanted nothing more than to throttle the bitch with my own two hands. You behave, ordered Rory, apparently sensing my hostility. And remember, we still have your mother. You do anything crazy and she's dead. I gritted my teeth. The front doors opened on the Mercedes and two people got out, a tall guy with wavy blonde hair and Celeste, who as always looked ready to walk the runway. Nikki, she said with a plastic smile. What a pleasant surprise. You're so full of crap. Where's Nathan? I asked tightly. Nikki, hollered Nathan, getting out of the back of the car, his face filled with relief. Oh man, I'm so. Glad to see you're okay. I forced a smile as he jogged towards me. He looked exhausted and like he'd lost some weight but other than that a sight for sore eyes. Hey Nathan. He hugged me and I closed my eyes, trying to ignore the scent of his human flesh, focusing more on the warmth of his embrace. No matter what, he'd always be my brother and there was no way I'd ever do anything to harm him. I was suddenly struck with the fact that my twin and I would never have the same kind of bond now, because I was a vampire. It brought tears to my eyes. Geez Nikki are you okay? he asked pulling away. I swallowed the lump in my throat. I'm fine. His eyes scoured my face. You're so pale and he touched my cheek with the palm of his hand, chilled to the bone. You must have caught something. No, I'm seriously okay. It's just chilly in the desert at night. His eyes narrowed. But you shouldn't be this cold. We'll see what mom has to say when we get back. That has got to be unhealthy as well as a little strange. You don't know the half of it, I mumbled. Where is Victor? asked Celeste. I need to talk to him. He's on his way, replied Jordan, staring at her with intrigue. He's told me a lot about you. Oh, really? Jordan grinned wickedly. Yeah, and I must say that I'm fascinated. Maybe we could have dinner sometime, get to know each other? Or maybe not, she replied, brushing him off. His smile fell. Nathan turned towards Jordan and Rory. So you're the dudes who found my sister? Jordan smirked. It wasn't exactly hard. She was alone and playing the slots in one of the casinos. It was almost as if she wanted to be found. How observant of you, I replied sarcastically. I can't thank you guys enough for locating her, said Nathan. We've been worried sick. 
One of the lichens howled in the desert and Nathan's head whipped around. Are there wolves in the desert? Don't worry, Nathan, replied Celeste, slipping her arm through his. You're safe. Another howl and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. The lichens were getting very restless. Nathan, where's mom? Back at the hotel, I think, with Caleb. Does anyone have a phone I can use? We should call her. Nobody said anything. Okay then. I guess we'll just surprise her when we get back, he replied, looking slightly uncomfortable. I sighed and scratched my head. Nathan, do you have any idea of what's going on? Going on? What do you mean? Nikki, interrupted Celeste. Where is that fiend of a boyfriend of yours? Ethan. She smirked. Yeah. Do you know where he is? I glared at her. Well, he's not where you left him, in Montana. You know, in that cell shriveled and rotting away. What was that? asked Nathan. I had nothing to do with any of that. It was all Faye, she replied. She was responsible for everything. Maybe, but you hand your hands in it. I know you did, I replied. And now this? You've really outdone yourself this time. Celeste raised her chin. Whatever, believe what you want, Nikki, but we all know you're a little paranoid and never liked me anyway. I smiled coldly. Finally, something we both agree on. Rory pulled out his gun and pointed it at me. Okay, enough talk. It's giving me a headache. Dude, replied Nathan, raising his hands in the air. What's with the gun? He really has no idea what's going on, does he? Snickered Jordan, moving next to Rory. No, said Celeste. He doesn't, but that's okay because things have changed. Changed? What is that supposed to mean? asked Rory. We're leaving. Tristan, can you give us a ride back to the hotel? she asked, swinging her hair over her shoulder. Tristan's eyebrows shot up. Rory? Tristan snapped Celeste. I'm in charge of this situation, and I want to go back to the hotel. Hey, Red, you're welcome to leave anytime you'd like, smiled Jordan. Hell, take Nathan back with you. But Nikki here, she's not going anywhere. Nathan frowned. What? Of course she's coming with us. Come on, Nathan, said Celeste, grabbing his arm. Let's go back to the hotel. Your sister can take care of herself. Wait a minute, he said, pulling away. We came all this way to find Nikki. Well, we found her, and I'm sure as hell not leaving without her. Take my advice, kid, you'd better leave before it's too late, said Rory, smiling evilly. Before it's too late, he asked incredulously. What, are you guys selling drugs or something? Listen, he raised his hands and chuckled, I'm cool with that. I mean I've smoked a J once or twice. I swear I won't say a word. I just want to get back to the hotel, find some food and maybe check out a couple of shows. Other than that, I don't care what you guys are doing out here in the desert, and either does Nikki. Right Nick? Right, I replied, trying to play along with it at least for Nathan's sake. Just then, Jordan's cell phone rang. Hi, Victor, he said. Victor spoke for a few minutes and Jordan grinned. Okay, thanks, man. I'll catch you back in Minnesota. Then he hung up. Good news, he said, setting his phone down on the steps. Victor has another project he's working on and won't be joining us tonight. He said to take care of business and report to him when we're finished. Rory smiled in anticipation. Well shit, let's get this show on the road. Wait a minute, replied Celeste. I need to speak with Victor. Call him back. No sorry Red, replied Jordan, unbuttoning his shirt as he walked towards her. He left me in charge now and doesn't want to be disturbed. Her eyes narrowed. Call me Red one more time and I'll rip out your vocal cords. You don't frighten me in the least, he answered. Red. Her eyes turned crimson. What the hell? whispered Nathan in shock. Rory sighed. May I remind you that you're surrounded by lichens. You touch Jordan and that's it. You're dead. You're a fool if you think that scares me, she growled. Nathan took a step back. What's going on around here? I moved closer to him. It's what I've been telling you for the past few months, Nathan. Wake up. Oh, come on. But. Just stop. Now let's get out of here, said Nathan, grabbing my arm. We're not that far out of town. 
If these guys are going to be difficult, I'm not sticking around. Jordan laughed. You're not leaving. In fact, I think we should stop wasting time. He then leaped towards the ground and before I could blink, morphed into a lichen, one that was much larger than Frankie. Nathan let out a string of swear words as he stared at the hideous creature now standing proudly before us. Just like Frankie, he was furry, had elongated ears and jaws that could definitely tear through metal like butter. Hell yeah baby, let the games begin, shouted Rory, throwing himself towards the cement. Crying out in fear, Nathan backed away as Rory's snout pushed forward and his clothing ripped away from the sheer force of his transformation. The next thing I knew, Celeste flew towards Nathan, grabbing him around the waist and then shot up into the sky. Rory began to growl, and I rushed behind the picnic table, separating myself from the two of them. Please. This is madness. I shouted. Jordan leapt onto the picnic table and bared his teeth, almost smiling as if mocking me. He then opened his mouth and in a hoarse voice growled, Run. Chapter 15 Nikki I ran, but only because I didn't have quite enough energy needed to fly. With a burst of adrenaline that surprised even me, I tore off into the desert, putting what I thought was a considerable amount of distance between us. But I'd underestimated the speed of the lichens. Just when I thought things were going my way, one of them slammed into me from behind, and I went flying face first into the sand. When I looked up, however, I was alone. Swearing to myself, I brushed the sand from my palms and stood on shaky legs, wondering when they were going to strike next. It was obvious that they were toying with me, and to them, it was all a game. Weary and exhausted, I turned and began moving towards the city lights, wishing that I had enough strength to launch myself into the sky like Celeste. But as it was, especially after that initial burst of speed, I was having problems even running. Eventually, I lost all energy and was reduced to a slow trot. This is it, I thought. I'm a goner. As if to reiterate that depressing fact, howls erupted all around me in the darkness. They'd circled me. Trembling, I crouched down and scurried over to a nestle of tall shrubs for coverage. It was then that I noticed a group of large sandstones about 200 yards away and felt a new flicker of hope. If I could just make it to the safety of the rocks, maybe I could somehow lose them? I looked around warily. As silent as it was, I knew they were out there somewhere, watching and waiting. Taking a deep breath, I decided to make a run for it. Crouching down, I moved across the desert, waiting for one of them to pounce at any second. When I made it to the cover of the large rocks without incident, I sighed in relief. At least I wasn't out in the open anymore. I had a chance. Licking my lips, I moved around the rocks until miraculously I found a suitable shelter where I could hide and rest. It was tucked away and small, but almost totally obscure in the darkness. Getting down on my knees, I crawled into the small crevice, which was between two large sandstones, and brought my knees to my chest. Silence. Closing my eyes, I released a shaky sigh, grateful for finding a place to catch my breath. Within seconds, however, I nodded off. Lukey here. I caught myself a little rabbit, chuckled Jordan, reaching for me through the crevice. My eyes popped open and I found him staring at me through the opening, a triumphant smile plastered across his face. I backed up as far as I could. No. Yes. Please don't do this. His long arm reached in further and grabbed my wrist, digging his nails into my skin. Let's get you out of your hole, little bunny. Please just leave me alone. I begged as he jerked me through the opening, scraping my skin. I love it when you beg, he said. It's like music to my ears. You're crazy. Like a fox, he giggled eerily, shoving me towards the ground. Or a wolf. When I saw that he wasn't wearing any clothing, I was shocked. He looked down at his pelvis and smiled lewdly. What did you expect? We lose our clothing as soon as we change. Stay the hell away from me. I replied, trying to crawl away from him. He grabbed my ankles, pulled me back, and flipped me over. Time to do some collecting. No, we had no deal. I cried as he got on his knees and straddled me with his legs. Oh, but we did, he said, grabbing my wrists. You think Celeste got out of there because she's quicker than us? She's fast but not that fast. I paused. So he's safe? Safe? Well, from us. His eyes stared at my chest. 
I've often wondered what the blood of a vampire tasted like. I guess I'll get the chance to find out now. Talk of blood made my own stomach rumble in hunger. I stared at Jordan's neck, wondering what would happen if I drank from it. Although, at this point, I almost didn't care, as the hollowness in my stomach was killing me. Wait, how can I trust you? His hand slid around the base of my throat and he applied pressure. Who said anything about trust? I opened my mouth to respond but he tightened his fingers, smirking at my discomfort. Now, I've sent the others away and it's just you and me, kitten. If you play nicely, I might let you live. If you resist and give me a hard time, death will seem merciful. Got that? I glared at him. He squeezed harder. Just blink twice. Tears slipped out of my eyes as I did just that. He snorted and released my throat. You know, you're not very powerful for a vampire, are you? Coughing, I turned my head away to catch my breath. Now, we're going to play a little game, he said. It's called Jordan Says. It's similar to a game you probably played growing up, so I'm sure you already know the rules. But in case you've forgotten, we're going to have a practice round. Sound like fun? I turned and glared up at him. He reached over and slapped my cheek with the palm of his hand. I didn't say Jordan says give me a dirty look, now did I? No, I mumbled. He slapped my other cheek. I didn't say Jordan says speak, did I? I wasn't sure how to respond so I just stared at him, both of my cheeks on fire. He grinned. See, you're already learning. I remained silent. Now, he said, getting off of me. Stand up. I didn't move. I said stand up, he growled. I got up quickly and stood before him. With a maniacal smile on his face, his closed fist met with my cheekbone. I screamed in pain and doubled over. Jordan says stand up straight. Vowing to drain him of all his blood as soon as the opportunity presented itself, I stood up straight. He nodded. Good. Now you're catching on. This is fun, isn't it? I stared at him, trying to hide my disgust. Having the time of my life. He smirked. You'd never make it gambling in this town, kitten. As I fought to hold back a retort, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A whirlwind of movement. Ethan. Okay, practice is over. Let's get this show on the road, Jordan says run for your life. I stared past him, looking for more signs of movement, hoping that I was finally catching a break. Jordan growled in the back of his throat, and I thought for a second he was going to stomp his foot like a petulant child. Jordan says run for your life. I turned and started running. Unfortunately, I didn't make it ten steps before he had me by the hair and was yanking me backwards. Hell, you're either a pathetic excuse for a vampire, or your kind isn't as powerful as I thought. I winced as his fingers tightened on my hair. He brought my face close to his and smiled evilly. Jordan says kiss me. I stared at him incredulously. You've got to be kidding. He punched me in the face and when his knuckles connected with my nose, I could hear a crunching sound. Idiot, he growled. Can't even follow the simplest of directions? Blood gushed from my nose and down my chin. You freak, I cried, trying to break free from his grasp. Look in the mirror, he said with a sneer. He then lowered his mouth to mine and I recoiled in horror. Jordan says kiss me back, he whispered against my lips. Instead, I bit down on his lower lip. Hard. He screamed in pain as his bloody red mouth left mine. I licked the blood from my lips. Not bad. The next thing I knew, I was flying backwards from the force of his fist connecting with my stomach. I landed on the ground and began coughing up my own blood. I'm going to kill you, I said, glaring at him. He flew forward and pinned me down. Keep dreaming. The next thing I knew, his body erupted with coarse fur. No. I screamed, beating his chest frantically as he began to shift back into a lichen. Somebody help me. He opened his mouth and roared into my face so loud I blacked out. Chapter 16 Rena. Rena was frustrated. After trying to search for Max for the last hour, she found herself in a place she never wanted to be lost and alone in the desert without her cell phone or flashlight. An image of her on a reality show describing how she'd barely survived all night in the Mojave made her cringe. 
Not only would it be humiliating, but she'd never hear the end of it from her co-workers. She'd be a laughingstock of the entire LVMPD. Idiot, she mumbled, chastising herself again for the twentieth time. She should have turned heel and ran back to her car after seeing that wolf-like creature. But not her, she was as stupid as the women in those B-movies. The ones who were eventually caught and murdered savagely by deranged lunatics. Max, when I see you again, I'm going to kick your ass, she thought angrily. Who in the hell went wandering in the desert in the middle of the night without clothing? And now, she was far away from her vehicle and probably lost, when she could have been home enjoying a cold beer and the leftover chicken lo mein from the night before. Her mouth watered just thinking about the cool beer sliding down her throat. One thing was for certain, there was no way in hell she was going to survive drinking her own urine or forcing down any creepy crawlies. She'd rather die than try to swallow something that lived in the dirt or under a rock. The thought of feeling a bug fluttering in the back of her throat made her stomach roll. Dang it, Max, she hollered, kicking a mound of sand with the tip of her shoe. Where in the hell did you go? The truth was, she wasn't even sure if what she'd seen was real or if it had been the result of too much coffee and lack of sleep. The thought of Max taking off all of his clothes and then turning into some kind of werewolf had been her initial thought, but now that sounded so ludicrous, she was ashamed to call herself a member of law enforcement. She needed to quit worrying about her partner and get her ass home before she ended up really lost. She stopped walking and did a 360, trying to figure out exactly where she was. Like an idiot, she'd started walking without paying much attention to where she was headed. Now there was only darkness and a large expanse of desert that looked the same in every angle. As she tried to gauge where she was, several howls in the distance sent a chill down her spine. Wolves? As far as she knew, coyotes were the largest canine predators in the Mojave. You lost? Shocked, she whipped her head around and found herself staring at two young men moving towards her in the darkness. She lowered the gun, her hand trembling. Oh my god, you scared the crap out of me. The dark-haired guy who was stunningly attractive stepped closer and smiled. Sorry. We weren't expecting you either. She smirked. I bet. Have you seen a man running around out here? He um he has light brown hair a goatee tall with broad shoulders? She left out naked. No, replied the other one, staring at her warily. He had dark unruly hair, a five o'clock shadow, and a deeply troubled look in his silvery blue eyes. Is that why you're out here looking for this guy? She paused. Maybe. What about you two? Duncan and I are also trying to locate a friend, replied the other one with a disarming smile. He stepped closer until they were face to face. Have you seen anything unusual out here tonight? She chuckled. Besides you two. His eyes burned into hers and she felt her stomach flutter. Yes, besides us. Not really, she replied, disgusted with herself for being attracted to someone so much younger. I'm looking for a good friend. I think he might be out here somewhere. Duncan stepped forward. We're looking for someone too. A girl, her name is Nikki. Short brunette around 18? Sorry, I haven't seen anyone but you two, and, she decided to warn them, this strange wolf-like creature running around. The two men looked at each other and then turned back to her. Which way did it go? asked Duncan. I thought it went that way, she replied, waving her gun north. But to be honest, I think I'm lost. In the desert. That's not good, replied the other man. He stuck out his hand. I'm Ethan, by the way. Rena. His icy blue eyes glittered in the moonlight. Nice to meet you, Rena. Duncan cleared his throat loudly. Ethan. I think it's time we got back to looking for Nikki. He nodded and backed away. Yes, of course. I'll help you look for her if you'd like, she said. Ethan's lips tilted up. You want to join us? She shrugged. Why not? From the way it sounds, her disappearance definitely trumps my partner's. I don't think that's a good idea, replied Duncan. It's not safe. Ethan's teeth grazed his lower lip. It is pretty dangerous out here. He's right. You should go back to where you came from. You're not parked far from here, are you? asked Duncan. Probably, like I said, I'm sort of lost. Don't worry about me, though, I'm in law enforcement, she replied, raising her revolver. And I have this. 
Before anyone could reply, a chorus of howls erupted around them. Ethan turned to Duncan. Yep, they're definitely here. Let's get to higher ground and figure out what to do next. What about her? Ethan shrugged. She said she has a gun. Yeah, but... You know, it might not be a bad idea to have a quick snack before we face those things, Ethan replied, motioning towards Rena. Rena's eyebrows shot up. Excuse me? Or not, said Ethan, his eyes narrowing as he stared into the darkness. Since there probably isn't time. Jerk, mumbled Duncan as Ethan shot up into the sky without a second glance. How, where did he just go, cried Rena, looking up at the stars in shock. More wolf howls echoed in the darkness, this time much closer. Rena, you have to trust me, said Duncan, advancing towards her. She turned to him. What do you mean? Two lichens landed next to them with loud thuds. Oh my god! gasped Rena, raising her gun towards the menacing wolf like creatures. Before she could fire off a shot, one of them launched at her, but was intercepted by Duncan. They rolled to the ground in a flurry of bites and punches. Remembering the other animal, she quickly turned and aimed her gun at it. Stay back, she choked. The growling beast bared its fangs even further and then crouched, as if ready to spring. Shaking, she fired two shots, hitting it both times in the chest without effect. It snarled and charged towards her. No, she screamed, turning to flee. As she took her first few steps, Rena pictured the creature landing on her back, its claws ripping at her flesh, its fangs sinking into the back of her head. Instead, mercifully, there was a loud yelp of pain from the animal. Startled, she turned around and noticed a third creature had joined the party. Instead of going after her or Duncan, however, it was actually attacking the one that had been chasing her. Her eyes widened. Max? Rena, watch out. Hollered Duncan, who was underneath the other creature, trying to hold back its jaws with his bare hands. She turned around and squealed in terror as two more of the creatures moved warily towards her in the darkness. These two were walking on their hind legs and stood well over seven feet tall. Shaking violently, she held out her gun and fired at them, hitting one of the creatures in the face, the other in the stomach. Miraculously, the one shot in the face dropped to the ground. She raised her gun again and pulled the trigger, but the chamber was empty. Terrified, she tried running as the creature lipped towards her. It landed on her back, bringing them both down. Closing her eyes, she waited for the pain, knowing it would be bad. Instead, the creature's weight was lifted from her body. She flipped over and got up, noticing that the third wolf creature was attacking the one that had been on her back. The fact that it was helping her made her wonder again. Was it Max? You okay? asked Duncan suddenly beside her, his face scratched and bleeding. She nodded vehemently. Yes, I am, why is that one helping us? Duncan turned to stare at the two creatures still locked in battle, growling and nipping at each other. I think I have an idea. Before she could answer, her attacker yelped loudly and then took off running. The other one turned to stare at them, its yellowish-orange eyes glowing brightly in the darkness. Maximus? Hollered Duncan. Raina stared at Duncan in shock. Maximus? He nodded. He's a lichen. On our side. She turned towards the lichen and her lip began to tremble. Max? Is it, is it really you? The lichen limped towards them slowly, obviously in pain. As it got closer, they could see patches of missing fur and teeth marks on its torso. Frightened, Rena took a step back. The creature stopped and stared at her sadly. I don't understand what's happening around here, she said, her voice hoarse. With you, Max, and the other guy who disappeared into the sky. I, is this a dream? Duncan sighed. No, I wish it was. Believe me. Her eyes filled with tears. She closed them and shook her head. This is too much. I can't. I need. Rena. Her eyes flew back open. Max? Oh my god, it's really true? Now in his human form, Maximus stood up and covered his naked pelvis in shame. It is. I'm sorry. Her eyes narrowed at the deep bloody lacerations on his chest. You're hurt, Max. You need to go to the ER. I'll be fine, he replied. I've been through much worse. Why didn't you tell me, she asked, touching his arm. Would you have believed me? She laughed bitterly. Of course not. 
He sighed and looked at Duncan. Take her out of here while I look for your friend. Duncan nodded towards him. You're hurt. I'll be fine. I know where they've taken her. Fly Rena back to her car while I rest for a few minutes. You guys are quick, I know that. Rena turned to Duncan. What does he mean by that, you guys? The less you know the better, replied Max. Believe me. I'll take her back to her vehicle. Wait for me before you leave. He nodded. Where'd the other guy go? Duncan frowned. Not sure. He bows out when things get too nasty. Somehow that doesn't surprise me. There's something I don't trust about him. Something in his eyes. Tell me about it, replied Duncan. He turned to Rena. Ready? She looked at Max. You really should come with us. You're hurt and naked. Max smirked. It's distracting, huh? Her cheeks turned red. Duncan, you'd better get moving, he said. I'll wait for you. Okay. Rena sighed. Call me when you get back into town. Obviously, this is blowing my mind. We definitely need to talk about this. About everything. I know and I will call you. She leaned forward and kissed him on the forehead. Stay alive, she whispered. That's my plan. She backed up and smiled grimly. I still can't believe this. This is nuts. Max smiled. Let's go Duncan, she replied, picking up her gun. I've seen enough of the desert for one night. Hell forever. Before you leave Duncan, can I talk to you for a second? He walked over. Yeah? I need you to try and hypnotize her, he whispered. Make her forget about all of this. Can you do that? I don't know. I've never tried it. Well try. I don't want her stressing about tonight. Plus, the less she knows, the better for everyone. I understand. I'll certainly try. Good. Just don't hurt her. You hurt her and it will be the last thing you do. I would never do that, he replied. I just help save her life. Why would I harm her? She means a lot to me, said Max. And I do appreciate that, kid. Now get her out of here. Duncan nodded. You boys done plotting whatever it is you're plotting, asked Rena. Let's go, said Duncan, moving towards her. Where'd you park? There's a strip club at the edge of town called Jugs and Mugs. Duncan's eyebrows shot up. Her eyes narrowed. I was following Max. You don't have to explain anything to me, replied Duncan. You certainly have a lot of explaining, she replied, looking at the skyline. You know, I'm still lost. Why don't you lead? Oh, I plan on it, replied Duncan, picking Rena up and putting her over his shoulder. What are you doing, she hollered. Put me down now. Hang on, he replied, wincing as she struggled to get off of his shoulder. I'll be right back, Maximus. Good luck and be careful with that package, he replied. I'll do my best. The next thing Rena knew, they were flying through the darkness towards the city lights while she stared down below in awe. Soon, they landed in the parking lot of the strip joint. You okay, he asked, setting her down on the cement. Are you kidding me, she replied breathlessly. Now I definitely feel like I've lost my mind. Sorry to freak you out. This was the fastest way to get you back here. Where's your car? Over there, she said, motioning towards her car. She took her keys out of her pocket and started walking towards it. Rena? She turned back. Yeah? He walked over to her and looked into her eyes. Do you trust me now? She looked up at him. You know what? I do. You saved my life and I can't imagine a better reason to trust you than that. He smiled. Thanks. No thank you. I would have been killed if you wouldn't have found me. No doubt about it. He put a hand on her shoulder. Go home, Rena. Go home and forget about the desert. The lichens. Forget about everything you saw back there, tonight. I. Listen to me, you drove into the parking lot here because you thought you had a flat tire. But it's fine. There is nothing wrong with your tire. Her eyes dilated. My tire is fine. Forget about everything but getting home and going to bed. You're tired. You need to sleep. 
Yes, she whispered. I'm so tired. When you wake up in the morning, you'll feel refreshed, ready to take on the world. Now get in your car, go home, forget about tonight. Without another word, she got into her car, turned on the engine, and went home. Chapter 17 Nathan What in the world is going on? Hollered Nathan, pacing back and forth above the city lights. They'd landed on the roof terrace of an older hotel that was being renovated, directly above the strip. Calm down, Nathan, replied Celeste, holding up her hands. Just relax. He stopped and stared at her incredulously. Calm down. We just escaped from a group of werewolf-looking freaks and shot through the sky like a meteor. That's not something that happens every day. That's not something that happens, period. Sounds pretty incredible, I agree. Sounds pretty incredible, he repeated with a shrill laugh. And what about you, Celeste? Are you some kind of Marvel comic book mutant, babe? I guess that would make sense. You're hot, you can fly, what else can you do? Shoot laser beams or freeze your enemies with your eyes? She laughed. And I thought Nikki's imagination was out there. Out there? He cried hysterically. What just happened a few minutes ago is way out there. I mean, what the hell, Celeste? What's going on? She pouted. I wanted to tell you sooner, but I was afraid you'd hate me. He sighed. I would never hate you, okay? Never. Now please, tell me what's happening so we can try and save Nikki if it's not already too late. Oh, I'm sure it's much too late, Nathan, she replied, smoothing down her skirt. There were far too many of those lichen. Lichen? As in werewolves, right? Actually, they're a little different. Lichen can change into those hideous creatures at will, and werewolves, they can only do it when the moon is full. He looked towards the moon. Well, the moon is full, so as far as I'm concerned, we're doubly screwed. She didn't respond. What about you, Celeste? Are you a lichen? She rolled her eyes. Please. Don't insult me like that. He sighed. Oh, I get it, you're a vampire, aren't you? Just like Nikki kept saying over and over. Only I didn't believe her. Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so. Nathan groaned in frustration as he pulled at his hair, this is all my fault for not believing her. Why would you? It sounds crazy to me, and I actually am one. So, you really are a vampire? Yes, she replied, and I am not the only one, Nathan. In fact, Nikki is one now, too. He stared at her in horror. What? Just what I said. She's a vampire. He leaned forward. How? Who made her one? You can thank Ethan. I'm sure he's the one who turned her. She frowned. Or maybe it was Duncan. I guess I'm not really sure. She has a thing for both of them, you know. What do you mean, Duncan? He's a vampire, too? She sighed. Yes. I turned Duncan into one of us because he almost died, Nathan. It was the only way to save him. Nathan rubbed the bridge of his nose. Ethan, Nikki and Duncan are all vampires. She nodded. And so are you? Actually, I hate that word. It's so commercialized. I prefer Romer. Romer? Why? Back in the 1800s, we started calling ourselves roamers because we basically had to live like gypsies. Roaming from one city to the next, trying to stay alive without getting hunted, just because we were different. In the 1800s, he grunted. Okay, I've got to ask, how old are you? Let's just put it this way, since I can no longer age, per se, I'm basically a very wise and worldly 18-year-old. He leaned his arm against a brick wall and closed his eyes. This is crazy. I think I'm losing my mind. I must be. No, she said, grabbing his wrist. You're not, and being a roamer, well it's awesome having these powers. He opened his eyes. I'm serious, she said, her eyes gleaming in the moonlight. Everything is ours for the taking. We're stronger, faster, and can live for centuries, Nathan. I'm happy for you and your little club members, he replied dryly. Look, we need to find Nikki. Take me back there. I don't care if you think it's too late, I have to try. It's suicide going back there. She smiled darkly. Unless you're an immortal, like me. It would be your only chance against the lichens. 
He muddled this for a few minutes and then released a deep sigh. Then make me one of you. If that's the only way, I want you to do it. Is that what you really want? You can't go back once I do this. No. Yes. God, I don't know, he said, slamming his fist into the wall. He winced and shook his hand. Look, I just want to save Nikki or kick some like an ass if they've hurt her. If this is the only way, then it's worth it. She stepped towards him and touched his cheek. If I turn you into a vampire, you can do more than kick some ass. I promise you. His lips tightened and then he nodded. Okay. Do it. Make me a badass so I have a shot at this. She smiled darkly. Take off your clothes. He stared at her in surprise. What? In order for you to become one of us, we'll need to bond. Bond, he groaned as her hands began to wander. I've never heard it called that before. Call it what you want. He closed his eyes and gasped. Are you sure we have time? We have to make time. But honestly, from where I'm standing, this won't take much time at all. Maximus. How did that go? asked Max, who was now covered with dirt and sitting on a large boulder. Although there were still traces of blood on his face, most of his cuts and bruised had healed. Good, I think. She drove home. I believe I managed to make her forget what happened tonight. At least I hope so, I've never done the charm thing before. She's your partner, huh? He nodded. Yeah. Duncan stared off into the distance. Glad we ran into her. That was a close one. They would have certainly killed her. Max scratched his goatee. Damn Rena and her nose for trouble. Well, I'd better check on her later, make sure she made it home safely. Yeah, that would probably be a good idea. So, he jumped down from the rock, you up for this kid? I hope so. Duncan looked around. Where did they go? Buried them. His eyes widened. That certainly didn't take long. Nope. Not when you're a lichen. Duncan smiled. How many more do you think there are? Not sure, probably seven or eight. He frowned. Too bad your friend Ethan left you high and dry. Friend? He's definitely not my friend. He's Nikki's. Tell me, how did you guys get separated from Nikki in the first place? Duncan explained how they'd been watching her in the casino. Then Ethan suddenly decided he needed to feed and couldn't wait any longer. Since there is no arguing with Ethan, I stayed back and watched Nikki while he went off to go search for blood. He came back after a while, telling me that he'd lined us up with the stripper. Apparently, there's a strip joint that caters to more than just horny guys looking for naked chicks. Really? Yeah, you bring in some cash, ask to see Sam or something, and you get more than just a lap dance. Hum, he grunted. I thought it sounded too good to be true, but much better than the other alternatives. So I switched spots with Ethan, but when I went to look for this stripper at the club supposedly waiting for me, she disappeared. Then when I went back to tell Ethan about it, he disappeared and so had Nikki. Max sighed. Taken you mean? Yeah, they'd obviously taken her by then. What about Ethan, did he come back at all? Oh yeah. He showed up right after. I guess he'd followed a woman into the bar, convinced she was someone named Miranda. So they managed to snatch her while both of you were gone. Yes. Both setups, I'm sure. Even the donor? Definitely. What better way to lure a vampire than something like that? Damn. So you found Ethan in the bar? No, he came back into the casino. I just said that. Sorry, he smiled. Just making sure there aren't any holes in your story. I suppose, replied Duncan, putting his hands in his pockets. So you didn't get a look at the woman he thought was Miranda? No. Do you trust Ethan? Duncan smiled grimly. Not one bit. Are those two a couple? asked Max. Only because he's brainwashed her. Max smiled. You have feelings for her, don't you? You could say that. Why is it these days that the jerk always gets the girl? muttered Max, shaking his head. They must have some kind of magnetic pull or something. Doesn't seem to matter the species of jerk either. Ethan doesn't deserve her. He never did. Well then it's up to you to convince her of that, replied Max. I've tried. 
Try harder. Duncan sighed. Look, it sounds like this Ethan character is on his own agenda. That's actually in your favor. He's a selfish prick. He even left me alone with Rena to face those lichen before you arrived. Didn't lift a finger to help. Max's face darkened. He just took off? Yeah. Like I said, selfish prick. Duncan, let's go find your girl before Ethan stumbles upon her and looks like a hero. Thanks, Max. I appreciate your help. Don't thank me yet. These guys are dangerous, and right now, the odds are not in our favor. Maybe not, but I'm not giving up until I find her. Max was impressed with the young man's passion for finding the girl he loved, even though the chances were slim that she was still alive. Look, my insider told me where they were keeping her, and unfortunately, I've already checked the house, but it was deserted. Maybe she got away? Hopefully. But with that group, I find it highly unlikely. So what do we do? We check it out one more time and scour the desert. You take the sky and I'll take the ground. We'll meet back at the strip joint you dropped Rena off at by morning light, with or without Nikki. Then we'll just have to go from there. Okay. Godspeed, said Max, his face already beginning to sprout fur. What you said, replied Duncan, shooting up into the darkness. Chapter 18 Nathan Are you okay? asked Celeste, nibbling on his ear. In response, he turned his head and vomited. Celeste quickly rolled away from him. Yikes. Sorry. It's okay. It's normal, by the way. Your body is getting rid of any toxins left over from your mortal body. He wiped his mouth. Great. The truth was, he felt pretty good. Doing the dirty with Celeste had not only lifted his spirits, but it had also raised his adrenaline. We should get dressed, she said, pulling her tank top back over her head. He stood up and pulled his boxers on. So, am I one of you now? She stared at him for a few minutes and then sighed. Oh, Nathan. I just... I can't do this anymore. Do what? I've had a change of heart. Look, I just couldn't go through with it completely. I mean I started to, but then? He stopped. What do you mean, you couldn't do it? We just did it, didn't we? She pulled her panties up over her thighs. We had sex, but we didn't bond. I thought we bonded pretty damn good, he muttered angrily. She smirked. No, what I mean is that I didn't bite you. You could have bitten me if you wanted to. I don't mind a little kinky stuff. As I was saying, she said irritably, I didn't inject you with anything which means you're still mostly human. It takes three injections altogether and you've only had two. He wiggled his eyebrows. I thought I was supposed to do the injecting? She rolled her eyes. You just don't quit with the lame jokes, do you? Lame? Hey, what about the vomiting thing? You said my body was getting rid of toxins. Like I said, I started and then changed my mind. It made you a little sick, obviously. So what was this all about, he said, pulling on his jeans. I thought you were going to make me into a vampire. To help save Nikki. She wiggled into her skirt. Well, she said, turning towards him, there's a little something that I forgot to mention. What? I don't actually want you to find her. He stared at her in shock. What? She ran her fingers through her curls, fluffing them around her shoulders. You heard me. I don't want you to find Nikki. She sniffed. For all I care, she can rot in hell. His jaw dropped. What? I don't understand. God, she's such a whiny little bitch, always nagging at everyone. She raised her voice, mimicking Nikki. Celeste is a vampire, Ethan makes me do things I don't want to do, Duncan is missing, we have to look for him. She snorted. She has all of you wrapped around her little finger, including my dad because of your mother. Well, screw her. I hope those lichen tear out her annoying little throat. Celeste. She put her hands on her hips and raised her chin. I've come to realize that you and your mother need to go as well. With all three of you out of the picture, my dad will have more time to help me with my mission. I need his support now more than ever. Your mission. Yes. Well, mostly Victor's, but he said he'd take care of me when the time came. He's going to rule the world someday, you know? She sighed dreamily. 
and I'm going to be at his side, enjoying every minute of it. You're crazy. Her eyes narrowed. The only thing crazy around here is the fact that roamers are forced to hide, when we should be treated like gods. You mortals should be bowing down to us, showing the respect we deserve. Respect? For being a killer? We're all killers, Nathan. Roamers and Lycan are just higher up on the food chain. Listen to me, don't you dare harm my mother, threatened Nathan. Or I will bury you myself. She opened her mouth and bared her fangs. Are you so sure about that? He took a step back. Stay away from me. She licked her lips and nodded. Now don't you worry about a thing, Nathan. Because I really do like you, I'll make both of your deaths quick and uneventful. She giggled. Kind of like the sex we just had. You are truly an evil witch. She smirked. You have no idea. Maximus. He smelled her fear long before the screams filled his ears. With a surge of adrenaline, he launched into the direction of Nikki's terrified cries, reaching them quickly. Before he could get close enough to help save her, however, a dark figure stepped into his path. Don't interfere. Max stared at Ethan in shock. What are you talking about? She's one of your own. He'll kill her, he hollered incredulously. Ethan smiled coldly. You have no idea what's really going on here. Leave before you get hurt. You're insane, snarled Max pushing him aside. Before he could reach Jordan and Nikki, however, Ethan jumped on his back and tried putting him in a chokehold. Stand down or I'll kill you, growled Ethan tightening his hold. I'm not going to warn you again. Enraged, Max reared up and slammed Ethan into a large boulder. Fool. You and what army? Grunting in pain, Ethan released him. You're making a mistake, he snarled. Leave them be or you'll be answering to more than just me. Why are you allowing this, he asked, clenching his fists. Instead of answering, Ethan looked towards the sky. Damn it, he muttered and then shot up into the darkness. Max immediately raced towards Nikki. Get off of her, he ordered, grabbing Jordan by the neck and pulling him away from the girl. Maximus. Leave us alone. This has nothing to do with you, Jordan growled angrily. Trying to rape that girl makes it my business, snarled Max. I repeat, don't interfere or I'll have no choice but to kill you. You really are an arrogant bastard, replied Max, staring down the smaller lichen. And obviously not very bright. A shadow from overhead made both of them look up. Duncan. Nikki, he yelled, landing next to her body. He got down on his knees and stared at Jordan, ready to kill him. What have you done to her? Jordan growled angrily and then tore off into the desert. Shaking his head in disgust, Max returned to his human form. Victor's nephews are even crazier than he is. Ethan descended from the sky. You found Nikki, thank God. He bent down on his right knee. Is she okay? What happened? Shocked at this bold display, Max watched Ethan, wondering what he'd do next. I don't know, replied Duncan, removing his t-shirt. He slipped it over her shoulders and pulled her arms through the holes. She's cold and obviously needs to feed. I'll take care of her, replied Ethan, trying to scoop her up into his arms. No, I've got her, snapped Duncan, pushing him away. You can't just waltz in here and play hero whenever you like. She's mine, Duncan, hissed Ethan. Let her go. What games are you playing? Snarled Max, stepping closer. Ethan scowled up at him. Duncan, don't listen to Max. He's with them and full of lies. Max pointed at Ethan. You're the one full of lies. What's going on? What are you trying to say? asked Duncan. He was already here, he replied, glaring at Ethan, when I arrived. Jordan was on top of Nikki and Ethan did nothing to stop it. That's a lie, cried Ethan. I would never let anyone hurt her, let alone touch her intimately. You of all people know this, Duncan. The only thing I really know is that you've been manipulating Nikki ever since she moved to Montana. To be honest, I don't know what the hell to believe. I saved your life, replied Ethan, standing up. You should obviously believe me. Only because Nikki begged you to do it, said Duncan. I didn't have to. I could have lied and said it was too late. But instead I saved your pathetic life and now, now you have the nerve to question my motives? Don't let him take her, warned Max. 
He's on some kind of agenda. You're on some kind of agenda, replied Ethan. Your kind took her and now you're spouting out lies about me. Max took a step forward, his eyes beginning to glow. Oh, you're good. What I don't understand is why you were allowing Jordan to attack her. Is this some kind of twisted fantasy of yours or something more sinister? You're a pathetic liar, smirked Ethan. I don't know what's going here, said Duncan, but I'm getting Nikki out of here, and if you try stopping me, Ethan, so help me, I'll kill you. Ethan chuckled. Seriously? You couldn't kill me if you tried. Maybe he couldn't do it alone, said Max, but I'm willing to wager that both of us could take your ass down. Ethan stepped back. You're both making a big mistake. Get the hell out of here, snarled Max, his face beginning to change. You're both going to pay for this, replied Ethan, backing away further. Nobody takes what is mine and gets away with it. Nobody. She's not yours, snapped Duncan. He smiled darkly. When the time is right, she'll come back to me. She will always choose me over you. Before Duncan could respond, Ethan was gone. Better get her out of here, said Max, staring up into the sky. Before he or Jordan returns. I will. Thank you, Max. He turned to him. I didn't do much, but you're welcome. Thank you for helping my partner, Rena. I wouldn't have gotten there in time to protect her. You saved her life, my friend. It was the least I could do. Max looked down at Nikki. Listen, bring her to my hotel and I'll get you a room. Something tells me she's in a lot of danger and needs to be hidden. Okay. I need to try and get her to feed first. Do it quickly. I'll keep my eyes peeled for the others. Duncan nodded and watched as Max began scouting the area around them, giving them some privacy. He bit into the side of his wrist, drawing blood, and then raised her head. Nikki, he whispered. Try and open your mouth. Ethan, she murmured, her eyelids fluttering. He forced a smile. No, it's me. Duncan. She closed her eyes. I'm so cold. Here, he said, you need to feed. She released a sigh and fell back asleep. Groaning, he pried her mouth open and squeezed as much blood as he could into it. After a few moments, Nikki's teeth were clamped onto his wrist and she was drinking on her own. Sorry, he whispered, touching her cheek. Sorry for everything that's happened to you. She opened her eyes and stared into his, looking confused. He kissed her forehead, noticing her skin was slightly warmer. I have to save some of my own blood to get us out of here alive. Unfortunately, I'm pretty weak myself. She moved her mouth away from his wrist and closed her eyes. So tired, she whispered. We're getting out of here, he murmured, gathering her into his arms. He still couldn't believe Nikki was alive. The truth was, after finding out his father had been murdered, he hadn't put much hope into actually finding her alive. Hadn't wanted to set himself up for more pain. But here she was, the girl he hadn't been able to stop thinking about since she'd swam into his life in her orange and pink bikini. The memory of seeing her getting out of the lake last summer was something he'd never forget. Or the first time they'd kissed in his truck. How unexpected and totally awesome it had been. He looked down at her heart-shaped face and could feel his chest swell. With her flawless skin, thick lashes and full lips, he felt like he could stare at her forever. Plus the love and determination she had to save her family made her even more beautiful, inside and out. A howl from somewhere in the distance reminded him how dangerous their situation was. Unfortunately, he was too weak to fly, especially holding Nikki. It didn't matter, however, he vowed to kill anyone who threatened her life. Anyone, including Ethan. Seeing her eyebrows furrow in her sleep, he kissed her forehead again. I don't know what I'd have done if you'd been killed. I love you, Nikki. I love you too, she murmured, her eyes still closed. Unable to wipe the smile from his face, he started walking towards town. He had to admit, her words seemed to give him a little extra pep. Ethan, she added before falling asleep. Chapter 19 Nathan You kill Emmy and your dad will obviously know that you were responsible, hollered Nathan as Celeste advanced towards him. You think he'll be happy with that? No worries. I'll just make it look like an accident. Come on, he's a cop and a vampire, he's not gullible. Celeste paused. I'll tell him that another vampire did it. 
We're not the only ones in Vegas, you know. Don't try and fool yourself. He's going to know it was you, and I'm pretty sure that's not going to make Daddy very happy. He'll just have to get over it, she growled, leaping towards him and knocking him flat to the ground. Celeste, he cried frantically, holding her face back with his finger. Please stop. Just then her purse, which was lying next to them on the cement, began to vibrate. Shit, she said, sitting up. She grabbed him around the neck and held him down while she reached for her satchel. She pulled out her cell phone and frowned. Now what? I seriously don't have time for this. Don't worry about me, I'll wait, croaked Nathan. Shut up, idiot, she replied, putting her pink phone to her ear after punching in some numbers. Soon her lips tightened. Damn it. Those fools can't handle anything without me or Victor around to babysit. I thought we had this all figured out. You'd better go and help, he said hoarsely as she released her hand from his throat. She stared at him for a second and then nodded. Looks like you've lucked out. I see that I'm going to need you for bargaining purposes, now that those incompetent idiots lost your sister. His eyes lit up. She got away? She smirked. Yeah, but don't get too excited. It won't be for long. Then both of you will be out of my hair. For good. Maximus. He was exhausted and wanted nothing more than to go back to the hotel, finish off his bottle of Jack and crawl into bed. He wasn't foolish enough to believe that Duncan and Nicky were safe on their own, however, so he diligently followed them at a distance which made him fairly inconspicuous. As he trailed the couple, he thought about the strange twist of events. Not only had he misjudged Ethan, but Rena had surprised the hell out of him by following him into the desert. In the future, he'd have to be much more careful in case she decided to trail him again. It would also be in his best interest to find out why she'd followed him in the first place. Had he been careless? It didn't seem plausible, considering how careful he'd been, hiding his true form. He hadn't changed for months and had learned how to suppress most of his lichen urges. So what in the hell was going on? As he mulled over Reyna's sudden interest in him, he passed by a group of boulders, and a shadow from above caught his attention. Looking up, he saw nothing but stars, but it certainly didn't quell his uneasiness. Something isn't right. His senses on high alert, he ran around the large formation of rocks only to find Ethan waiting for him on the other side. Before he could react, the vampire shot forward, slamming his fist into Max's throat. Yelping from the pain, he fell over and tried to catch his breath. Ethan held up a large butcher knife covered in blood. His blood. I told you not to interfere, he smirked, licking the knife. You should have listened. Max opened his mouth to respond but could only gasp and choke. You're not so heroic now, are you? asked Ethan, bending down. Max tried reaching for Ethan, but the darkness was already setting in. Ethan laughed. Your race really does need help. Any last requests before I send you to reunite with the hairy bitch that gave birth to you? An image of Rena entered his thoughts, and he cursed himself for being such a coward. He should have at least tried kissing her. At least once. Chapter 20 Nikki. I woke up in Duncan's arms as he carried me through the desert. He was naked from the waist up and my cheek rested against his cool chest. Duncan? I whispered. He stared down at me, shadows under his silvery blue eyes. He smiled. Hey there. I smiled weakly. You found me. Yep. What happened? His smile fell. Let's talk about it later, okay? Sure, I replied, noticing the haggard look on his face. Both of us had obviously been through our own kind of hell. I looked down at my chest, relieved that I was wearing a t-shirt, although it barely covered my butt. I was grateful he was being such a gentleman. I almost thought you guys had abandoned me. He stopped walking. Nikki, I searched for you all night. I never stopped. I thought about Jordan and what a monster he'd become. I passed out when one of them was on top of me. Did he, um? I looked down, mortified and sickened by the memories. The weird thing was, there would be no physical evidence that I'd been assaulted since we healed so quickly. I wished it were the same way, emotionally. We got there just in time. Actually, Max made it there first. I sighed. Thank God. Yeah, and Max too. 
definitely Max. He kept walking, holding me in his arms as if I were his bride. For some weird reason, it made me giggle. His eyes twinkled. What's so funny? Oh, nothing. My emotions are just all over the place right now, after such an awful experience. I've certainly missed your laugh. It seems like it's been a long time since I've heard it. There hasn't been much to laugh about lately. That's for sure. I licked my dry cracked lips, wishing I had something to drink, even water. Seeing how far we still were from the city, I knew it would be a long time before I'd get a chance to quench anything. The sun is rising, I said, staring up at the sky. Neither of us have any sunglasses. This may really suck. Good point, he said, moving faster. I looked over his shoulder. So, um, where is Ethan? He didn't answer. Duncan? Couldn't tell you, he replied through his teeth. Oh crap. What happened last night? He wouldn't meet my eyes. It's a long story. One I'll go over once we find shelter. Why are we still in the desert? I asked, staring over his shoulder, wondering if we were being followed. Why can't you just fly us somewhere? Wouldn't it be safer and faster? I wish I could, but after the last few hours, I don't have the energy. Oh. Well then put me down. I can walk. He hesitated. You sure? Yes. Positive. He set me on my feet, and I pulled the t-shirt down as far as possible. Thank you for this, by the way. Of course. We started walking side by side. So, I was obviously naked when you found me? I asked, feeling self-conscious. He chuckled. Yeah, but I didn't look. Thanks. It wasn't easy. Not that he hadn't seen me naked. I thought about our moment together in my bedroom, when he'd first changed into a vampire. Although we hadn't gone all the way, it had been hot and very intense. I don't know about you, but I'm different than I was before, I said, raising my toned arms. My arms, stomach, and even my legs look like someone else's. Someone athletic. It's weird but good, I suppose. What about you? He glanced down at his chest, which I'd noticed was much more defined. One thing for certain, he'd had an impressive bod before, so this was just icing on the cake. Yeah, I guess you could say that everything has improved. He smiled sheepishly and winked. Even in places I thought were pretty sufficient before. I guess change isn't always bad. I blushed and looked down at my sandals. I suppose not. He chuckled. So, are you doing okay walking? You don't feel dizzy or nauseous? No, I replied, thinking about my brother who had to keep eating every couple of hours so he wouldn't feel nauseous. It was then that I remembered. Oh my god. I stopped. Nathan. I actually saw him last night. I can't believe it slipped my mind. He was with Celeste. Duncan frowned. What happened to him? Is he okay? I... I don't know. She got him out of there right when Jordan started chasing me. He had no idea what was going on and was really was freaking out. I crossed my arms under my chest. I hope he's okay. He touched my shoulder. Nathan's a fighter. I'm sure he's fine. Last night he looked more like a little kid, frightened beyond belief when all hell had broken loose. I clenched my teeth. If that bitch so much has hurt him in any way, I swear to God I'll kill her. Well, she helped get him out of there, it's got to mean something, he replied, sticking his hands in his pockets. He's probably fine. I started walking again, this time much faster. I don't trust her. She set this up, just like Max said. Then she changed her mind at the last minute. Unfortunately, it did nothing to stop the lichen. They couldn't wait to hunt my ass down. I guess not. What happened to you two in the casino? I asked, feeling my more frustrated by the minute. I know you wanted to talk about this later, but I really need to know what's going on now. He sighed. Ethan thought it would be a good idea to find blood, so we'd both have energy to fight off the lichens. He left to check out the strip club and... Oh, he did. I interrupted, my voice clipped. I couldn't help but feel a stab of jealousy. Not for what you're thinking. Apparently you can purchase blood if you're a vampire from the place. So it had nothing to do with, you know, sex or anything? 
He shrugged. Well, not for me at least. I'm sure he didn't do anything more with her. He wouldn't. Duncan smirked. Yeah, because we both know he has such high morals. I smirked. You just can't stop, can you? What happened next? When I went to meet the donor, she disappeared. Then, when I went back to the casino, both you and Ethan had also disappeared. I raised my eyebrows. What? Where did he go? Ethan apparently followed someone into the bar. A woman. Thought it was someone he knew. Did he say who? Get this. Miranda. I stopped walking and stared at him in shock. You're kidding me. Nope. Wasn't that the name of his dead wife? The one he's been searching for all of these years? Yeah. Obviously, he's still looking for her. Hell, maybe he really did kill those girls last summer. The ones who also looked a lot like his Miranda. No, 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 that was Faye. She killed those girls. How do you know? Duncan, she pretty much confessed to doing it. She was jealous and wanted Ethan all to herself. He smiled coldly. Ethan. Everyone wants him and yet he's not sure who he wants. I bit my lower lip. Ethan loves me. He told me so himself. If he truly loved you, he'd be the one here right now. He would have risked his life to save you. With his knowledge and abilities, it wouldn't have been that difficult. He's been doing this shit a lot longer than us. I'm sure there's a good excuse as to why. Nikki, don't make up any excuses for him, he interrupted. While I scoured the desert looking for you all night, Ethan was nowhere to be found. He just kind of took off and did his own thing. Then when he finally did show up, Max said that Ethan actually allowed Jordan to put his hands on you. I stared at him in horror. What are you talking about? Max found you first. He saw Jordan attacking you and Ethan told him not to interfere. Evidently, he was already there watching what was happening. I don't understand, I said, feeling sick to my stomach. It doesn't make sense. It's what I've been trying to tell you, Nikki. Ethan's on his own agenda. He's not this great guy you think he is. I shook my head vehemently. No, I don't believe it. Max is a lichen. He's trying to pit us against Ethan. I couldn't believe it. Not after everything that had happened. The thought of Ethan deceiving me in that way was too painful to accept. That he'd allow someone to hurt me. No. He'd never do that. Duncan grabbed my hand. I know it's not easy for you to accept the possibility that Ethan isn't the person you thought he was. Hell, he's not even here trying to explain himself. What does that tell you? Maybe the lichens got him? I asked. There were so many of them. I doubt they could catch him. He's faster than all of us, even when he's weak. Face it, there's something going on here. I pulled my hand away from his. You hate him, don't you? Can you blame me? He and his kind took everything from me that I cared about. Everything. Including you. I licked my lips. You still have me. I'll always be your friend, Duncan. Always. You know I want more than that. I didn't answer. Nikki. I groaned. What do you want me to say? We've been through this so many times. Yes, I have feelings for you. I'll admit that. But my attraction to Ethan is so strong, so intense. I can't just walk away from that. But you still have feelings for me? Asked Duncan, a hopeful expression on his face. I was so frustrated, I wanted to stomp my foot. Hello? Are you even listening to me? Duncan, it doesn't matter how I feel about you because we can never be together. It just wouldn't be fair. You deserve much more than that anyway. He sighed. It stopped being fair after he charmed you back in Montana. Charmed? Well, even if he did, I'm not charmed now, and I still want to be with him. Are you sure about that? He asked. What do you mean? Are you sure that what you feel is real and not some kind of magic? How do you know that everything you feel for him isn't the product of vampire persuasion? I looked away. Nikki. I couldn't answer him because the truth was, I didn't. Chapter 21 Nikki
We still got back to town in record time, although the sun was up and a little too bright for comfort. You okay? I asked Duncan, who looked slightly disoriented. I've been better. We have to go back to the Marlamore. Max said he'd give us a place to stay. You really trust him? I have to. I mean, he helped us fight off his own kind earlier. Why would he do that if he wasn't on our side? I don't know. I guess I'd like to talk to him anyway. Ask him about Ethan. He smiled grimly. I'm sure he'll have a lot to say. Before walking into town, Duncan had me hide behind the dumpster of a small shopping center, and then went in search of clothing. A half hour later, he showed up wearing a new red polo shirt. Here, he said, handing me a pair of light blue jeans and a pink sweatshirt. I forgot to ask you your size. Sorry. I'm sure these will be fine, I said, noticing he'd forgotten to get undergarments for me. Do they fit? he asked as I zipped up the jeans. Ah yeah, you did well, I replied, although they were a little too large and the sweatshirt was baggy. It was better than what I'd started out with, however. No way in hell was I going to complain. Sorry, he said as I walked around the dumpster. You're kind of drowning in those clothes. Don't worry about it, Duncan, I replied, kissing him on the cheek. This works. Let's go. When we got to the hotel, we took the elevator up to Maximus's suite, but he didn't answer. He must not have made it back yet, said Duncan, turning away from the doorway. Hmm. I hope he's okay. I bit the side of my nail. What should we do now? He ran a hand through his hair. I'm exhausted and need blood. I can't wait any longer or I'll go crazy. He sighed. I think I'm going to have to find someone who'll give me a fix, and for once, I'm going to take Ethan's advice. Really? I think we should go back to that strip joint and pay for the blood. He said that the girls there are always willing to do what you want for a price. Including giving up blood. He told me that many vampires have been in and out of that place. Thinks it's owned by one, but never actually met the guy. As disgusted as I am about going into one of those places, I guess I'd rather pay for blood than take it by force. Speaking of which, do you have money? I have my credit card. I'll take out a cash advance on it. Fine. Well, if we must, we must. Let's get it over with, I replied, kind of curious as to what kind of place this was that catered to vampires. When we got to the club, we were allowed in right away, which I thought was kind of weird since I didn't have an ID on me. They were more concerned with Duncan's and waved us in after he pulled it out of his wallet. We walked through a dark hallway and immediately I smelled blood among other bodily fluids. I grimaced. Wow, grunted Duncan as we stepped onto the main floor. Lovely, I murmured sarcastically. The club was packed, with mostly men, but there were a few women as well. I had to admit that the place itself was kind of dazzling, with the cool strobe lights, purple and black leather furniture, glass tables, and a long bar made of ice. It was the garish stuff happening inside, however, that made me pause. Naked women dancing lewdly on the stage while others were visiting tables, flirting and flashing their goods. I shivered. Follow me, said Duncan, grabbing my hand. I was silent as he pulled me towards the back of the place. When we reached a large purple door marked private, he knocked. Seconds later, a large, muscular man with bushy black eyebrows, long dark hair and a gold tooth opened the door. Yeah, what do you want? We're here to see Sam, said Duncan. The man's eyes swept over both of us. Oh yeah? How did you hear about Sam? Duncan opened his mouth, showing a trace of his fangs. Does it matter? He smirked. Guess not. How much? Two hundred. Okay. You take credit cards? Cash machine is over there, pointed the man. Duncan nodded. Step into the back lounge when you have the cash. I'll send someone your way. Thanks, replied Duncan. The man nodded towards me. Looks like your girl could use a little herself, she ain't looking too hot. You'll need to pay separately and we'll provide her with a different resource. That's fine, replied Duncan. The man turned around and closed the door. Let's go, said Duncan, pulling me towards the cash machine. You have enough? I grabbed my dad's credit cards too, just in case. Oh, thank God. You were obviously more prepared for all of this than I was. 
Believe me, I wasn't prepared for anything. I looked around the club as he inserted his credit card into the machine. Have you ever been in a strip joint? I asked, trying to avoid everyone's eyes. I wasn't sure, but it felt like we were getting too much attention. Just once? When I turned 18 my dad took me to one. How'd that work for you? I asked dryly. Well, I'm not going to lie. I walked out of there with a smile on my face while my dad walked out with a much lighter wallet. You know, I don't think Nathan's ever been to one of these places. I find that hard to believe. He's crazy about women. I know, but I just don't think he ever had the chance. I felt my eyes well up with tears. Hopefully he's alive and we'll get to do it someday. I sniffled. Wow, I can't believe I just said that. Your brother will be fine. We'll start searching again as soon as we get what we need here. And find Ethan. He ignored my comment and put the cash in his wallet. Ready? I nodded. He grabbed my hand and we walked into the back room together. I guess we know what happens back here. I mumbled, staring at all of the purple leather couches that were separated by room dividers. Fortunately, none of them were currently occupied by strippers and their customers. What do we do now? I asked. He smiled wickedly. You can dance for me if you'd like. Very funny, I said, punching him in the shoulder. Just then a scantily dressed woman walked into the lounge. With her long blonde hair, pouty red lips and large chest, I felt mousy compared to her. She held out her hand to Duncan. Hi, sugar. I'm Mercedes, and I heard you need a little something to get you going. You could say that, he replied, smiling sheepishly. I think I can help with that, she said, grabbing his hand. She looked at me. I'm his, honey. Your donor will be back here in a minute. Meanwhile, handsome, you come back here and let Mercedes take good care of you. I've got my own little couch, and right now, it has your name written all over it. I clenched my jaw. I didn't like her pungent perfume, nor did I like the way she was staring at Duncan. I'd like to have Nikki with us, replied Duncan, noticing that I wasn't very pleased. She shrugged. If you want. I'll be fine, I said, deciding that it would be better if I didn't. Although I knew it wasn't right, I was jealous. Jealous of the short intimacy they were about to share together. It was bad enough knowing about it, I certainly didn't want to watch. Are you sure, he asked, glancing towards the door. Yes. I'll be fine. Now go. Get it over with. His teeth grazed the bottom of his lip. Well, okay. Don't leave the lounge and if something happens, yell. Yes. Of course. Let's go, honey, I haven't got all day. I'm going to need to rest for a while after you get your fill, and my next dance is in an hour. If you want, you can stick around and watch, she said, dragging him to a place in the back. Sighing, I turned away and looked towards the door, wondering who was going to be my donor. My Sam. And what was with the weird code name? Yawning, I closed my eyes for a minute and tried figuring out what Sam actually stood for. When I lost interest, I opened my eyes and received the shock of my life. Ethan. Oh my god. I squealed, running towards him. I threw myself into his arms. How did you find us? I've missed you so much. Shush, he murmured into my hair, holding me tightly against him. I'm here now. Where have you been? I asked, looking up into his icy blue eyes. He smiled. I found your mom and brother. I knew you were safe with Duncan, and so I went searching for them and found them. We have to leave now, though. Their lives are in danger and if we don't leave now, it might be too late. Ah, uh, okay. Duncan is almost finished feeding and I'm supposed to feed too. There's no time to spare Nikki, he said, wrapping his arms around me tighter. We have to leave now. The next thing I knew, he'd whisked me out of the club and we were in the sky flying. Where are we going? I asked slightly dizzy. You'll see. We left the city and started towards the desert. Why are we going back to the desert? I asked. Because that's where Celeste has your family, he replied. Nathan and your mom. Oh. Seconds later, we were landing at the house where I'd been held prisoner the night before. Wait, I said as we landed right in the open, next to the driveway. I shielded my eyes from the bright sun, wishing I had sunglasses. 
Shouldn't we be sneaking up on them? No need. The front door of the house opened up, and I stared in horror as Jordan walked out, a triumphant smile on his face. You found her, he said. Good work. I turned to Ethan, who was avoiding my eyes. Ethan? What's going on? It's not rocket science, Jordan, said Ethan, ignoring me. Well, maybe for you. You're a funny guy, replied Jordan. I think what you're forgetting is that it took you more time than it should have to get her out to Vegas in the first place. What is going on here? I hollered, stepping backwards. What do you mean, get me to Vegas? Jordan smirked. She still doesn't know what's going on? No, she does not. I snapped. So please elaborate. Ethan walked over to me and grabbed both of my hands. Sweet Nikki. I'm going to miss you, he said with a half smile. It's been an interesting journey. What are you talking about? I cried, my eyes filling with tears. What's happening? He bit his lip and dropped my hands. I have to go, he said, turning to Jordan. You explain what's happening. If I have to deal with another emotional outbreak from her, I'm going to slit my own throat. I stared at him in shock. How could he be so heartless and cruel? Ethan. I cried. Are you serious? So now she gets to meet the real you, laughed Jordan. I love it when you turn off the charm and show what a real devious a hole you are. At least I have charm, Jordan. You're just all a hole. He smirked. Touché. As I was saying, I'm leaving, and as you can see, I've brought you your package. Just make sure I get what was promised to me in return. His eyes swept greedily over my body, making my skin crawl. Once the deed is done, you'll get your reward. Ethan's face darkened. I don't think so. You told me to bring you the girl, and I did. Now, I shouldn't have to wait for anything more. Have Victor contact me as soon as he arrives. Oh, he's already here, replied Jordan, looking past us. I turned around and saw a black Cadillac Seville coming towards us. Great timing, by the way, said Jordan. I guess so. Still wondering what kind of games these two were playing, I turned towards Jordan, who was now sitting on the porch steps. What do you mean by deed? Killing me? Is that what this is all about? Why am I so special that killing me earns him something? Jordan smirked. You'll find out soon enough now that Victor's here. In fact, I'll let him explain everything. The engine shut off on the car, and I turned my head towards the vehicle. When the man got out, all of the blood rushed to my head. Although his hair had grown longer and it was now completely white, I felt like I was staring at a ghost. Oh my god, it gasped, staring at the newcomer in shock. Daddy? Victor's lips curled up in amusement. Surprise. Chapter 22 Nikki. He stepped closer and kissed my forehead. This is... I don't understand what's happening, I squeaked. And why are they calling you Victor when your name is Galen? Let's go inside and talk, he said, placing a hand on my back. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, and I promise to answer each and every one of them. I cleared my throat. I yes, obviously, I replied, not sure of how I felt. Part of me was happy he hadn't been murdered, the other part was frightened beyond belief. I knew my dad was dangerous, but I had no idea he was mixed up with these guys. He turned to Ethan. I will call you later. Don't worry, you'll get everything that was promised to you. Ethan sighed. Fine. You have my number, obviously. He nodded. Yes, and I may have one more job for you, if you're up for it. Pay me for the first one and then we'll talk. I'll call you. Sure, replied Ethan. His eyes met mine and he smiled. I have to admit, this was enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Sounds like it was too enjoyable, said my dad, his voice tight. Well, regardless, it had to be done. Ethan chuckled. Yes, and it was amazing how everything fell into place. I almost feel guilty for making you pay, Victor. Then don't charge me. He chuckled. I said almost. Obviously, I have to make an honest living. Jordan burst out laughing. Honest living, that's a good one. Ethan shrugged. I'm out of here, he said. I have a lunch date. A lunch date, said Victor with a smirk. With who? Miranda? 
His face grew serious. Yes, I believe this girl is really the one. You thought I was Miranda too, I said, now completely and utterly heartbroken. I felt so used and deceived by Ethan, it made me sick to my stomach. He'd lied to me. He'd played me for a fool. Obviously, I was one. Victor's eyebrows shot up. He did. Yes. Ethan scowled. She does bear a slight resemblance, but obviously I knew it wasn't her. I hope so, said Victor, rubbing his chin. I don't want you for this next job if you're going to be cracking up. I hate to burst your bubble, but I'm more sane than you are, Victor, he laughed. I saw the veins stuck out in my dad's forehead and knew he was trying to control his temper. Very amusing. Keep your phone handy. I'll be calling you very soon. Ethan nodded and then in the blink of an eye, launched himself into the sky without a second glance. I'd never felt so foolish in my life. Ethan didn't care about me. Never had. It had all been an act. His words. His lovemaking. It had all been one big lie. You okay? asked Jordan. Glaring at him, I swallowed back my sobs. Although I wanted nothing more than to grieve for what I thought I'd had with Ethan, there was no way I'd cry in front of Jordan. I hated him more than Celeste. More than Faye. My father turned to me. Well, come on now into the house with me, young lady, and I'll discuss what's needed of you. What's needed of me? I asked, following him, even though I didn't really want to go inside of the house. Yes. Jordan, he said as we approached him on the porch. You have something for me to drink? I'm parched. Yeah, no problem, Dad. I stopped. Dad? He put a hand on Jordan's shoulder. Actually, he's my brother's kid, but his father, Jonah, died many years ago, when he was just an infant. I've pretty much raised him, though. So that lunatic is my cousin? I asked in horror. Oh, I know you two have gotten off to a bad start, he chuckled. And that was partly my fault. There was a little miscommunication as to who he was holding last night. I actually thought he had Celeste, not you. What? It didn't make sense to me either. He opened the screen door. Come inside and I'll explain everything. Feeling like I had no other choice, I reluctantly followed them into the house, to the kitchen. Jordan then reached into the refrigerator and grabbed a beer. Thanks, said my father, popping the cap. He tilted his head back and drank it down quickly as I watched. When he was finished, he wiped his mouth. You want anything? asked Jordan, undressing me with his eyes. Nothing from you, I snapped. My father laughed. You do have a grudge against him, don't you? I pointed at him. First of all, he tried raping me. He beat me, he kidnapped me. He's a monster. Victor nodded. Well, I've been told that he doesn't have very good control over his natural urges. I'm sorry that you had to see that side of him. Natural urges. I snapped. Rape and beating someone shouldn't be a natural urge. He raised his hand. Calm down. Look, you don't understand the way of the lichen, I get that. I'm not even going to discipline you because of it. I raised my eyebrows. I guess I should be grateful. My father's face darkened. I won't hold your temper against you now because you're learning. But in the future, you'd better watch yourself. I don't understand. How could you be a lichen? And if you are, why aren't me and Nathan? He leaned over and wrapped his knuckles on the counter. Because I'm not your real father. What? He smiled grimly. Your mother was pregnant when I met her. I fell for her hard though and didn't hold it against her. The man who knocked her up well he took off. Left her pregnant and broke. But I thought you two went to high school together and that you were her first and only boyfriend? No, that was something she made up. It was actually your father who dated her all through high school. After she got pregnant and never saw him again. So you're not my real dad? Part of me was sad, another part relieved beyond comprehension. He touched my shoulder. No, but I've always loved you. I loved both you and Nathan since I first set eyes on you. There was something in his eyes that didn't hold true to what he was saying. There was coldness there that actually made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. So, how did you know we were in Shore Lake? 
I set that up myself, he replied with a smug smile. Through Ernie. I've known him a lot longer than your mother has. I even put him up to giving her a job. What? Yeah. One of my brethren owns the firm she worked for, and it was easy getting her transferred out there. What about the cabin we stayed in? Who owns that? It's mine. Why do you think your mom is renting it so cheap? I gasped. That's your cabin? How come we never knew anything about it? Because your mother wouldn't have understood, and would have started asking too many questions. I rubbed the bridge of my nose. This is crazy. Does she know you're a lichen? You are a lichen, right? Yes I am and no, she doesn't. He's an alpha, replied Jordan. Victor is going to take over the other clans soon. They'll all answer to him. The entire world will be answering to me one day, said Victor, smiling arrogantly, someday soon. I started to pace. This is crazy. What you're basically saying is that you wanted us to move to Shore Lake? You planned it all along? Only after your mother and I had a falling out. You mean after you beat the hell out of her, I replied, glaring at him. He shrugged. She disobeyed me and I had to teach her a lesson. I wanted to scream at him, to tell him that he was nothing more than an animal and didn't deserve my mother, but now I was terrified of him more than ever. How does Ethan, Celeste, and Caleb fit into all of this? His face darkened. Caleb is a traitor. He was supposed to keep an eye on Anne, but instead, he fell for her and screwed everything up. So he knows about you? Yes. I've known that bastard for years. He's on my peril. Now he's on my hit list. I swallowed. And Celeste? She's had her uses, but not anymore. I'm going to show Caleb what happens to those who betray me. She's not working with you? He smirked. She's been strung around. She thinks she's in control, but I'm using her to bring down my wrath on those who've deceived me. Including my mother? His eyes burned into mine. I don't hold anything against her. Well, not anymore. She doesn't really know what's going on. Hell, I almost feel sorry for her. So, you're not going to kill her? No. Of course not. I let out sigh of relief. Any more questions? Obviously, I have so many questions, I don't even know what to ask next. We're kind of on some time constraints, so try to hurry. What about Ethan? I blurted. He sighed. After Caleb screwed up, I used Ethan to keep an eye on things. To track what was happening while I was taking care of business in other states. Did he tell you about me becoming a vampire? Yes. In fact, after he told me, I had an epiphany. One that brings us to where we are today. I don't understand. I want to create a new race of lichen. A breed that will be so powerful, nothing will stand in our way. What? He walked over to Jordan and put an arm around his shoulder. Well, I was originally going to have my nephew here father your child. I stared at him in horror. What? He smiled. Genius, isn't it? A lichen and a vampire, creating a new species of soldiers. I, you're kidding, right? Not at all. Why can't you choose a different vampire? I said. Why me? Most of the female vampires we've encountered, including Celeste, have eggs that are dried up and no good. But you, you have just recently been turned, and I believe there is a chance that if you breed with a lichen soon, there will be great success. What? Breed. He was referring to us like we were animals. Technically, only one of us was. Your eggs should be infused with vampire DNA now. If we mate you with a lichen right away, I believe that not only will this child be powerful, but the answer to our future. Not only will it be stronger and faster, but I will raise it as my own. You're kidding? He ignored me. Now, as I was saying, I was going to breed you with Jordan here, but I've since changed my mind. He isn't stable and obviously way too unpredictable. I can only imagine what his offspring would be like. What do you mean? Wine Jordan. You promised her to me. Don't interrupt me, warned Victor. I know what I'm doing. No, growled Jordan, stepping closer to him. 
You promised her to me, uncle, and as far as I'm concerned, the deal is still on. Jordan, said Victor, his voice eerily polite. I think you're forgetting who you're speaking to. I don't care, he snapped. He stormed over to me and grabbed my wrist. It's time to fulfill my end of the agreement. The one that was promised. Sighing, Victor reached behind his back and pulled out a gun. Such a waste, he muttered, aiming it at Jordan. Step away from him. He looked at me. Jordan stared at Victor in shock. What? Nikki, he ordered, cocking the gun. Now. Terrified, I pulled my arm away from Jordan, wondering what was going to happen next and if I'd ever get out of this nightmare. Jordan leapt towards the doorway, changing into his lichen form. Before he reached it, Victor pulled the trigger. I screamed in shock as brain matter exploded all over the kitchen floor, painting it red. See what happens when you disobey me, Nikki, said Victor, his voice calm as he put the gun away. I'm sure silver bullets are useless on vampires, but they'd hurt like a son of a bitch. That was really your nephew? I whispered in horror, although I had to admit, the smell of blood was distracting. Your own family? He smirked. Exactly. Now that you know what I'm capable of, you won't hesitate to follow my orders. Am I right? I licked my lips, desperate to get out of there. If lying would keep me alive, then so be it. Yes, I replied. He nodded. Good. Now it would be a pity to waste all of this blood, so go ahead. Before it gets cold. Deciding that I would need my strength to get away from Victor, and unable to ignore my own burning hunger, I kneeled next to the body and drank. How is it? asked Victor after watching me for several minutes. I raised my head. Different. Thicker. He nodded. Is it unpleasant? No, I replied. Good. You don't feel sick or anything? Should I? The truth is, I'm not sure. I've never volunteered my blood to a vampire, nor has any of my clan. I've heard stories from others. What stories? That the blood doesn't always agree with vampires. I wanted to test this theory out on you, however. Especially since you'll soon be carrying my child. I stared at him in disgust. What? Since my nephew is gone, we're going to need you to carry my seed. I felt like I was going to be sick. No. You're joking. Not at all. He waved his hand. We'll have it performed artificially by someone I know. In a lab. A lab. Thank God. Go ahead, take what you need from Jordan and then we'll go. I would like to start the process as soon as possible. What if I don't care for this idea? I asked, curious as to what he'd do. Then you'll be responsible, he replied with a smirk. Responsible for what? Nathan and your mother, their deaths. I was going to let them live, but not if you're going to be difficult. Before I could answer, the kitchen door burst open and Nathan himself was thrown against the floor. Nathan. I squealed, rushing to his side. Nick, thank God you're still alive, he said, getting up. Just as he was about to throw his arms around me, he froze. What in the hell is that on your chin? I stared at him in shame and wiped my mouth with the back of my hand. Nathan, I... Just like I told you, Nathan, said Celeste, standing in the doorway. Your sister is now a vampire. Tears filled his eyes. I'm so sorry I didn't believe you, Nikki. You must be so pissed off at me. I shook my head vehemently. No, of course not. He raised my chin with his finger. Well, except for the red stain, you don't look like a vampire. That's because she just fed, said Victor. Nathan's head whipped around. Dad? Victor smiled widely and opened up his arms. I missed you, Nathan. Come and give your old man a hug. Before Nathan could oblige, my hand snaked out and grabbed his arm. Nathan, wait a minute. Why? I looked at Victor. He's not really our father. Not biologically. Plus. He's a lichen. Nathan's eyes grew really big. He turned to Victor. Is this true? His shoulders slumped. She's right. I'm not your father by blood, Nathan, but I love you all the same. As far as being a lichen, yes. It's true. In shock, Nathan turned back to me. Nikki, you'd better explain what's going on here. 
I want to hear it all from you. Me? I asked surprised. Yes. As far as I'm concerned, you're the only one I can trust. I've been ignoring all of your warnings, and it's gotten both of us into a shitload of trouble. So tell me what in the hell is going on around here. I take it you already know what's going on with Celeste. Yes, replied Celeste, walking over to Victor. She linked her arm through his and smiled triumphantly. He knows he's going to die, that is. Is that so? I asked, putting my hands on my hips. Tell them, Victor. Better yet, let's just get this over with, she replied. Victor, asked Nathan. That's his real name, I said. Obviously he lied about that too. It had to be done, said Victor. No matter what you may think, I really did care about your mother and didn't want any of you dragged into this mess. Now we can all start fresh. All four of us. Celeste stepped away from him. What are you talking about, she snapped. I thought you promised to take these two out. They're not lichens, they're not even your kids. Victor sighed. What can I say, Celeste? I lied. Her eyes blazed with fury. This is not what we agreed upon. If you think that I'm going to let you get away with this, you've got another thing coming. Actually, Celeste, I didn't lie about everything, he said. I did promise that you'd never have to deal with Nikki again, and I won't go back on that. Before she could respond, he leapt towards her, changing into a massive lichen in midair, larger than any of the others. Oh my god! gasped Nathan as Victor landed on Celeste, his giant muzzle wrapping around her face. I watched in horror as his jaws drove into her cheeks, tearing flesh and bone while Celeste fought to get away. Help me, she screamed. Come on, I said, grabbing Nathan's arm. Victor's head whipped around. You stay, he growled. Celeste, whose pretty face was now horribly mangled almost beyond recognition, opened her mouth and latched onto Victor's neck with her fangs. Bitch, he hollered, grabbing a handful of her red curls. He tried pulling her back and away from his neck, but she stabbed him in the eye with two of her fingernails. What should we do? Whispered Nathan, his face filled with horror. Get her off of me. Raged Victor, now trying to kick her off of him. I watched as Celeste clung to him, digging her nails into his fur while sucking his blood. Let's go, I mouthed to Nathan. He nodded and we ran out of the kitchen to the backyard. I'm going to fly you, I said quickly. Okay. Nikki. I whipped my head around to find Duncan racing around the house. Duncan, I cried as he pulled me into his arms. God, I thought I was too late, he said, clutching me tightly. Nathan patted him on the back. You almost were. We have to get out of here. Did you drive? Duncan released me. No time for driving. We're taking the sky. He looked at me. You're warm. I take it you can fly now? I nodded. He reached for Nathan, who seemed to think he was getting a hug. I bit back a smile. Nathan patted Duncan on the back. Okay, yeah. Good to see you too, bro. Let's go, said Duncan, launching into the air with Nathan. Taking a deep breath, I followed him into the glaring sunlight, trying to shield my eyes as much as possible. I trailed them back towards the city, landing on the terrace at the Marlamore. That was a close one, said Nathan, sliding down to his feet. Closing his eyes, he ran a hand over his face. You guys, I don't think I've ever been so scared shitless in my entire life. I turned to Duncan. How did you find us? After you disappeared out of the club, I figured the lichen had snagged you again, said Duncan. So I searched the desert. It was much easier this time. It was Ethan. They both stared at me in shock. I crossed my arms under my chest. He deceived me. You were right, I said, looking down so they wouldn't see my eyes well up. Both of you. Don't be so hard on yourself, replied Duncan, stepping closer. I swept a hand under my lashes, brushing away tears. Why? If I would have listened to you a long time ago, things would have been different. Duncan touched my arm. Nikki, it's not your fault. He not only lied, but charmed you. You didn't have a chance. I know you're probably right, but I still feel like such an idiot. You have to let it go. If he knew how upset you were, it would probably go to his head. It's time to move on. I only hoped that I could, but the dark truth was that I still yearned to be with Ethan. 
As much as he'd hurt me, I knew that if given the chance, I would take him back in a heartbeat if he had a good enough excuse. The realization disgusted me. What about our dad? said Nathan as he stood up and brushed the sand from his blue jeans. I still can't believe that shit. And mom never knew that he was a lichen? How is that even possible? Well, we definitely need to talk to her. Where is she, Nathan? I asked. At the Drake Hotel. Do you think Caleb is in on this? asked Duncan. I mean, Celeste is his daughter. Victor said that Caleb fell in love with mom when he was supposed to be watching her, I said, and then proceeded to tell them everything Victor had told me. So Ernie was in on it, said Nathan scowling. That nice old man was an accomplice to all of this? I sighed. I guess so. You know, everything makes sense now, said Nathan. He was always away when we were growing up, and then when he was around, they were at each other's throats. They were always fighting, and she was scared of him. With good reason, whether she knew the truth or not. Look how he went after Celeste, I said. Nathan nodded. Yeah, good point. Speaking of Celeste, I wonder if she got away. I hope not, I said. She's completely insane. I know one thing, Celeste hates mom as much as she hates us. She wants her gone, said Nathan. And as much as Caleb loves mom, he would choose Celeste over everyone if it came down to it. On that note, let's go find your mom and get her out of Vegas, said Duncan. Before he has to choose. Chapter 23 Nikki When we arrived at mom and Caleb's hotel suite, they weren't there. Here's a note, said Nathan, picking up a piece of hotel letterhead paper. I snatched it out of his hands and sighed in relief. It says they're meeting Maximus Johnson at the Marlamore. Apparently, he has information about me. Isn't that the place we just were? asked Nathan. Yes, replied Duncan. This is very good news. Max won't let anything happen to your mom. Nathan turned to him. You know this guy? Yes. Met him yesterday, said Duncan. He's a lichen, but on our side. Are you sure? said Nathan. Because I'm getting tired of thinking everyone is on our side, but finding just the opposite. I trust him enough, said Duncan. Obviously we have to be wary of everyone, but this guy helped me earlier. I think your mom is pretty safe. Feeling as if things were finally going our way, I smiled. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go find them. We walked back to the Marlamore, and when we reached the elevator, Nathan started pumping us with questions. So, what's it like being a vampire? It's not something I recommend, I said. In fact, I hate it. But you're fast and can fly, he said. That's got to be so exhilarating. We also have to drink blood to live, said Duncan as the doors opened up. That's right, I said. No more pizza, steaks, burgers, or ice cream. I don't know, I still think it would be cool to fly whenever I wanted. I rolled my eyes. Seriously, Nathan, it's not worth it. I'd give up anything to be normal again. If you were normal, you'd probably be dead by now, he said, leaning against the back wall. Did you ever think of that? I shrugged. Maybe, but then again, maybe we wouldn't be here in the first place. I wish we would have stayed in California, said Nathan. We're so close. Maybe we should grab mom and just drive. Go to a place where nobody could find us. That's what we're planning, said Duncan. I'm thinking we should go to Minnesota, though. My mom lives out there and she can help us sort things out. That might not be such a bad idea, I replied. Shore Lake is too obvious of a place. They'd find us for sure. Minnesota isn't a good idea, said Nathan. You don't want to risk your mom's life. Yeah, you're probably right. Duncan's eyes lit up. The Keys. We'll go to Key West. There's a yacht out there that my dad recently purchased. He was going to bring it back here, fix it up, and sell it. It's sitting in a slip in Key West. I guess it runs, just needs some cosmetic work. But the sun, I replied. How are we going to deal with being in the sun so much? It's a 54-foot voyager, he said. We can lay low during the day. Sweet, said Nathan, getting excited. I can captain the boat during the day while you guys lay low in your caskets down below. Mom can keep me company. That's an awesome plan, Duncan. Seriously, Nathan? We don't sleep in caskets, I said dryly. 
Well, whatever. It's the best idea I've heard yet, though. Yeah. First of all, though, we have to get your mom away from Caleb, said Duncan as the elevator doors opened up. Whether Celeste is alive or not, I think your mom's life will always be in danger if we don't keep them apart. We stepped out of the elevator and walked to Max's suite. As I was about to knock on the door, it opened up from the inside. Ethan, I gasped, feeling as if someone had knocked the wind out of me. Come on, kids, he replied with a dark smile. We've been holding the party for you. Chapter 24 Nikki I stepped past him and went inside to find two men aiming rifles at my mother and Caleb. From their scent, I could tell right away that they were both lichens. Nikki, sobbed Mom who was sitting with Caleb on a sofa near the balcony. She stood up and held out her arms. Mom, I choked, noticing how frail and sickly she looked. I rushed over and threw my arms around her. I've missed you so much, honey. I missed you too, I whispered, closing my eyes. Are you doing okay? Yes, she whispered back. Don't worry about me. What's going on? asked Nathan, glaring at Ethan. Why in the hell are you here? A door opened up in the back of the suite and Victor walked in, drying his hands with a towel. He's here because I asked him to be. You're alive? I gasped. Yes, don't look so overjoyed. Where's Celeste? I asked. Around, he replied with a smirk. And by that I mean her remains are probably lying all around the Mojave Desert. Fortunately, my brethren showed up before she could do too much damage. I let them have her. You son of a bitch, growled Caleb, springing from the sofa. I'm going to kill you. Before Caleb could get close to Victor, Ethan had grabbed my mother. I would rethink that if I were you, unless you'd like to see Anne's neck broken. I stared at him in shock. Ethan, leave her go. Caleb's face fell. He raised his hands. Fine. Please just don't hurt her. Ethan, why don't you take Anne into the back bedroom, said Victor. Why are you doing this, Galen, she asked. This is madness. His real name is Victor, Mom, said Nathan, glaring at him. Isn't that right, Dad? Save it, son. She already knows, he replied. We've had some time to go over things while we waited for you. I turned to her. Do you know about me? My mom's eyes filled with tears. Yes, Nikki, yes I know and... I'm so sorry I didn't believe you in the first place. And I'm sorry that I didn't tell you that Galen, I mean Victor, wasn't your biological father. I love both of you kids so much. I hope you know that. I forced a smile. It's okay, Mom. I love you too. Me too. Don't worry, we'll get you out of this, replied Nathan, glaring at Ethan. Pretty sure of yourself, smirked Ethan. Please don't hurt her, I said. She's never done anything to you. You behave and I won't have to, he replied, ushering her out of the room. Where's Maximus? asked Duncan. Oh, he met with some misfortune back in the desert, replied Victor. In other words, you killed him? Snapped Duncan. Actually, Ethan killed him. I covered my mouth. Oh my god. I told you that Ethan wasn't who you thought he was, said Caleb. Now you know the truth. I guess I do, I replied, still unable to believe that Ethan was such a monster. Maximus had to go, said Victor. He was a thorn in my side and I couldn't trust him. You killed his father, said Duncan. I wonder why. His father turned against me, said Victor. He looked at Caleb. That's what happens when someone disobeys my orders and goes behind my back. I'm not even sure why you're still alive. Screw you, snapped Caleb. You never deserved Anne. She was just a cover-up for you all of these years, and you treated her like shit. He smirked. She's lucky I put a roof over her head and took care of Nikki and Nathan. You couldn't afford to get rid of them. It had nothing to do with your being a swell guy, said Caleb. He turned to me. The feds were watching him very closely for a number of years. He needed your mom and the normality of a suburban household. Victor rolled his eyes. You're really starting to annoy me, Caleb. You don't exactly have a squeaky clean record yourself. Caleb glared at him. Maybe but I'm not half the monster you are. The things you've done are inexcusable. You know you've overstayed your welcome here in Vegas, Caleb, replied Victor. 
He waved his hand. Maverick. Before anyone could react, one of the lichens pointed his gun towards Caleb's head and pulled the trigger. Oh my god. I screamed, watching in horror as his head exploded, blood spraying everywhere. Just like Jordan. I looked at Victor, and in his eyes I saw amusement and madness. Complete madness. Horrified, Nathan turned his head and threw up on the carpeting. Really Nathan, said Victor shaking his head. That's disgusting. Please, I begged, more terrified for my mother's life than ever. Let us go. We don't want anything from you. Just our mother. He reached into his jacket and pulled out a cigar and a cutter. Have you forgotten our conversation already? You know what I need from you. What's he talking about? asked Duncan. I sighed. Fine. If you let everyone go, I'll do whatever you want. Wait a second, said Duncan, moving towards me. What exactly does he want from you? Ten months is what I want, said Victor, lighting the end of his cigar. What in the hell does that mean? asked Nathan, still looking slightly green. I want her to produce a child. If she does what I ask, I'll let her go once she hands it over. Nathan stared at him in horror. What are you, some kind of Rumpelstiltskin? Victor blew out a cloud of smoke. Funny, he said dryly. Victor wants to create a child that has both vampire and lichen DNA. Why? asked Duncan. To create a new breed of immortals, said Victor. A powerful race of lichen that will answer only to me. A race that will serve you, said Duncan. Isn't that what you're really after? Victor smiled darkly. Of course. That would take a long time, said Nathan. Why bother? Victor raised his index finger. Well, not as long as you may think. I happen to know a scientist who has already begun experimenting with DNA cloning of wolves. Not only has he had promising test results, but has found a way to speed up their rate of growth. In a matter of days, one of his test subjects grew to the size of an adult. In just days. His eyes glowed brightly. Can you imagine the possibilities? Even so, we're talking animals, not people, and certainly not immortals, right? replied Nathan. That's got to be an entirely different ball game. He smirked, actually, not as different as you may think. Dr. Shepard has secretly begun testing his theories on humans, without the knowledge of his staff, obviously. In fact, I, along with some others, have built him a lab and have provided everything he needs for cloning. I stared at him in shock. Obviously, this guy had hidden so much from us throughout the years. Here we go, mumbled Nathan. Mad scientist. Mad. He's a genius. Shepard believes that within the next year, if I can find him a suitable child, he'll be able to use its DNA produce an army for me. And you really believe that? asked Duncan. It sounds like science fiction to me. I hope you're not spending your life savings on that quack. It does sound pretty crazy, I said. Although so do vampires, lichens, and shapeshifters. Not too long ago, computers sounded crazy too. Nothing is impossible. So you plan on producing this army and then what? I asked. Kill everyone that is against you and take over the world. Victor blew out another cloud of smoke. He smiled. Something like that. I bit the side of my lip. Obviously, standing around arguing about all of this wasn't doing much to get mom away from the psycho. Okay fine, but if I agree to this, you have to let everyone go. I said, deciding to promise him whatever he wanted and worry about escaping when the others were safe. Duncan shook his head. No. Nikki, we are not leaving you with him. I grabbed his hand. Duncan, I'll be fine, okay? Victor has never hurt me in the past and won't now. Isn't that right? She's right, said Victor. Nikki has always been like a daughter to me. The fact that she is willing to help my cause actually makes my heart swell. I'd never harm her. Nathan rolled his eyes. Duncan ignored Victor. He's talking about making you his bitch, quite literally. You can't possibly agree to this. Everything will be done in a lab, explained Victor. I would never allow anyone to hurt Nikki, nor would I touch her in that way. You expect us to trust you after what you did to that guy earlier today? Your own nephew, said Nathan. That was totally different. He was out of control, said Victor. Volatile. 
I couldn't take any more chances with Jordan. Like I said, I'll do this as long as you let everyone go. That's my condition, I said, turning back to Victor. He sighed. Your friends can go, but not your mother, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, but it's not going to work then, I said. The only way I'll agree is for you to let her go. Victor's eyes narrowed. I don't really think you're in a position to be bargaining. You're lucky I don't just kill everyone and take what I need from you anyway. It would be easy. Let her go, I pleaded. She's sick and needs medical help. Haven't you noticed how pale and gaunt she is? Victor snorted. Yes, and I also noticed the bites on her neck. Caleb had obviously been trying to make her a vampire. I put my hands on my hips. That's because she has cancer, and he wanted to keep her alive as long as possible. It doesn't matter, Victor paused and then turned towards the bedroom door. She needs medical help, I repeated. A loud crash from the bedroom startled everyone. Victor rushed towards the door and threw it open. Damn it. I raced to the bedroom, followed by Duncan and Nathan. No. I screamed in horror at the scene inside. Celeste was bent over Mom, who now stared up at the ceiling with lifeless eyes. Seeing us, she shoved her away and stood up. Oh, you're too late, she giggled, wiping her mouth. The poor thing had no fight left in her, either. She could have used your help. You bitch. I screamed, rushing to my mother's still form. I got down on my knees and raised her head in my lap. Mom, I sobbed, pushing her hair away from her face. Nathan rushed over and kneeled next to us. Oh God, he cried. She did it. She actually killed her. He stood up and pointed at Celeste. You bitch, he hollered, I hope you burn in hell. Oh, quit being so dramatic, she said, waving her hand. I probably did her a favor. She wasn't going to let Dad change her into a vampire anyway. She would have spent her last few months in pain. I gently laid Mom's head down on the carpeting and stood up. I should kill you right now, I growled, taking a step towards her. If anyone deserves to die today, it's you. Going after me would be suicide, she said with a smirk. As you can see, even Victor couldn't kill me. Ethan, snarled Victor. Why in the world did you even allow this to happen? I think you know why, Victor, said Ethan. He scowled. No, I don't. Care to enlighten me? Because I told him that you were holding his beloved Miranda hostage, said Celeste, a smug smile on her lips. And that I'd help him find her. You idiot, yelled Victor. She's lying to you. I considered that but then decided to give her the benefit of the doubt, said Ethan, folding his arms across his chest. If I killed her, I'd never know the truth. Victor rubbed the bridge of his nose. I'm surrounded by fools. You're the fool, replied Celeste. And the world has too many of them. I think it's time to do something about that. Ethan. Duncan pulled me back and whispered in my ear. Get ready to leave through the balcony. I'll grab Nathan. What was that? asked Ethan, staring at us. He just reminded me why I was better off without you, I said, glaring at Ethan. Right, smirked Ethan. Without me you'd have died. The same goes for you, I said. Or have you forgotten already? His smile fell. No, I haven't. Oh please, sighed Celeste. Enough talk. Celeste, I said turning to her. You might want to check the other room. There's something you need to see. What? Go look, I said, noticing Victor's slow smile. He obviously wanted to see her pain as much as I did at that minute. She'd taken great pleasure in hurting me, and part of me wanted to show her how it felt. Ignoring Victor's armed gunman, she shoved past them and stepped into the other room. Within seconds she began to scream. I looked at Victor, who had a triumphant look on his face. She flew back into the room. Who did this? Victor? Boys, said Victor, stepping backwards towards the bathroom. The two lichens raised their guns and started firing at Celeste. Ethan, she screamed, falling to the ground. Help! He threw himself at the gunmen, bringing them both to the ground at once. The sounds of his growls and their shrieks were even too morbid for me. Duncan elbowed me and then grabbed Nathan's arm. We're leaving. We ran past the flurry of Ethan's vicious attacks on the lichens, while Victor roared his protest, aware of our intent. 
I followed Duncan to the balcony, and we launched into the sky without looking back. Chapter 25 One month later. Nikki. I woke to the sounds of the waves splashing against the yacht. It was obvious that we were moving quickly, and I hoped Nathan was steering us towards Key West. My stomach was growling and I needed to feed. You awake? asked Duncan, sticking his head inside of my cabin. I wasn't sure how he did it, but he seemed to know when I was up, even though his cabin was on the other side of the boat. I stretched my arms. Yeah. Who could sleep with the way Nathan drives this thing? You'd think he was on a constant race for nowhere. No doubt. Thank goodness we don't have to worry about suffering from seasickness. I'd never make it with that speed demon. I know what you mean. What time is it? He looked at his watch. It's ten. Nathan wants to dock in Key West. There's some beach party that Taylor invited all of us to. You want to go? Taylor was a girl Nathan had met last week. They'd been hanging out together in the evenings, since he spent most of the day keeping an eye on the yacht while we slept. Sure. I'd like to feed first. Fortunately, we'd found a way to get our blood from a plasma donation clinic in Key West. All we had to do was charm a couple of the attendants, take the bags back to the boat, and store the blood in the refrigerator. No problem, I'll get you a glass while you're in the shower. Better get ready now, we'll be docking in 40 minutes. Okay. He left and I grabbed a red sundress, underwear, and a towel. As I stood in the shower, I closed my eyes and thought about the last few weeks. After our harrowing escape, we'd flown back to Shore Lake, where Duncan had emptied out Sonny's bank account by charming the tellers. Fortunately, he'd had over 50 grand in savings, as well as some money stashed in his sock drawer. Unfortunately, we hadn't been able to go back to our cabin. It was just too dangerous. Because of this, I had nothing of my mother's, not even a single picture. After I got out of the shower, I applied a self-tanner and let it dry before I put my clothing on. The self-tanner had been Nathan's idea, so we'd fit in better. As it dried, I went into my cabin and polished off the glass of blood Duncan had placed in my room. Although it was still really just blood, drinking from a glass made dinner a lot less gruesome even for me. When I was finished, I went back into the bathroom, brushed my teeth, put my hair up in a ponytail, and applied a light coating of lip gloss. Looking incredibly normal, said Nathan as I passed him on his way down to change clothes. Thanks I guess. We're docked. I'm going to shower and meet you guys on the deck. Where is Duncan? He's tying down the boat with the mariner attendants. I walked upstairs to the deck and watched as he finished locking down the yacht. He was dressed in a light blue shirt and white cargo shorts, sporting a fake tan like mine. Almost done? I called. He turned around and smiled, his white teeth sparkling in the moonlight. Yes. You look gorgeous by the way. Thanks, I said. You look pretty handsome yourself. His dark hair was trimmed and short on the sides, the top slightly messy in a very flattering way. With his hands in his pockets, he walked over to me. We make a nice-looking couple. Just until recently, I'd been arguing that there was no way that we could be more than just friends, especially since I'd made so many poor choices. I thought Duncan deserved much better than someone like me, still ashamed at how horrible I'd treated him. But over the last week, my own feelings for him had started blossoming again. It was as if we'd started over, and the terrible things that had happened to us had actually brought us closer. He took his right hand out of his pocket and slipped his fingers between mine. You look happy. I raised my chin and smiled. I am pretty happy, actually. He stared down at me, his silvery eyes glimmering. Have the nightmare stopped? Pretty much. I'd been having nightmare about Victor, my mother, and Celeste, and what had happened back in Vegas. But the dreams had started becoming less frequent as the weeks went by. Good. Thank you, by the way. For what? For everything, I said. For being here for me, for taking care of us. I know you were a victim, too. You know, you should get a break once in a while. He pulled me into his arms and looked down into my eyes, making me feel suddenly giddy. I will never take a break from watching over you, Nikki. As far as I'm concerned, you and Nathan are all I have left. Especially now that I can't see my mom. 
He'd sent her a letter, informing her that he was safe and in South America on a mission trip for several months. Fortunately, nobody had found Sonny's body, as we'd buried him in the woods. As far as the townspeople knew, Sonny and Duncan had disappeared mysteriously, without any logical reasons. Well, we both feel the same way about you. You're part of our family. Actually, he said, staring at my lips. I was hoping that you felt a little stronger than that, considering I'm in love with you. His words now, unlike ever before, actually made my heart sore, bringing me goosebumps. I love you too, I whispered, knowing it was true. I'd loved him as a friend, and over the last few weeks, it had grown beyond that. He lowered his lips to mine and kissed me. I closed my eyes and melted into his arms, enjoying the warmth of his tongue as it moved into my mouth. I slid my arms up to his neck and held on, not wanting to let go. Nikki, he whispered against my mouth. I could actually hear his heart pounding frantically in his chest as he held me in his arms so tightly, I could barely breathe. I love you Duncan, I repeated, feeling my eyes fill with tears. I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. Not only did I have Duncan, but he'd risked everything to save my life and loved me unconditionally. He'd never left my side even when I'd been with Ethan, always waiting patiently for me to decide what I really wanted. You horny kids coming or what? Chuckled Nathan. Duncan and I stepped away from each other, both grinning like idiots. I thought I'd have to spray you two down there for a second, Nathan went on, buttoning his Tony Bahama shirt. But I didn't want to wash off any of that fake tan stuff you two are wearing. I shook my head and smiled. You're a goofball. Ready to go? He ran a hand through his sandy brown hair. More than ready. How do I look? You look good, I said, admiring the gold and white shirt he'd splurged on to impress Taylor. Taylor is going to be drooling when she sees you. Damn right, he said. Now let's get going before all of the food is gone at this party. After losing almost 20 pounds during the stint in Vegas, his appetite had come back with a vengeance. Now, 25 pounds heavier and tan, he looked healthier than he had in ages. The party was within walking distance at a private beach resort owned by Taylor's uncle. When we arrived, the short vivacious little blonde threw her arms around Nathan and planted his face with kisses. I've been waiting for you all night, she said breathlessly. He pointed toward us. Had to wait for these guys to wake up. You two really need to do something about that schedule of yours. Hazards of night security, replied Duncan. Nathan had concocted this story that Duncan and I owned a security business and worked on call when our employees quit or called in sick. Taylor smiled. Well, I'm glad neither of you are working tonight. You guys hungry? She asked, pointing towards a buffet they had set up under a huge canopy. There are chicken wings, pork sandwiches, all kinds of salads and fruit. Go help yourselves. As wonderful as it sounded, Duncan and I knew it would only make us sick if we even attempted. Thanks, I said. Maybe later. Nathan rubbed his hands together. I'm starving, Taylor. Have you eaten? No, I was waiting for you, she said, clutching onto his arm. She gazed at him dreamily. Although, I'm not really hungry for food. He smiled lecherously. You are a little vixen, aren't you? Nikki and I are going to take a walk around and check out the band, said Duncan, biting back a smile. As usual, Nathan and Taylor could hardly keep their hands off of each other, and we knew that soon, they'd be disappearing somewhere. Sure, said Nathan, pulling Taylor towards the food. Catch you later. Stay out of trouble. There were hundreds of people on the beach, either gathered around a large fire, playing volleyball in the sand, or dancing to reggae music that the band was playing. It's an amazing night, I said, staring towards the ocean. It's a perfect night, replied Duncan. You know, we never got to finish that walk on the beach back in Shore Lake. I think a walk next to the ocean would help fix that. His lips pulled up into a smile. Let's go. Really? You don't mind leaving the party for a while? I'm only really at this party for you. I grinned. That's funny, because I'm really only here because of you guys. Then let's ditch it for a while. Okay. He grabbed my hand and pulled me towards the edge of the beach. Wait, I said. Let's take our shoes off. He bent down and removed his loafers while I took off my white sandals. Ready? I took his hand. More than ready. 
We started walking in the cool, wet sand, the breeze blowing wisps of hair loose from my ponytail. He smiled down at me. I think you should take your hair down. Why? Because it's beautiful. Well, how can I say no to that? I replied, pulling out the binder. He stepped closer and slid his fingers through the strands. I closed my eyes and let out sigh of content. That feels so good. You take my breath away. You know that? I opened my eyes. Stop, I replied, feeling myself blush. Thank goodness your cheeks can still turn pink, he replied, his eye twinkling. I live to watch you blush, and to know I'm actually making it happen. I tilted my head to the side and smiled. You sure know how to sweet-talk a girl. Actually, I've had a lot of practice. I raised my eyebrows. Really? Ahem, all the times I've dreamed about us being alone. Together. I have to tell you though, this is so much better. Is that so? I said, playing along. Oh yeah, he replied, pulling me into his arms. In my dreams I did this. He leaned forward and kissed the top of my nose. What else? I whispered. And this. He pressed his lips against mine. What else? I asked, wanting more. He slid his hands over my rear and pulled our hips together. Feeling his excitement pressing against me, I pulled his lips back to mine. Groaning, he slid his tongue inside of my mouth, deepening our kiss. As our tongues danced, I imagined myself wrapped around his body and squeezed his buns. He pulled his mouth from mine and grabbed my hand. Let's go, he said in a hoarse whisper. We ran down the beach together, towards a formation of large rocks, which blocked us from going further. Grabbing me by the waist, he flew us over to a private alcove on the other side. This is beautiful, I said as our feet touched the white sand. Instead of answering, he captured my lips and slid his hands over my backside, kissing me with an intensity that left no doubt as to what was going to happen. Moaning with desire, I pushed him down to the sand and slid on top of him. Make love to me, I whispered, placing his hands on my butt as I straddled his hips. Nikki, he growled, squeezing my buttocks with his fingers as I rubbed my pelvis against his. I stared down into his eyes, reveling in the raw desire reflected there. I pulled his head up to meet mine, sliding my fingers into his hair as our lips came together, demanding, possessing and devouring the others. Just when I thought it couldn't feel any sweeter, one of his hands moved up to my chest, sending a delicious tingle all the way down to my pelvis. Duncan, I moaned. Unable to control myself any longer, I pulled my dress up above my shoulders and tossed it aside. He stared up at my nakedness with approval, his silvery blue eyes half-hooded. I feel like I'm dreaming, he whispered, reaching for me. Duncan then made love to me with such tenderness and passion, it took my breath away. Afterward, he held me in his arms and kissed my lips. I'm so happy now, my face hurts from smiling. I'm happy too, I replied, feeling my heart swell as I stared into his eyes. I love you so much, Duncan. I never want you to leave me. Ever. He wiped a tear from under my lashes. You're stuck with me. For eternity. I can live with that. Chapter 26 Nikki Where's Nathan? Asked Taylor when we arrived back at the party, 20 minutes later. Isn't he here with you? I asked. He said he had to go use the bathroom and never came back. That was like 15 minutes ago, she said. I snorted. That explains it. He spends more time in the bathroom than most women. She bit her lip. Yeah, but he should be back by now, don't you think? I'll go look for him, said Duncan, releasing my hand. I'll see if he fell in. I laughed and watched him as he walked towards the restrooms. I just had an amazing time with the man I planned on spending my life with. I felt like I was on cloud nine. So does Nathan talk about me, asked Taylor. I smiled. She had just turned 18, was drop-dead gorgeous, with her platinum blonde hair and sea-green eyes, but obviously still very unaware of her own beauty. He talks about you all the time, I said. In fact, sometimes I have to step away from him to make sure he catches his breath once in a while. Her eyes lit up. Really? Yes, really? She squealed. Awesome. I shook my head in amusement and turned to see Duncan walking back towards us. From the look on his face, he hadn't found Nathan. No luck, huh? I asked. No. 
Maybe he went back to the yacht. To look for us. Let's go check. Taylor, I said, turning to her. Stay here in case he comes back. We'll go check the boat. Okay. Come on, said Duncan, grabbing my hand. We walked back to the marina, talking and giggling about earlier. Let's send Nathan back to the party and go for round two, said Duncan, winking at me. You don't have to twist my arm, I replied, already feeling tingly at the thought of being with him again. Maybe we should try skinny dipping this time too. He pinched my butt. I'll be dipping into something skinny. I laughed. When we arrived at the boat, a couple of the lights were on. See he's here, said Duncan, climbing aboard. I followed him onto the boat. Nathan, hollered Duncan. I'll go check down below, I said, opening up the sliding glass door. Nathan? There was a loud crash from his cabin, and he began to scream. Nikki. Run. Instead of running, I rushed to his bedroom door and threw it open. When I looked inside, he was tied to the bed. Oh my god, I said, tearing at the restraints. What happened? Celeste and Ethan are both here, he said quickly. Looking for you. Worried about Duncan, I sped out of the cabin and upstairs to the deck. When I got outside, Duncan was gone. Duncan? I screamed into the darkness. Several people from other boats turned to gawk at me. You are a loud one, aren't you? I whipped my head around to find Celeste, lounging on one of the cushioned benches. I should have known. Surprise, she said with a wicked grin. Where's Duncan? I snapped. She took a sip from a large coconut with an umbrella sticking out of it. Oh, he and Ethan went for a little stroll. To discuss old times, I gather. What do you want? She stood up and put her drink down. Actually, believe it or not, I come in peace. Sorry, but I'm not buying it, I replied, taking a step back from her. No, it's the truth. Basically, I'm here because, she rolled her eyes, I can't believe I'm saying this, but we need you. What? Who needs me? Oddly enough, Ethan and myself. Mostly me, however, Ethan is just getting paid to assist me. With what? She smirked. Freeing your mom. She didn't die. I stared at her in disbelief, although somewhere deep inside I felt a small twinge of hope. I don't believe you. It's the truth. I didn't kill her back in Vegas, although I have to admit, I wanted to at the time. Anyway, she's pregnant with my father's child. The blood rushed to my head and I grabbed onto the side of the boat. She's alive and pregnant? What kind of lies are you concocting now, Celeste? Believe me, I'm not lying. Why would I sit here and waste my time just to fabricate some story about your mom when I'd rather be back at that little soiree on the beach scoping out my next meal? I don't know. She groaned. Listen, your mom is pregnant. Probably a month or two, I don't even know. How do you know she's pregnant? I found a pregnancy test in their suite after escaping Victor last month. He and his dogs almost killed me again. Luckily, Ethan helped me get out of there before it was too late. Pregnant? Really, is that even possible? I guess so. It appears that our parents actually did bond three times, and sometime during one of their interludes, she grimaced, she must have become pregnant. So you know what that means? She's a pregnant vampire? I replied dryly. She smirked. Give the girl a cookie. I can't believe she's alive, I said, looking away as my eyes filled with tears. Oh, she's alive, and so is her fetus. For now. I wiped a tear from my cheek and turned back to her. What do you mean? Victor. He has your mother and plans on keeping the infant once it's born, so he can give it to that crazy Dr. Shepard. He'll use it like a lab rat. I stared at her in horror. No. Oh yes, she replied. Obviously, the man is insane. Anyway, like it or not, the baby is what's left of my father, and her face darkened, there is no way in hell that I'm going to let that madman figure out a way to populate the world with vampire-infused lichens. He killed my dad, and I plan on stopping that prick in any way possible. And now you want my help? Yes. I figured you'd want to save your mom. Well, of course, I said, sitting down on one of the benches. Although I wanted to believe her, I knew it was dangerous. How do I know you're not lying? She smiled. 
I figured you'd ask that. Here, she said, reaching into her purse. She pulled out a photo and handed it to me. Proof. I stared down at the picture of my mother and sighed in relief. She was sitting next to Victor in a restaurant, looking miserable, but healthy. Healthier than I'd seen her in a long time. Now that was taken last week. He has several guards monitoring her at all times. All of his lichen dogs, she said, wrinkling her nose in disgust. Anyway, obviously, we need to get her out of there. Can I keep this picture? Yes. I let out a long, ragged sigh. Obviously, I'm going to try and help her. But I said, glaring at Celeste, I still don't trust you. Not only have you tried to kill everyone in my family, but you seem to turn on a dime. I know you're pissed. I can respect that. I pointed my index finger at her. I'm telling you right now, if you do anything, anything to my brother or Duncan, I will hunt you down and kill you. I'd expect no less, she replied, forcing a smile. So you're in? Of course. One more thing, we leave Nathan here. No, Nathan is not staying here, he replied, stepping out of the darkness. Obviously, he'd stepped out the other side of the boat and had been listening in the entire time. She's my mother, too. I'm coming with you. What can you do against a group of lichen, Nathan? I asked, standing up. Seriously? I don't know, but there's no way you're leaving me behind. What about Taylor? He hesitated. I'll come back and see her when all of this is finished. She's a nice girl, but we're talking about family. That's right, brother, said Celeste, smiling. You stay the hell away from me, he snapped. I mean it. No hypnosis or whatever it is you were trying to do to me in Vegas. I'll leave you alone, she said, her eyes so wide I had a hard time believing she meant it. Scout's on her. Where does Victor have her? I asked. Back in Shore Lake, the cabin you guys stayed at, said Celeste. Well, at least we don't have to go back to Vegas, I said, folding my arms under my chest. How did you find us, by the way? One of you screwed up and used a credit card a couple of weeks ago. Ethan has connections, so we eventually tracked you here. A credit card purchase, huh? Where? I asked stunned. Tommy Bahamas, she said, turning to Nathan. Nice shirt, by the way. Nathan. I hollered. What in the hell were you thinking? We talked about this. His face turned red. I didn't think they had the resources to track us out here. I had the address changed on my credit card and everything. I was just so tired of borrowing money from Duncan. You should be happy he screwed up, said Ethan, stepping off of the deck and onto the boat wearing shorts and a tank. Or you'd never know about your mom. Ethan, although still heartbreakingly handsome, did nothing but make me sick to my stomach now. I glared at the one person who'd caused me so much heartache. Where's Duncan? He snorted. Hopefully out of my life for good. It was then that I noticed his clothes were wet and his lip was puffy and bleeding. Sorry to disappoint you, said Duncan, landing on the boat. But I'm here and actually doing a lot better than you, he said, chuckling. Thank God, are you okay? I asked, putting my arms around Duncan's waist. Considering that I'm dry and have a hot girl in my arms, I'm doing better than anyone here. That piece of shit, on the other hand, just found out that I'm not as weak and vulnerable as I once was. Give it up, you're always going to be weaker than me, snapped Ethan, his lips pulled into an ugly scowl. Just because you got in a couple good licks doesn't mean squat. Celeste groaned. Would you please quit your fighting? Ethan, did you tell Duncan why we're here? He licked the blood from his lower lip. I started to, and then he attacked me. I wasn't expecting it. You weren't. Duncan snorted. What did you expect? That I'd invite you on board for a couple of drinks, so we could talk about what douchebag you are. I would have loved to have gotten in that conversation, said Nathan. Enough, snarled Celeste. This is giving me a migraine. Look, we're leaving. We'll meet you guys back in Shore Lake at Club Nightshade. Tomorrow night around midnight. Fine, I said. But don't think for one moment that we're buddies now. We'll help save our mother from Victor, but after we get her away from him, you won't be hearing from us ever again. And I expect the same of you. I can live with that, said Celeste. I still don't know what's going on, replied Duncan. 
I'm not agreeing to anything until someone besides Ethan fills me in. I explained the situation as briefly as I could. When I was finished, he sighed. Well, I'm in, obviously. But just like Nikki said, we'll work together to free Anne, but that's it. And you, he said, pointing towards Ethan. You keep your distance from Nikki or so help me, I'll kill you. I swear it on my father's grave, I will kill you. Nikki has nothing to worry about from me, he said, giving me one of his charming smiles. I rolled my eyes. Puke. I turned back to Duncan. It doesn't matter if Ethan tries anything because I love you, Duncan. You. I have absolutely no feelings for him, and the ones I thought I had died in Vegas. So, I leaned forward and kissed his lips, don't worry about me. He smiled. I love you too, Nikki. Ethan clapped his hands. Oh, how touching, he said with a mocking sneer on his face. Well, now that we have all of that established, Celeste and I will take our leave. Okay, replied Duncan, waving his hand as if he was shooing away bothersome flies. Nightshade, tomorrow night. See you tomorrow, Nikki, said Ethan, undressing me with his eyes. Celeste chuckled and grabbed his hand. Down, boy. Can't you see you've been replaced? Maybe. Maybe not, he said as she pulled him away from the boat. Stop it, she giggled. That guy needs a good ass kicking, said Nathan. Next time you need to give him more than a fat lip, Duncan. Believe me, I'd love to. I'm going to call Taylor. She probably thinks I abandoned her. I turned towards Duncan as Nathan went inside of the cabin. Ethan just doesn't stop, I said. He makes me sick. He put his arm around me possessively. Don't worry. I won't leave you alone with him for a minute. Speaking of being alone, I smiled seductively. You and I need more of that. I want to celebrate the fact that my mom is alive, and I can't think of a better way to do it. As much as I would love it, he replied. We don't have time. What do you mean? He smiled grimly. We're not waiting until tomorrow night to get back to Shore Lake. We're leaving tonight. I don't trust those two. They've already tried to kill us several times. For all we know, this could be another trap. I bit my lower lip. Good plan. Plus, we can leave Nathan here. It's too dangerous to bring him with us. I agree. Let's fuel up in the galley with a couple quarts of blood and head out. Chapter 27 Nikki. We made ID back to Victor's cabin in Shore Lake in record time. Three cars were parked in the driveway and two armed guards were standing outside, smoking cigarettes and talking. What are we going to do? I whispered. We'd landed on the roof of the garage and were crouched down, hidden by the darkness. I don't know. We don't even know if your mom is inside. She must be, otherwise they wouldn't have the guards. Good point, he whispered. We could fly to the balcony, I said, pointing to my bedroom. Sneak in and try looking for her. Not when they're standing right there. If they don't hear us, they might smell us. Lichens have a keen sense of smell since they're related to the canine family, probably much better than ours. Well then, let's cause some kind of distraction then. He thought about it for a while and then nodded. Okay. This is what I'm going to do. I'll fly over to the boathouse and start the boat on fire. My eyebrows shot up. That's a little extreme, don't you think? No, it's the perfect distraction. Everyone will run out of the house, we'll snatch your mom and get her the hell out of here. I smiled. Oh wow, that's a brilliant idea. I kissed him quickly on the cheek. I'll have to reward you later. If that's not incentive to stay alive, he said, nothing is. Now wait for the explosion. When everyone runs out of the house, fly to your balcony and sneak in. Okay. He kissed me on the lips. Um, and Senev never tasted so delicious. I pushed him playfully. Like a gust of wind, he blew off of the roof and disappeared behind the boathouse. I stayed low, watching the house and the guards. After a few minutes, the guards separated and began to walk around the property. Shit, I whispered as one of the men began walking towards the boathouse. Instead of going inside, however, he walked to the edge of the dock, unzipped his fly and took a whiz. I rolled my eyes and turned my head to look at the other guard, who I noticed was walking behind the house. As they continued to walk the property and the seconds ticked by, I started getting worried, 
wondering if Duncan was having problems setting the boat on fire. I wasn't even sure how to do it myself, but knowing how boats had been his life, there was no doubt in my mind that if anyone could light one up, it would be him. Finally, a loud explosion lit up the night, followed by dark billowy clouds of smoke and flames. The two security guards ran towards the dock, stopping at a safe distance. Soon the front door of the cabin burst open and Victor ran out wearing a dark brown robe. What happened? he hollered. Hell I don't know, replied one of the guards. Maybe a faulty wire on the boat or something? Did either of you try and start it? Nobody did, replied the other guard. As I prepared to fly towards my old balcony, I saw my mother standing in the doorway. Oh my god, I choked, ecstatic that she was really alive. What's happening, she called. Honey, go back inside, hollered Victor. You don't want to breathe in any of the smoke. It's toxic. She hesitated and then shut the door. Unable to wait any longer, I launched up into the sky and then back down towards the balcony, making sure I built up enough speed so Victor wouldn't see me. When I landed on the balcony, Duncan was already crouched down and waiting. What took you so long, he asked, his eyes glittering with amusement. Funny. I was almost going to ask you the same question. Starting a fire is a lot more complicated than it looks. Oh, I believe you. The door was unlocked and my bedroom, which had been in total disarray the last time I'd seen it, had been turned into a nursery. You're kidding, I whispered, staring at the white crib and Winnie the Pooh decorations. I haven't even been gone a month, and I've been replaced by a fetus. Nice. Nikki, if what they say is true, she's forgotten all about you. It's not her fault. I know. I just miss my life. Me too, he said. I opened the bedroom door and peeked through the opening. Let's go, I whispered, stepping outside into the hallway. We first went to her bedroom and peered inside, only to find it empty. Let's check the kitchen, I whispered. Nikki. I turned around to find her standing in the doorway. Mom, I said, my eyes tearing up. I walked over and she pulled me into her arms. It's true, you're really alive. She looked down at me and smiled sadly. More or less. Is it true? Are you pregnant? She tensed up. Nikki, you have to get out of here. Duncan, take her as far away from here as you can. You're coming with us, I said. She shook her head. No. I can't leave this place. I can't leave Victor. Why? Because, he'll come after you and Nathan. Mom, he'll never find us. She touched my cheek. Oh, Nikki, he's known where you've been the entire time. In the Florida Keys. The only reason he didn't come after you was because of me. I don't understand. I'm pregnant with Caleb's child. I heard. When did you find out? Her eyes filled with tears. Right before Caleb was killed. When we learned I was carrying his child, he came clean about everything. Of course, I didn't believe him at first. I was furious, thought he was crazy, but then he showed me and she wiped a tear from her cheek. Anyway, he was worried about mine and the baby's safety, so we decided that the only option was for me to become a vampire. I guess it was the right choice, otherwise you'd both be dead right now, said Duncan. Mom, we have to get out of here before Victor comes to check on you. I can't leave. You don't understand, Nikki. If I stay with him, he'll leave you and your brother alone. He swore to me. And you really believe him? I have no choice. And like I said, he's already known where you've been staying. He's shown me pictures. Where did he get the pictures? I asked. He sent one of his men out to Florida about two weeks ago. Why did you come back anyway? Victor said you believed that I was dead. Celeste and Ethan found us, she replied. Her face darkened. You have to stay away from them. They've been trying to kill me and the baby. Duncan swore. See, I told you not to trust them. It's true, she said. They've tried several times and have even hired assassins. I guess Celeste is furious that I'm having her father's baby and wants us both destroyed. She's a conniving bitch, I muttered. She made it sound like she was on our side and wanted to help me save you. Maybe, but only to kill all of us afterwards. Don't trust her. Mom, come with us. We'll leave the keys and go somewhere else where you'll be safe. 
Victor only wants your baby so that he can experiment on it. That's not entirely true, she said. He just wants to borrow the baby's DNA. Yes, to make an army of lichens that will take over the world and kill anyone who stands in their way. You can't beat Victor, she replied. He has eyes and ears all over the country. If I leave with you, he'll find us within minutes and then, he'll kill you and Nathan. There's no way he could find us that quickly, I said. Unfortunately, there is, she replied, touching her stomach. He's had some kind of chip inserted inside of me. A tracking device. What? Can we have it removed? She shook her head. Not fast enough. I'd have to have surgery and by then, it would be too late for all of us. I groaned. What in the hell are we going to do? She hugged me. You're going to get lost again, this time somewhere more desolate. I can't leave you, I said, now in tears. I don't trust Victor and... I really don't trust Celeste and Ethan. Victor won't harm me, not when I'm pregnant with this child, at least. But... Once I have the baby and he gets what he needs, he has promised to let me go. And you really believe him? I have to. And seeing that you are still alive, I feel even better about it. He's a monster, Mom. She let out a ragged sigh. Maybe, but I'm not putting you, Nathan, and the baby at risk by spending the rest of my pregnancy running. What about Celeste and Ethan? I asked. What if they get their hands on you? They won't, interrupted Victor, walking into the bedroom. Shit, I groaned. He smirked. You're not very good at running, you do realize that? Duncan grabbed my arm protectively. Victor waved his hand. Oh, I'm not interested in hurting either of you. But if you try and get in the way of my plans, you'll be feeling a world of pain. How are you going to protect my mom from Celeste and Ethan, 24-7? He rubbed his chin. I was going to keep armed guards around her at all times, but now that you're here, I've come up with a new plan. What? I asked. I want you to set up a meeting with them. Obviously, you know how to get a hold of them. Actually, I said, looking at Duncan. We're supposed to meet them at Club Nightshade tomorrow night. He smiled. Perfect. If we give you Celeste and Ethan, said Duncan. Will you give us Anne? No. But I will guarantee Anne's safety. She'll stay here at the cabin during her pregnancy, and I'll let her walk away from all of it once the baby arrives. Why should we trust you? I asked. Have I hurt any of you yet? My eyes narrowed. You've hurt my mother many times throughout the years. But she's still alive, and if you knew how I operated, you'd realize how rare that is. I raised my eyebrows. Believe it or not, he continued, the thought of hurting her physically leaves a bad taste in my mouth. That being said, however, I'm not going to deny the fact that I have a temper, and it's best not to test it. Well, that's comforting, I said dryly. Face it, Nikki, you really don't have a choice but to go along with keeping your mom alive. And the child, asked Duncan. What will happen to it? He shrugged. She can keep it after we've collected DNA samples. Why does this child mean so much to you? asked Duncan. Obviously, you have no idea how rare a vampire child is. If the baby goes to term, it's going to be stronger and faster than any vampire that was created simply by bonding. And if I can combine the DNA from that child with lichen, his eyes lit up. It's going to be one very powerful force. And deadly. I bit my lower lip. Okay. If you promise not to hurt mom and let them both go when the baby is born, we'll agree to help you. Victor nodded. I figured you were intelligent enough to see things my way. Now, keep your meeting tomorrow night. Find a way to bring them into the alley and we'll do the rest. What time are you meeting them? Midnight. Perfect. You're making the right decision, he said. I hope so, I replied. You are. I walked over to my mom and kissed her cheek. I have a plan, I whispered. Her eyes widened. I smiled, grabbed Duncan's hand and left. Chapter 28 Nikki We snuck into Sunny's marina and stayed there until the following evening. Neither of us could sleep so we spent most of the time making love as well as plans. How do you plan on getting that chip out of her? 
asked Duncan, sitting down in the break room. There's got to be a way, I said. I just don't want her living with that monster. I don't trust him, and he's a walking time bomb. He stared at his fingers as he tapped them on the round wooden table. They'll track us down. Probably, but we're faster. The lichens can't fly, Duncan. We'll just stay on the move until we find someone who will remove the chip. He rubbed a hand over his face. I guess I wouldn't trust him either. Besides Nathan, she's all you have left of your family. I'd do anything to get mine back. I sat down on his lap. I'm your family now. Me and Nathan. He smiled and kissed my lips. There was a long line waiting to get into Club Nightshade the next evening. We stood in the back of the line and within seconds were ushered past the others waiting to get in. Obviously they're expecting us, I said as we entered the loud club. Duncan said something. What? I hollered over the loud pounding of the music. Place hasn't changed. I had to agree there. Not only was it overcrowded, but it seemed like everyone was on ecstasy or something. The entire place reeked of sin and debauchery. We walked through a swarm of undulating bodies towards the stairs, and I tried ignoring the sweet smell of salty mortal flesh. Although the idea of putting my mouth on a stranger's skin didn't sound very appealing, my stomach began to growl. The VIP lounge is upstairs, said Duncan. Oh, you've been there? I asked smirking. A couple times with Celeste and your brother. That's where she usually hangs out. What, is there a bed in there? He chuckled and grabbed my hand. Let's go. When we got to this so-called VIP room, a bouncer was monitoring the door. He had dark skin, muscles on muscles, and towered over both of us. Private party, he said, chewing on gum. You've got a pass? Is Celeste inside? I asked. He stared at me for a minute. You, Nikki. Yep. Go downstairs and through the kitchen. When you get out the other side, you'll see a door marked office. She's waiting for you. Okay, I said, pulling Duncan with me. When we reached the bottom of the stairs, a guy in his thirties stopped us. Duncan? Where have you been? Oh, hey, Merle. I've been trying to get a hold of your dad to see how he's coming along with my boat, but he's not returning any of my calls. He frowned. I have to say, it's pissing me off. Sorry. Look, the next time I see him, I'll tell him to call you. Actually, I'm only in town for another day. I'd appreciate it if you'd have him call me right away, or give me the keys to my boat. Sure. They kept talking, and I turned my head towards the bar, only to find Ethan standing there. He smiled and then waved me over with his finger. Duncan, I said, turning to him. We have. Better yet, said the man. Why don't we just walk over there now and see if your old man is around? Now isn't a good time, he replied. The man's face turned red. I don't think you understand. A crowd of people walked by and somehow I was jostled away from Duncan. Then someone grabbed my hand and pulled me away. Before I knew what had happened, I was standing in a deserted part of the club with Ethan. Ah, alone at last, he said, grinning wickedly. What in the hell are you doing? I asked, stepping backwards. He grabbed my arm and pulled me to his chest. Come on, Nikki. I made a mistake. I screwed up. But I know that now, and... I want to make it up to you. I stared into his icy blue eyes and felt nothing but revulsion. Let go of me. He licked his lips. You're mine. You will always be mine. I don't care about anything else, Miranda, Victor, helping Celeste. Let's get out of here and we'll start over. I pushed him in the chest. Not only are you pathetic, but you're deranged. I don't care if you think you've made a mistake. I love Duncan and will never do anything to hurt him. His lips twisted into an ugly scowl. I will not share you with anyone. If you refuse to leave with me, you'll never leave this building alive. I stared at him in horror. You're a monster, Ethan. I'll take that as a compliment, he said, and then grabbed me by the neck. He threw me up against the wall. What's it going to be, my love? I gasped for breath and tried uncurling his fingers from my neck, but he was much stronger than me. I then tried grabbing him by the testicles, but he caught my hand. Really? You have to work on your defense techniques. 
Suddenly Duncan was standing behind Ethan, his eyes blazing with rage. Sensing him there, Ethan snapped his head back, slamming it into Duncan's face. Duncan? I screamed as two bouncers stormed into the room towards him. Ethan released my neck and turned to the security guards. Take him out of here. Before they could put their hands on Duncan, he turned and bared his fangs. Just try it, he growled. Get him. Hollered Ethan. What the hell? Gasped the taller one, as Duncan's eyes turned a reddish orange. Free of Ethan's hold but still trapped against the wall, I pulled my fist back and slammed at the side of his jaw with everything I had. His feet lifted from the ground and he flew across the room, tumbling to the floor, surprising everyone in the room, including me. I stared at my fist in shock and smiled. Somehow, I was growing stronger. The two security guards stared at me in shock and then backed out of the room. Damn girl, smiled Duncan. Remind me to stay on your good side. Must be the new diet, I replied, thinking of the fresh blood from the Red Cross. Ethan stood up and rubbed his jaw. Not bad, he said. But also not effective enough. Before I knew what was happening, he launched at me, fangs first. Fortunately, Duncan intercepted his attack by grabbing him by the head and slamming his face against the ground. You seem to be making a lot of mistakes, bro, smirked Duncan, staring down at his bloody nose. I'm not your bro, growled Ethan, springing up from the ground. This time he lucked out, getting him with an uppercut that knocked him across the room. As Duncan's head hit the wall, Ethan launched at him again and began wailing on his face with both fists, treating his face like a punching bag. Stop! I screamed, jumping onto his back. I grabbed his neck and tried twisting it. Bitch, he yelled, flying backwards, slamming my spine against the wall several times. Gasping, I released his neck and slid to the ground. He turned around and smiled coldly. You've turned into a little spitfire. I have to tell you, it's quite the turn on. Duncan took that moment to slam a metal chair on top of Ethan's head. He fell to his knees and I watched as the chair came down, again and again. Soon the top of Ethan's head was covered in blood and he lay unconscious on the ground. Let's go, said Duncan holding out his hand. Before he regains consciousness. I grabbed it and he pulled me up. Aren't you going to kill him? As much as I'd like to, I'm not a murderer. I'll leave that up to Victor when he finds him. We have to find Celeste, I said. Celeste is right here, she said, standing in the doorway. What happened to him? He was tired, said Duncan. Needed a nap. She smirked. Right. He tried making a move on me, I said. And so they started fighting. Anyway, we need to talk about my mom, but the music in the club is driving me crazy. Can we go somewhere quiet? Like the alley. She shrugged. I guess. Come on. We followed her to the back loading dock, and she opened up the door. You first. I peered into the darkness, but didn't see anyone lurking in the alley. You cold, she asked. No, why? I said as we stepped into the darkness. You're shivering. I looked down and noticed my hands were trembling. I had to admit I was so nervous, I wanted to run. So, she said, sitting down on the steps. How should we do this? Obviously, we need to get her alone, I said, looking past the dumpster, wondering when Victor's men were going to spring. I doubt that's going to happen, she said. Maybe you should call Victor and see if he'll let you see her? Maybe. She smirked. Or maybe you already have. I tried not to show my fear. What are you talking about? Oh, Nikki, she said, smiling up at me in amusement. You're so predictable. By the way, have you talked to Nathan lately? My heart sunk. Why? She took out her cell phone and dialed some numbers. You feeling okay? She asked into the phone. With a satisfied grin, she winked at me. Good. That's what you get for putting your hand in the cookie jar, Ethan. Bring us Nathan, we're in the alley. I scowled as she hung up the phone. What's going on? I should be asking you the same question. You arrived in town last night, and a little birdie told me that you spoke to Victor. I wasn't sure how she found out, but I knew Nathan's life was resting in our hands at the moment. We tried reasoning with him, replied Duncan. But, obviously it didn't work. She arched an eyebrow. And that's it? Yeah, why? I asked. 
Her eyes burned into mine. You didn't bring up me or Ethan. No, why? I asked my voice steady. Did he ask how you found out about the baby? We told him that Nikki had returned to the cabin to get some of her things and acted surprised. Good, she said nodding. A few seconds later, Ethan showed up with Nathan, who looked pissed as all hell. Nikki. Why in the hell did you leave me behind, he snapped. We did it because it was too dangerous, replied Duncan on my behalf. You guys can't keep making decisions for me, he said. Fortunately, these guys stopped back to the boat and gave me lift back here. Good thing, said Celeste with a smug grin. I turned to look at Ethan, who had blood trickling from the top of his head and down his cheek. I watched as his eyes locked with Duncan's and they stared each other down with raw hate. You two better work out your differences, said Celeste, turning to Duncan. We are going to have to stick together if we want to do this right. Right, Ethan? Before Ethan could answer, a dark shadow fell from above the sky, landing next to Ethan. Ethan took a step back. Drake, what are you doing here? Heard there was going to be a party here tonight, he replied. From who, he asked. From me, replied Victor, stepping out of the shadows with a half dozen other men, who I could only assume were lichens. He smiled darkly. I thought a reunion was in order. You remember Drake, right? Celeste. Ethan. I remember Drake, but I didn't know much about him other than that he was a drop-dead gorgeous vampire from Australia. Although he was cocky, he'd also never been a threat to me. This night, however, there was something very menacing about him. Victor turned to me. Drake, like Ethan, does some odd jobs for me. Drake, unlike Ethan, is faithful, reliable, and trustworthy. I glanced at Ethan, who, for the first time ever, looked uneasy. Hey, copper, called Drake, waving to Nathan. Long time no see. Nathan tossed him a dirty look but didn't respond. He must have sensed the danger in the air and knew he was in way over his head. You, snarled Celeste, storming towards me. You betrayed us. I glared back at her. How does it feel? Her eyes turned bright red. I'm going to kill you once and for all, she growled and then pounced on me. We landed on the cement, my head hitting gravel. As she tried biting me in the cheek, I grabbed her by the throat, turned over until I was on top of her and slapped her across the face. Ow, she cried, touching her cheek. God, you're such a bitch. Have you had enough? I screamed into her face. Because I've had enough of your bullshit to last me a lifetime. I swear to God, Celeste, if you don't back down, I'm going to beat you until your face is beyond repair. I'm so tired of your lies and this need you have to destroy my family. It has to end. Now. She stared up at me with tears and loathing. It won't end until you're dead, she spat. I rolled my eyes. Whatever. Now who's the drama queen? With a loud shriek, she flipped us over and began punching me in the face. Blood sprayed from my nose, covering her fists, and my right cheek burned with hot pain as she got in a few licks with her knuckles. Oh. I moaned, holding my cheek as Duncan and Nathan pulled her off of me. I spit out a tooth and stared down at it in horror. It will grow back, chuckled Drake. Man, that was a good catfight. Glad I could help entertain you, I said, spitting out blood this time. Victor snapped his fingers. Boys, take Celeste back to the van. As far as Ethan goes, Drake, he smiled, it's time to earn that money I paid you. Drake smiled and cracked his knuckles and turned to Ethan. No offense, bloke, but this is just business. Ethan shot up into the sky. Oh, how I love a good chase, said Drake, following suit. Well, that's that, said Victor, smiling triumphantly as Celeste was ushered away, a gun pointed at her head. Celeste is under my control, and Ethan's done for. Are you sure? asked Duncan. Ethan isn't exactly a pushover. Drake is over a thousand years old. He's the most powerful vampire in North America, which is interesting because he's from Australia. No, Ethan doesn't stand a chance. I stared up into the sky, and although I hated Ethan for the way he'd hurt me, there was a tiny part of me that would grieve for him if what Victor said was true. Like all of us, he'd been somebody's victim once too. I'd like to say that you're always welcome to come by and visit your mother and me at the cabin, said Victor. He paused and let out a ragged sigh. But there were some complications. What do you mean, asked Nathan, walking towards him. Victor smiled grimly. 
Your mom tried to escape last night, and it set off a chain of very, very unfortunate events. My heart stopped. Like what? Well first, she fell from your balcony. Apparently, she didn't know how to fly yet, and not only injured herself but also lost the baby. I covered my mouth. Is she okay? I asked, staring at him in horror. He sighed. No, I'm afraid that after she lost the baby, your mother went completely mad. She got a hold of one of my shotguns and killed herself. He pointed towards his brain. A bullet to the head. No. I choked, feeling as if someone punched me in the stomach and tore out my heart. I don't believe you, hollered Nathan. She would never kill herself. I'm sorry, Nathan. It's true. I'm sure none of us could understand the devastation she must have felt after killing her unborn child. But it was an accident, I sobbed, unable to believe that I'd lost my mother for the second time in a month. Duncan put his arm around me. I closed my eyes and leaned against him. I want to see her, said Nathan. I opened my eyes. Victor nodded. You most certainly can. At the funeral. I'm having one for her next week. You're welcome to attend. You should, she's your mother. We'll be there, said Nathan. Count on it. Obviously it will be a closed casket, he said. You're welcome to take a peek inside if you have any doubts. Before the service. I shuddered. I'd best get back to the cabin with Celeste. Which reminds me, he chuckled, there will probably be more than one funeral next week. You're going to kill her? I asked. After we play a few games and she learns obedience, yes, I'm going to kill her. She betrayed me more than once, he said. What about us? asked Nathan. Are we just free to go? Of course. As long as you respect my boundaries and never interfere with any of my plans, I'll allow you to live. But, his eyes grew a yellowish orange. You go against me or one of my brethren, I'll hunt you down and show no mercy. None of us said anything. Victor's eyes returned to normal. He turned around and walked towards the darkness. Don't forget about your mom's funeral next week. Probably Friday. Watch for her obituary in the paper. After he was gone, the three of us looked at each other. What now? asked Nathan looking somber. We go back to the Keys, I said. And make plans. For what? asked Duncan. I doubt Victor is going to let you plan her funeral. I'm talking about locating mom. She's not dead, I whispered. Why do you say that? asked Duncan. He wants a vampire baby. He'd spend all that time trying to kidnap me because he thought I could get pregnant because I'd so recently turned. Then, when mom actually became pregnant, he didn't need me anymore. So? asked Nathan. I smiled grimly. Obviously. He still doesn't need me. End of Book 3